Okay. Good morning and welcome everyone to the virtual Israeli Vision Day. Uh, unfortunately, we had to do it virtually and not uh, physically as we hoped for. And today uh, we have an exciting list of talks. And the talks will be 12 minutes long and there will be a three minute period for uh, questions. Please post your questions okay. on the... Good morning and welcome everyone. Please post, sorry, uh, let me mute myself. And please post your questions on the chat on the uh, YouTube channel and the moderator will ask uh, the speaker. And without further ado, we can start. The first talk is given by Guy O'Hayon. Uh, Guy, take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this day. So hello everyone, my name is Gayo Chayon and I'm an MSc student in uh, computer science at Technion. My advisors are uh, Professor Michael Elad and Professor Tomer Michaeli. Today I'll present our work on high perceptual quality image denoising, which was done jointly with uh, Theo Adrai, Gregory Waxman, Michael Elad and Peyma Miranfar. This work was uh, part of our uh, undergraduate uh, research project. <coughs> so our work is about a new image restoration algorithm. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, our work is about a new image restoration algorithm, which we demonstrate on image denoising. But what we'll show is actually true for any image restoration problem. So let's speak in general terms. What is image restoration all about? We start with a degraded image, for instance, a noisy one like we see here, and we try to enhance its quality with some algorithm. We commonly assume that each degraded image originated from a clean source that passes through a non-invertible degradation. What we mean by non-invertible? That we cannot retrieve the clean source with zero error. <clears throat> now, if we cannot retrieve the source, we can at least try to approach it by minimizing some average distortion, such as the mean square error, like many previous work uh, uh, do. Minimizing distortion usually leads to blurry results. So people have been trying to incorporate adversarial training to improve the perceptual quality. However, this, lead to, uh, this uh, led to a deterioration in distortion performance. Lastly, note that most restoration algorithms are each a deterministic mapping of the measurement, meaning that they provide one restoration for a given input. A work by Blau and Michaeli called the perception distortion trade-off mathematically proved that the perceptual quality and distortion <coughs> comes with the, come with the expense of one another. This work provided a clean explanation for why high perceptual quality alg algorithms suffer from suboptimal distortion. This graph on the left is called the perception distortion trade-off. Notice that we cannot, <coughs> cannot, obtain a, a cannot attain an estimator below the bl blue curve. As we said, many algorithms try to attain low distortion, meaning that they approach the top dot and suffer from suboptimal perceptual quality. In this work, we will try to approach the bottom dot, meaning that we attempt to obtain an estimator with high perceptual quality. In fact, we aim for perfect perceptual quality while knowing that we compromise on distortion. <clears throat> so in the perception distortion trade-off paper, Blau showed that sampling from the posterior distribution leads to perfect perceptual quality while compromising on 3dB of PSNR compared to the MMSC estimator. In this work, we rely on this result and offer to build a stochastic estimator which samples from the posterior distribution. We achieve this by training a conditional generator which receives one noisy input and is able to produce many denoise candidates drawn from the posterior. <coughs> we propose a novel conditional GAN objective to train such an estimator. I should note that previous works involving GAN inversions and iterative latent code optimization also try to achieve high perceptual quality. However, we aim for something more rigorous like the posterior distribution itself, so we can guarantee a distortion performance on the outputs. So why can't we use a regular conditional gun? What is this work all about and why did we write a paper about it? Let's denote, denote our estimator by, by G theta of Y and Z, where Y is the measurement, the degraded image, and Z is some latent noise injection. Given Y, 
this estimator is indeed stochastic. Now, we can train such an estimator to sample from the posterior by simply minimizing the Wasserstein one distance to the, to the posterior distribution or minimizing any divergence using adversarial training. <clears throat> However, doing so typically leads to mode collapse for unbalanced datasets. <clears throat> now, what do we mean by an unbalanced dataset? Recall how we typically construct a dataset of clean and degraded image pairs. We start with a clean image, pass it through a degradation, and obtain a degraded measurement. We then pass this measurement through the algorithm, some restoration algorithm, to obtain a, a restored candidate. <clears throat> However, notice that there are many more clean images that could have explained the same degraded measurement. In fact, those images constitute the posterior distribution, which we try to sample from, but we don't have these samples. We only, we only have one sample. This makes the conditional generation task particularly more difficult to ace. For example, if you want to generate an image of a bird, given the label bird, which is typically the task in conditional guns, we typically possess many bird images tagged with the label bird. The analogy in our case is that we have one image per label. So this makes the task of conditional generation much more difficult. So our approach is to still use a conditional gun, but to solve the mode collapse issue in such an unbalanced dataset setup. We propose to add a penalty term to the Seagun loss. The Seagun loss, conditional gun loss, together with our penalty term, attains the same global optimum as before, so a posterior sampler is still a globally optimal solution. However, the penalty term we offer alleviates the mode collapse issue by penalizing solutions that attain high perceptual quality but suffer from mode collapse. We won't explain this in detail here, but you are more than welcome to ask us about it later. Note that our penalty term is not a distortion. It simply aims at matching the mean of the restored candidates to the mean of the posterior which is why such a penalty does not change the global optimum of the conditional gun objective. <clears throat> so let's demonstrate our algorithm in a schematic way. Uh, let's leave the ma mathematics and, and show you a, a diagram. We start with a degraded image that passes through our stochastic denoiser several times. Notice that our denoiser receives, uh, receives latent noise injection in order to provide variability. We take one of the denoised uh, candidates and give it as an input to a discriminator, which drives it to attain high perceptual quality. This, uh, we pick the, run, the, the candidate uh, randomly, so it, 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 it would uh, drive each of the candidates to attain high perceptual quality. In addition, we take the average of many candidates produced by our denoiser and drive them to be close to the source. This means that we enforce a necessary condition to obtain a posterior sampler since we match uh, the average of the posterior distribution, um, we match our, uh, we drive our estimator to provide the average of the posterior distribution. <clears throat> now, at inference time, we can instantaneously generate as many denoised candidates as we would like. <clears throat> this is the architecture of our denoiser. Designing a stable architecture that allows for meaningful, meaningful variability was not a trivial task. We encourage you to read about it. Uh, in our paper. <clears throat> now, let's move on to experiment, uh, experimental results. In this figure, we see that our algorithm indeed does not suffer from mode collapse. We observe rich stochastic variation in the denoise samples. The rightmost image is the per pixel standard deviation, where black corresponds to higher variation. This image tells us that the variation occurs, occurs in high frequency details such as hair, glasses, and beard. This is indeed an expected result as noise contamination leads to loss in high frequency details. So we expect the variation to occur in, the, in high frequency content. Moving on to another interesting experiment. In this figure, the y-axis corresponds to FID, which is a measure of perceptual quality. Lower means better. The x-axis corresponds to PSNR, a measure of distortion. Higher means better. Each dot in this plot corresponds to the result of some restoration algorithm. This dot, for example, corresponds to our architecture trained only with the MSE loss and without noise injection. This dot corresponds to our method. 
Now, we indeed see a significant improvement in FID compared to the MMSC estimator. We also see that the PSNR, <coughs> the PSNR deteriorated in less than 3 dB. As we expected a decrease of exactly 3 dB in PSNR, this result probably means that we did not obtain a true posterior sampler or we did not obtain a, a true MMC estimator or, or both. We, we expected to see here exactly, uh, exactly 3 dB, um, a 3 dB gap. So this task is indeed quite difficult. As you can see, we, can, we did not really uh, obtain a posterior sampler for, for sure. Now let's take a look at this point. This point means, that taking, uh, means taking the average of 16 instances provided by our estimator and offering such an average as the restoration. We see that averaging more and more instances as we go along the purple curve improves the PSNR but worsen the FID. This is expected since as we average more instances, we approach the MMC estimator. We also tried uh, to play with the standard deviation of the noise injected to our in, uh, estimator during inference. So the estimator was, was trained with a uh, standard deviation of one, do, uh, with standard deviation of one, and during inference, we decreased the standard deviation. This is another way to obtain either high perceptual quality or low distortion. I would say that average, the, this average, uh, the averaging method, the purple curve, is superior, uh, but is more time uh, is superior to uh, playing with the standard deviation, but averaging is more time consuming than simply changing the standard deviation of the noise injection. There are much more to say and analyze on this plot, all of which we disclose in our paper. So I encourage you to check it out. We also tested the different noise levels. The, the, uh, the curves uh, in the center correspond to a noise level of 50. And we see the same behavior in all, uh, uh, all the noise levels. To summarize, we revisit the image restoration task with a new approach aiming to sample from the posterior distribution. The core idea is to leverage condition, the conditional gun loss and to remedy its illness with a novel penalty term. Our penalty term indeed alleviates the mode collapse issue. The pros of our method is that we indeed obtain high perceptual quality and variability, inference is fast, and with the ability to trade the perceptual quality for distortion. The cons are that uh, we do not provide results on general content images. We also do not quantify the extent to which our estimator is indeed the posterior sampler. We cannot claim a faithful sampling, sampling from, from the posterior. This uh, quantification is a difficult task by, by itself, maybe, maybe a future work, I'm not sure. Uh, so thank you for listening. This was our work. Uh, we, was, we were very excited to do it, uh, especially as the first uh, research for, uh, project we tackled. And uh, I will be happy to take any questions. Thanks very much for an excellent talk <clears throat> and for uh, giving it um, exactly the time limit that was required. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, let me start by asking one. Um, so how consistent is the solution? Let's say you take the clean image X and you generate a noisy image Y and then you generate another noisy image Y. Will you get two posterior uh, distributions that are identical or similar to each other? So wait, when you say consistency, I thought you mean, um... You mean if you look at the residual, you expect to see? Well, you have an, a clean image X and you added some noise, you get Y. Let's call it Y1. Okay. And then you repeat the process. You take clean image X, you added the same amount of noise, randomly generated noise, but with the same uh, standard deviation, and you get Y2, right? So both of them came from the same underlying image X. And now using each one of them, you run your algorithm, You you try to generate the posterior distribution given Y1 and the posterior distribution given Y2. Okay. How similar are the two posterior distributions? So actually we did not uh, um, test this, this uh, result. I would expect that given different Ys than the posterior, if, if the noise is the same, then I would expect that the posterior distribution would be quite the same. But what we did test is that we uh, took many, um, Given a particular y, we generated many x's and then looked at the residual uh, between the noisy image 
and, and uh, each of the restorations to make sure that the, this residual indeed looks like a Gaussian noise. And okay. we talked about it in the paper, and but what you suggested, we didn't uh, we didn't test. Uh, it's interesting interesting to see how changing y actually changes the posterior distribution if you are using the same uh, sound deviation. But I, I I'm not sure I have a, a rigorous answer for that. And, and another follow up question is: you're averaging all the x's that you generated, all the x hats that you generated given y. It's not clear that the average is is in the distribution. Or at least so, it's not. What exactly is going on there? Okay, so I will go back there. So, okay. so recall what we are trying to do. This stochastic denoiser, given y, attempts to, to be a sampler from the posterior distribution. Now, the posterior distribution is p of x given y, right? Let, let me go back. The posterior distribution is p of x given y. What we are trying to do is to sample from the posterior distribution and to enforce a necessary condition that such a distribution holds. So we want uh, the conditional uh, expectation of our generator to match the conditional uh, expectation uh, of the posterior distribution as well as trying to sample from it. it, it just okay. think about it this way. Um, this optimization task, uh, this loss, the, the loss on the top and the loss on the bottom, is quite is uh, the penalty time is quite useless if you're talking about the infinite data set and everything but when you have a finite data set unbalanced data set then this penalty term allows you to further uh, um, go towards the real posterior distribution because you uh, you uh, you enforce a necessary condition to obtain a posterior sampler you enforce the average of your candidates to match the average of the posterior to be the mmsc was this okay. Uh, Yeah. Okay. Are there any more questions? Okay. Thanks very much, Guy. And Thank we'll you. move to the next uh, speaker. The next speaker is Niv. So let me introduce Niv. So the next talk is uh, by uh, the Weizmann Group. Niv Granot uh, is going to give uh, the presentation. Niv, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, dropped again in defense of patch nearest neighbors and single image generative models. Uh, it's a uh, work done by uh, in joint work with uh, Ben Feinstein, Asaf Shocher, Shai Bagon, and Michal Irani. And I want to start by first uh, decomposing this somewhat long title. Uh, so first, what are single image generative models? Uh, when we say that, we talk about models that take a single input image as their input and try to output another image which is from the same distribution as the input image. But what does distribution mean when we talk about a single image? We actually mean the distribution of the patches inside the images. And uh, this is what the model tries to uh, imitate. And now for patch nearest neighbors, a single image generative models, uh, and I'm going to explain this concept uh, through an example uh, of a work done in 2008 by Simakov et al called bidirectional similarity that used this idea to solve some tasks. Uh, the two main tasks that they solve were visual summary where they add an input image and they try to shrink it uh, and keep all the information on the one hand, but do not, they didn't want to add any new information on the other hand or artifacts. Uh, so they kept the windows, uh, but not all of the windows, for example. Um, and then the second is a collage uh, where they took a few images and seamlessly blend them into a single output image. And uh, in high level, the way they did it, uh, given a source, a single source image and a target image that was initialized in some way, uh, they considered every patch in the source image uh, in different sizes and try to look for their nearest neighbors in the target. And vice versa, for a, a various sizes patches in the target, they try to look for their nearest neighbors in the source. Uh, and they optimized uh, the distance uh, in both directions. And this was the basis for their method. So why do we need to defend or in defense of these uh, methods, uh, the patch nearest neighbors methods? 
Uh, in 2018, uh, uh, INGEN was introduced uh, that showed superior results for the same tasks. They considered retargeting exactly like in bidirectional similarity, but they used this again that was trained on a single image and showed better results in this case. Shortly after, SYNGEN was introduced, which was shown novel tasks that were never considered before with the patch-based methods. Uh, and uh, and uh, the main task that they considered was just random generation uh, as in general GANs. Uh, were, but this time, given a single training image, they created many plausible versions of this single image by capturing its uh, internal statistics. And how did they did it? Again, in high level and very shortly. Um, first, they created a pyramid of the input image. In the coarsest scale, they injected noise uh, and again try to learn the patch distribution of the image at that scale and generate a new image, which is from the same patch distribution, but now in a different setting. Uh, for example, here, a carrot is added. This output is then upsampled and inserted to another GAN, which is now a conditional GAN that should, con uh, should uh, be reliable to the structure uh, the three carrots here, but should use the patches uh, from the input image at that scale, and so on and so forth until we have an output image. And this was a very nice job and a very nice uh, work that, uh, that uh, was awarded the best paper and, uh, and uh, with very nice results. Uh, note that the GANs operate on patches in the same size throughout the pyramid. So in the coarsest scale, a patch captures an entire carrot or roughly half of the image height. Uh, and as we go on, it captures finer and finer details. Uh, so to summarize the prior work we reviewed here, and there were many other works, uh, the bidirectional similarity in 08 uh, used the patch nearest neighbors for retargeting and collage and other tasks. And then Ingen tried to solve the same tasks now with the, in, in a single image again, and Singen showed new tests, uh, and then many other works uh, followed. Uh, most of them use GANs in a similar way to Singen and Ingen, uh, a single image GAN that tried to solve new and uh, classical tasks as well. And we say now drop the GAN, and uh, it's important to say that it's a wordplay, uh, but uh, what we actually say is that in some cases we can do this without GANs. And why do we say drop the GAN? Uh, first, it's the runtime. Uh, it takes hours to train a single image. In SYNGEN, it takes one and a half hours. Uh, in INGEN, it takes two to four hours for a single image. Uh, it's difficult to train again. It's prone to mode collapse. Uh, the output is regressed. So as opposed to uh, patch-based methods uh, that use the actual patches from the input image, here we have a convolutional neural network that generates the output pixels. And the artifacts like you see here uh, are uh, uh, more fre frequent than, than we want. Uh, and this is actual, actually an output of SYNGEN. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we saw that uh, different tasks call for different architecture and the runtime becomes proportional to the number of tasks even though the underlying uh, mission is the same to capture the internal distribution of a single input image. So how do we suggest to drop the GAN? Uh, so this is the general structure of SYNGAN and other, many other words that I showed you before. And its main principle is that in each scale, the output patches belong to the distribution of the input patches uh, and the GAN takes care of it. And our suggestion is to drop the GAN and insert a patch nearest neighbors model instead. The main principle now is that in each scale, the output patches are indeed input patches. They are not from the distribution of the input patches, they are actually input patches. The randomness still arises from the coarsest scale because when you search for nearest neighbors and the patch takes such a large uh, portion of the image, this is what you get. Uh, you get many different arrangements of carrots. Many of them are not plausible enough when you see them in such coarse scale, but then the pyramid structure make, uh, makes us fix it throughout the way. 
And uh, this is the basis for many tasks that we show in our work. Uh, first and foremost, we show diverse image generation, uh, again, only tasks uh, that, that was considered again only, uh, where a single input image is given and we create many plausible versions of it and we sample from the distribution of this uh, patch of the patches of the image and structural analogies that was only shown with GANs uh, and retargeting collage that was shown by directional similarity and conditional in-painting, which is a test that we show. Um, and all of these are done in a single framework, uh, in a single framework, which is quite simple, as you saw. Uh, and just an overview of, the, of our approach. On the one hand, it's an overall approach. We solve new tasks that uh, were not solved before with patch-based methods, uh, but it is highly based on the good old patch nearest neighbors. Hence, it is much faster. It's uh, three orders of magnitude faster. Uh, if Indian or Singian takes hours, uh, then uh, our method takes uh, seconds to generate a new image. Uh, the results are of higher quality. Uh, you will see it through a user study and qualitatively uh, uh, next in the presentation. And uh, finally, we have a simple single framework that solves many tasks. Uh, so uh, it might be possible that not always the heavy GAN machinery is necessary. Um, and this includes, again, the GAN only tasks. Uh, a deeper, a slightly deeper dive into the details of our method. Uh, so given uh, the goals of the, of the model, the PNN model uh, in each scale, we should output an image which is on the one end uh, similar in structure to the initial guess, the upscaled output from the previous scale. And on the other hand, it should match the internal statistics, the patch distribution of the input image at that scale. Uh, a naive solution may say, we can just replace each guess patch with its nearest neighbor from the input at that scale. However, this may uh, prove itself suboptimal since this, uh, this uh, initial guess is upsampled, which means that it's somewhat blurry. Uh, hence, uh, it might prefer uh, smooth patches over texturized patches uh, in cases that we don't want it. Uh, so our solution was to use a query key value scheme, which is very popular today due to the attention model uh, models. Uh, and what we did uh, was, again, uh, uh, we took the initial guess and the input image at that scale, and we intentionally blurred the input image at that scale and then divided the search and replacement process. We searched for nearest neighbor for our initial guess in K, in the blurry version, but we took the values from V. A second problem that may arise in our, uh, in this setting is that uh, if we use uh, just a mean squared error, uh, this kind of output is valid. And I think, in my opinion, it is valid uh, for the task of random image generation because it is from the same distribution of the input image. However, in some other cases and in some other tests, we, we might want to have completeness, which is the property that all input objects appear in the output image. And by using mean squared error or L2, we will not have completeness. Hence, we use a normalized score to find the nearest neighbors that this normalized score favors patches that are missing in the initial guess. So for example, here, if we don't have any carrots here in the initial guess, our, in our normalized score would prefer uh, carrot patches over background patches. And this is uh, our results. Uh, you can see here 50 generated images, randomly generated images by our method and by Singen based on a single source image on the left. Uh, and you can see that we show high diversity of outputs and uh, the mountain range changes its shape and then the number of peaks and, uh, and the location of the houses and trees uh, uh, in the bottom, but we still maintain the global structure. Uh, and you can see that Singen, since uh, 
not using the actual patches from the input image, but rather using again, uh, suffer from uh, uh, artifacts mainly uh, on visible on the mountain tops. Uh, we conducted a user study that uh, we meticulously followed the Simian protocol for this user study, uh, uh, where we asked users which image is fake. Uh, we gave, gave them two images, one which is real and the other one which is generated by our method or by Simian. And we asked them which is an image is fake. And we did it in two uh, settings of high diversity and low diversity where the highest score you can expect is 50%, because when a user is totally confused between a real image and a generated image, and you can see that our method is uh, very close to 50% and much higher than uh, Singen. And uh, putting it together with the time, uh, with approximately one hour to generate an image uh, reduced to two seconds, uh, I think it's very uh, amazing. Uh, and as I said before, this single simple framework uh, is uh, capable of doing many tasks. Uh, all of the tasks differ uh, at three parameters. Uh, the first is the pyramid depth. How deep do we go in the pyramid? Alpha, which is a completeness parameter in our normalized score. How much do we want the input objects to appear in the output? And uh, finally, the initial guess, the question mark here, which may be noise in the case of random image generation or other things in other cases. And this forms the basis for uh, these retargeting results. I really uh, like uh, what uh, you can see here. And you have like the image in red here. And when we stretch it, it adds more objects uh, and not just stretch the, the shirts. Um, and uh, you can see the results in our supplementary material and the uh, paper. And uh, we sh also show structural analogies, uh, which again, we can show, uh, uh, I really like the uh, example on the right, uh, the S to duck. Uh, you can see that uh, we actually using the duck uh, patches and we have like the head of the duck here uh, that, uh, that uh, makes the S. Uh, while GANs are more, uh, they, they have more freedom to, uh, to uh, do it otherwise. And uh, that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you very much, Niv, for a blast from the past. It's nice to see papers more than 10 years ago make a comeback. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Please post your questions on the comments in the chat in the YouTube channel. In the meantime, let me ask you a question. Um, so is there a loss function uh, to this problem? Meaning gi given the input image and the noise that is fixed, given two possible solutions, can you say which one is better according to some loss function? Uh... I don't, I don't think so, because uh, it's a random image generation uh, task, so... Uh, but uh, you fix the, the, the noise, right? So you fix the random uh, seed. And the question is, can you um, say something about uh, which image is better or the best? And the other variant of it is, is the distribution of a GAN-based solution and your solution the same? So if you generate 200 images, Mm -hmm. uh, from the same base image and 200 images using Syngun for that matter. Mm -hmm. What is the correlation similarity between the two distributions? Uh, we didn't measure it, but uh, it's interesting to see. Uh, is, uh, we, we did do some experiments to show that uh, Syngun is really able to generate patches that were not actually in the input image, while we cannot do it because we use actual patches. Uh, so uh, these are these are experiments that we did do, and uh, we cannot expect that we have the same uh, distri final distribution as Singen. Uh, but I believe it's very close because, as you see, uh, with the 50 generated images, it doesn't look very different in the terms of the mountain range uh, uh, or the peaks or uh, or the beach. Uh, I think uh, both of them uh, have. But both of the methods have their own problems. Uh, Singen uh, is very uh, 
uh, rigid in terms of the uh, of the periphery of the image and uh, we use only patches from the input image so uh, each method has, a, has its own uh, caveat. Okay. Uh, I see a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, why is the key component that, what is the key component that maintain the image structure? Uh, the course to find strategy, uh, as in many other works, uh, the fact that uh, we have a, a course to find strategy where in the coarsest scale, the patch takes roughly half the image height. Uh, okay. We are not able to flip uh, sky and ground, uh, but uh, no, no, no semantic understanding is done uh, neither by us nor by any other single image method. Okay, and the next question is, is the code available online? Is the code available online? And not yeah. yet, but not it will. Yet. Okay. There are versions of the code available online. Sorry, there are? There are versions of the code, okay. not, uh, not official versions, but there are versions of the code. Okay, and the last question, I guess, is uh, does your work limit, is your work limited to a specific kind of images? Um, we, Try, uh, we tried uh, our work for, uh, for different types of Im images, uh, may, may it be uh, place, places uh, images like uh, the mountains or the beach or, uh, or other images shown in Singen and others. Uh, but uh, mainly when you talk about generating new images from a single image, uh, you need to limit yourself to images with objects and things that can move around. If you just take a single face and try to generate a new face from it, you will just move the nose and the eyes and uh, it will not look good. Okay, in the interest of time, we need to stop here. Thanks very much for a great work and let's continue. Uh, the next talk uh, is by Rinon Gale and Dani Koenor from Tel Aviv University. And Rinon, can you share your screen? There we go. Yes, you can. And the floor is yours. Just one moment. Let me go back to my presenter view. And let's go. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. I'm Renon, a PhD student from Tel Aviv University. And I'm really glad to be here and for the opportunity to present to you not one, but two papers, Style Clip and Style Ganada. And we've got a lot to cover and not much time. So let's dive right on in. Okay, uh, we'll start out with StyleClip, which is a collaboration between our lab, the Hebrew University and Adobe, which is in my opinion, nothing short of amazing. And this paper asks the question, which I hope I don't have to spend uh, too much time motivating. And that question is, can we edit real images using nothing but text? Okay, so we'll start with a few examples to illustrate what I mean, and hopefully get you excited about this uh, prospect as well. And let's take our uh, unwilling model, Jan, and let's say we want to give him a fabulous mane of hair, right? So we'll just type in a few words like this and let the model work its magic. Okay, cool. Uh, let's do another one. For example, say we want to give Jan a glorious beard. We type that in and here we go. Okay. But well, if you've been following uh, the GAN editing literature, you've probably already seen other methods that change hair or add a beard, but we've got the freedom of text here. So let's try something entirely new. Have you ever seen uh, Jan sneezing? No? Well, now you have. Okay, so uh, let's quickly try to understand how exactly this is done. And to do that, we're going to need two tools. The first, StyleGAN is the state-of-the-art uh, generative model for structured data like uh, faces. And really the quality of images that it can produce is, is incredible, right? But the quality isn't the only reason that StyleGAN is so uh, widely popular. Uh, one of the most amazing things about it is actually it's a uh, disentangled latent space. What this means is that we can find directions uh, of movement in the space of codes that we feed the generator that control specific attributes in the generated image, like pose or gender or age, without changing anything else about the identity. There's a lot of work out there about finding these directions, and we're going to be doing that using text. How do we do that? We'll use Clip. 
So for those of us who are not familiar yet, Clip is basically a pair of encoders which map text and images into some uh, joint embedding space where images reside close to their textual description. So we can actually use a distance metric in this joint space to get an idea of how similar the text is to a given image. Now, Clip was trained on 400 million uh, pairs of images, for example, uh, this one. And uh, so there's really almost nothing it hasn't seen. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do is we'll take Stalgan and Clip and combine them. And there you go, we have Stalgan. Uh, the paper itself introduces three approaches for employing Clip for uh, latent space navigation, but we're short on time. So we're only going to focus on uh, the simplest one. And that's going to be the latent space optimization approach. And what we'll do is we'll take an image and use a process called the inversion in order to discover a latent code that when fed into our GAN, recreate the same image or a very similar one. Then we'll fit this image and some target text, for example, a woman with purple hair into clip, and we'll get a score telling us how similar they are. What we want to do is maximize this score. So we'll drag some gradients all the way back to the latent code and iteratively modify it in order to increase the text to image similarity. We'll also add some identity detection network to make sure we stay with the same person. And now all we have to do is let the gradient descent work its magic. So let me drag your attention uh, back over here. And there we go. Now we have the same woman with purple hair. Cool. OK, uh, so this works great. And this method is really expressive and lets us do wild things like morphing people into celebrities. It is, however, slow, which is where the alternatives come in. Uh, they contain some really neat ideas, but our time is short. So if you want to learn more about them, you'll have to read the paper or just reach out after the talk. OK, so let's see a few more examples of what this amazing tool can do. So we can change hairstyles, colors, even add or uh, remove makeup from images. Or uh, if you've ever wondered how your dog would look like with a paint job or as a different breed, well, style clip has you covered. Uh, it works with cars, it works with buildings, and really with anything else that you've got a GAN for. Oh, but there's the catch. This sort of latent code traversal works great on things that the GAN has been trained on or things which are sufficiently close to them. And we can try to illustrate that with a GAN trained on tigers, lions, and wolves. And what StyleClip can do is find a path in the latent space that takes us from a tiger to a lion or from a tiger to a wolf. But what it doesn't really do well is find a path that takes us far beyond the boundaries of this latent space and produces, for example, a dog. OK, so if we want to do that, we'll need a different approach. And that approach is going to be to use Clip to modify the generator itself. And basically, we'll want to change our generator so that the latent space will contain only dogs. And this leads us to our next work. Uh, Style Ganada, this time a joint project between our lab and the NVIDIA team here in Israel. And before we get down to the gritty business, let me try to give you some extra bit of motivation. Okay, we, we talked about editing, but really GANs can be used for many, many, many more things. For example, there are works which use the GANs for image to image translation, segmentation, even discriminative tasks like a layout prediction and a few shot regression. And we've really just touched the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with a powerful GAN. But all of these examples suffer from the same limit we just talked about. They all rely on having a pre-trained high quality generator for the domain we want to work with. And typically training generators is hard and requires many thousands of images. Instead, what we'll do is we're going to be training again using text OK, so imagine if we could take a dog generator, say the word cat, and just convert it to a generator that produces cats. So that's great, but OK, I, I can hear you. The internet is full of cats, right? We can easily get tens of thousands of images, train our own generator. So why stop there? Let's take something like the Mona Lisa. There's just one Mona Lisa painting. So getting thousands of images is going to be quite a bit harder. 
but if we don't use any images, that's not really an issue, and we can create a generator that produces variations on the Mona Lisa. But really, when we have control through text, we don't even have to stop there, right? We can take something that doesn't exist and at our GAN turn it into reality. So let's say we really, really love dogs, but for some strange reason, we also can't get enough of Nicolas Cage. So finally, we'll be able to fulfill our long-time dreams and train again that produces dogs with the face of Nicolas Cage. Okay, so we can do all of that and more if we just replace our training supervision with Clip. Uh, so let's follow Stipe and work with a naive optimization approach. We'll take a GAN that produces dogs, generate some images, send those over to Clip with the text a cat, and try to maximize the similarity score. Except now we'll be using the gradients to change the generator itself. Simple enough, right? It also doesn't work. If we do this, we get these uh, noisy adversarial solutions. And if we keep on training, the entire image fills up with cat fur and gives us something that looks like this. Okay, so let's try to quickly understand why this doesn't work. And we'll do that by diving into Clips Embedding Space. And so here are some uh, clip Space embeddings of real cat images and dog images. And we've also embedded the strings for cat and dog. Okay, and what we tried to do a moment ago was basically take all the different dogs that our generator can produce and tell them to move here to where the string cat resides. But when this is our training goal, the GAN has no need to maintain any form of diversity. And when we lose diversity, it's also much easier to come up with adversarial noise that fools clip. And indeed, if we try to visualize our generated uh, cats, uh, we see that they all reside in some collapsed clump near the cat text. Okay, so instead, we're going to want to do something that looks more like this, where every dog is going to be mapped to an equivalent cat in the cat cluster. And we do that by demanding that the direction between each original dog and the fine-tuned model's cat is the same direction as between the dog and cat text. Now, instead of actively discouraging diversity, we're discouraging mode collapse, since all these arrows want to remain parallel, right? And this works and gives us a generated cat distribution that looks uh, like this with images that look uh, less like noise and more like cats. And again, we didn't have to use even a single image. All right, so we talked about the optimization goal. For that, we're going to need directions between pairs of before and after images. How do we do that? We just use two generators. We'll start them all at the same, which means that they're fitting the same latent code into both models will give us the same image. One of them is going to be kept frozen. Its only job is to give us an image in the source domain for every latent code. The second generator is going to get trained. And where do the gradients come from? Well, we put both images produced by both generators into clip and find the direction between them. And then we demand that this direction is parallel to the direction that we described through text. So uh, in this case, we can take the direction from a photo to an anime painting. And we'll use the gradients to modify the generator itself. And there we go. And we do this for many, many different latent codes iteratively. And we end with a new GAN that produces only anime paintings. OK? So uh, let's uh, jump on in and see a few of our uh, results. Uh, so we'll start with faces where we can get uh, Pixar-style images. Uh, we can mimic famous artists. We can create uh, high quality sketches or convert people into Neanderthal zombies or uh, Japanese style paintings. And it works with other domains as well. We can take churches and convert them to shire style houses or to huts. And uh, we can even convert them to snowy mountains or renders in specific styles. Uh, it works on dogs and cars. And well, Clip even understands things like the direction between. 2015 and 1920 and gives us these old tiny cars, right? So I think that's also very cool. Uh, we got a lot of animals as well, all of which started out as dogs. And again, we didn't use a single image of any of these animals. Okay, um, I also went, want to stress out again that this isn't just single image modification. We're producing an entirely new generator, which means we can use the model for a range of downstream tasks 
for example, image editing in different domains. So actually you can combine style tip and style ganada uh, and do both things at the same time. And there are also many things we didn't discuss, like the fact that this small method can train again in less than a minute, but we're at the end of our time. So if you want to know more, please reach out. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And you're more than welcome to visit our project pages where you can play around with the models yourself. Thank you, Linon. This is an exciting talk. Uh, any questions yeah. from the audience? So I see there is one question. Can you also change the pose of the images, the head pose? And I see that you just have a, I have the slide on that. Yeah, so for changing head pose, you actually don't even need the style gun head or style clip. It's one of the earliest things that people did with uh, latent space uh, traversal is find a direction that controls the pose. Uh, you can do it with style gun and something called the interface gun, for example. Uh, clip specifically isn't very good with poses. Um, it doesn't really know where, uh, right? It doesn't do well on the... Uh, tasks like uh, differentiating, I don't know, if a cat is sitting on a bench or below a bench, things like that. It's not very good with directions in general. And so I wouldn't use these methods to change a pose, but you can certainly do it with more trivial approaches. And, and how long does it take to train uh, the, the GAN? So we're, we're doing domain adaptation, right? We're shifting an existing GAN to a new domain. And it, the the length of time it takes really depends on the prompt and how much you want to shape, change shapes versus textures. Uh, things like converting a photo to a sketch can take less than a minute on a good GPU. Uh, things like, uh, I don't know, turning uh, people into uh, werewolves might take you three or five minutes depending on your hardware. So it's pretty uh, fast. It's very fast. Very interesting. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Please post your questions on the chat on the webpage. Going once, going twice. Well, thanks very much, Linon. And I see the Thank code you. is available online. So yeah. give it a try. Thanks very much. Thank you. OK, uh, moving on. To the next talk. The next talk is by uh, Yuli Shavir, Toron Ferenc, and uh, Yossi Keller from Bar Ilan University. And Yoli is going to give the presentation. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, take it. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Yoli Shavit, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about learning multi scene absolute pose regression with transformers. Uh, this is joint work. Yoli? Please uh, move to full screen. This is not, I see full screen. You don't have, okay. Let's see. Is it better now or still? We see you in PowerPoint in a... Uh... Hmm. Okay. Let's try again. That's weird. Let's try like this. If that's better now? Yeah, now it's perfect. Okay, great. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, so let's start again. We're going to talk about learning multi scene absolute pose regression with transformers. Uh, this is a joint work with Ron Ferenc and Professor Yossi Keller from Barilan University. So, camera pose estimation is a key problem in computer vision. It amounts to finding the position and orientation of a camera from the captured image and has applications to um, navigation, autonomous driving, augmented virtual reality, and many more. In this talk, we're going to focus on camera pose regression methods, which aim to solve this problem by directly training a model to regress the pose from the input image, as opposed to localization pipelines, which rely on image retrieval, feature matching, perspective endpoint, and runsack to estimate the pose, Absolute pose regressors, or APRs, apply a single forward pass and only require the trained model weights at inference time. As such, they offer a fast, lightweight, and standalone alternative to heavy localization pipelines. But as you all know, there are no free meals and single scene APRs are typically less accurate than localization 
other localization methods and are also typically trained per scene. So let's take a moment to understand the implications. Let's say you have a large data set with n scenes, let's say a hospital with many wards and rooms. In order to um, estimate the pose, you'll need to train a model per scene and then select the right one at inference time and apply it. So this is not very scalable. In this work, we propose a transform-based approach for improving the accuracy of single scene APRs and extending the single scene paradigm to learning multiple scenes in parallel. Um, our work takes inspiration from recent methods like VIT and DITER. Uh, we apply transformers and coders to focus on posing formative features and use transform decoders to transform scene encodings into latent poser presentations. Now let's take a closer look and understand how this actually works. Um, so given a query image, our model first, first applies a convolutional backbone um, and, and extracts uh, visual features. Similar to other uh, visual transformers, uh, we first uh, flatten and, and project, project and flatten activation maps and, and pass them along with a 2D aware position encoding. Now, if you think about it, camera pose regression, camera pose estimation learns two different properties, position and orientation. In order to account for that, we applied a shared backbone at two different resolutions and pass them along to two separate transformers. Given flattened activation maps, two separate uh, encoders, position encoder and orientation encoder, attend to different visual cues. So as you can see on the image on the right, uh, the encoders adaptively aggregate these activation maps um, we, using uh, self-attention. The position encoder attends to blob and corner-like features, which are more informative intuitively to position estimation while the orientation encoder attends to elongated lines and edges. In order to attend to end scenes in parallel, we apply two separate transform decoders. These are queried by N uh, scene embeddings and output N latent representations, one per scene. So consider the image again on the right. Um, this is taken when applying a, on, on an image from the old hospital scene from the Cambridge Landmarks data set. And as you can see, the attention maps of the uh, decoder output of, of the associated scene of the old hospital scene shows the uh, highest response. So here in B. In order to uh, learn multiple scenes in parallel, uh, we basically um, apply two transformers uh, decoders, okay, like that. And then uh, we concatenate their, uh, their outputs to select the scene. We apply uh, a classifier head composed of a fully connected layer and softmax, and then select the scene. The outputs of the decoder at the selected scene are passed to two respective heads, which regress the position and orientation vectors. Our model is trained end to end with the a negative log likelihood loss in order to learn scene classification and the learned pause loss. Learned pause loss is a loss commonly used by APRs and basically tries to learn the optimal weighting between the L2 position loss and the L2 orientation loss. We evaluate our uh, method on two commonly benchmarked data sets, uh, the Cambridge, Cambridge Landmarks data set and the 7CN data set. Uh, these data sets present different challenges as, as viewpoint changes, blur, reflection, and more. The first thing we do is to compare our method to the only other multi-scene uh, APR named MSPN. This method applies a convolutional backbone and then index a set of uh, weights in order to, scene-specific weights, in order to regress the pose. As you can see from the tables, here, uh, our method consistently outperforms MSPN um, and achieve a significant improvement on the Cambridge Landmarks data set. We then consider single scene APRs. Um, our method achieves the lowest position and orientation errors, surpassing state-of-the-art single scene APRs um, across both data sets. 
we then ask ourselves, okay, that's great, but can we do more? Can we go beyond learning multiple things from the same data set to learning multiple data sets at once? So consider the Cambridge landmarks and the seven scene data sets. The Cambridge landmarks is captured at an urban outdoor environment, mid-scale uh, environment. The seven scenes is a small uh, scale data set captured at offices and building rooms. And uh, as you can see, even when learning on these two data sets together, together what is denoted here as multi-data set, our method uh, achieves a similar performance to the multi-scene uh, scenario and still outperforms single scene APRs. So our method is able to learn multiple scenes from different data sets, very, very different data sets. Um, in order to further evaluate the robustness of our method, we carry different ablation studies. Uh, we take into account a num the number of decoder and encoder layers, the transformer dimension, and the type of background. As you can see, these changes are, have a relatively minor impact on performance. So consider, for example, the table here on the top left side. When you take um, a model with only two encoder and decoder layers, you get a fairly similar performance to a six layer model. Also, our model is, is more scalable compared to single scene APRs. So if we want to train on a model with 1000 scenes, uh, we'll need around five giga in terms of memory footprint, while our model only requires a few dozens of megabytes. So we propose a novel transform-based approach for multi-scene pose regression. We have two transform encoders which apply self multi head attention to attend to position and orientation informative image cues. We have two transform decoders which attend to scene specific information and then we pass this along to select the specific scene and regress the pose, position, and orientation vectors. Our approach achieves a new state of the art localization accuracy for absolute pose regression. It outperforms both single and multi-scene APRs across indoor and outdoor benchmarks, and it's robust to specific architectures and can even learn multiple data sets at once. Uh, we invite you to check out our GitHub repository, our paper on the ICCB21 uh, website, and reach out with any questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Yuri, for a fascinating talk. Uh... Are there any questions from the audience? I see there are several. Uh, let's see, great work. What is the training time or an inference time? So inference time, I would say on an H, it depends on the GPU, of course, on an eight gigabyte NVIDIA GTX, uh, it takes, it, it depends, but uh, for uh, seven scenes, it will be uh, between 20 to 50 milliseconds. Uh, it depends on the number of, of uh, uh, layers. We actually have this, we did this uh, simulation and it's uh, in the supplementary table. We basically uh, enlarged the number of, uh, of uh, scenes and also compared different uh, architectures, but it's, it's uh, much, much faster than localization pipelines. And training? Uh, training, um, again, it, it depends, but uh, it's uh, several hours. Okay, uh, another question, will the presented approach work in non-urban scenes? Again? Will the presented approach work in non-urban scenes? Like we have buildings in all the examples yeah. that you've shown. So, so um, basically, again, like, uh, so non-urban, you mean like vegetation, what kind of a, because a Cambridge is also, Cambridge is composed of, of a very different scenes. It's, it's urban, it's true, but it's like castles and it can be, uh, so you mean non-buildings or? Yeah, uh, um, it, it shows a lot of man-made stuff, I guess. Hmm. Uh, we haven't tried that because usually the type of data sets are kind of a uh, urban, but it like, uh, or, or, you know, like inside the mall or inside the building, because this is where people usually navigate. So we haven't tried like completely, let's say a forest or something like that. My, uh, I would say my intuition also when work, I've worked a lot on localization pipeline on this type of approaches. But the vegetation is, is very hard. You need yeah. strong features. You need something that is distinctive. So this is, will be a challenge 
to either approach like a forest or something like that, you need, you need some anchors. Uh, and we haven't tried there. It's uh, less common to, to train on this. Okay. Uh, and in the interest of time, the last question, uh, can this architecture be adapted for relative pose estimation for pairs of input images without learning any specific scene? Um, so in general, a relative pose regression is an active field. Uh, the issue with relative pose uh, estimation, usually you need to pick the, 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 the reference image. And this is done by image retrieval, which makes it, you, you can no longer go to standalone. This, uh, you cannot, I don't think you can uh, do it without, on this specific architecture, without retraining. You also need to change uh, the architecture. What you can do potentially is apply the backbone, get the representation, and then maybe train a specific MLP to just learn the relative motion. Uh, people have done that in various forms, but again, you need something to uh, get you the, the reference frame. So it's either you do it in a sequential way or you do it in an image retrieval, but this again mean, takes you out of the relocalization standalone scenario. Okay, thanks very much. It's a wonderful work. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And uh, we're moving to the next uh, talk from uh, Tel Aviv University, IBM, and MIT on unsupervised domain general generalization by learning a bridge across domains. And there are too many authors. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be me, Sivan. And Sivan is going to give <laughs> the presentation. Go ahead, Sivan. Thank you. Well, I'm Sivan from IBM Research. I'm going to talk about uh, this. Uh, we call it bread this work. It's in collaboration with Tel Aviv, MIT, and Boston University. Uh, okay, our goal, oh, what's happened? Okay, our goal is unsupervised pre-training of domain invariant representation, meaning we are training a backbone with, to produce domain invariant representations, and we are doing it with no labels at all. How is it done? Well, say we have several uh, domains of images like real images, painting, sketch, and clip art in this figure. So we are training a new domain. We call it Brad Bridge across domain. And the images in these domains are edge-like because we believe that edges, or at least some of the edges, can be shared between different domains. Uh, so we train the transformations from each one of the original domains to Brad jointly together with the training of the backbone itself. And during training, representation of similar objects are pulled together. These are the green arrows here, and those of a different uh, object are pushed away, the red arrows. So finally, after the training, similar objects from different domains have similar representations. Okay, before we can see what, before I'll say what we do with it, first let's look on two standard uh, tasks. Standard domain generalization is a task when you have a, a labeled source domain or multiple source domain, you train on it and then test on a target domain, unseen target domain, which has the same classes. So here, for example, you can train on clip art and test on sketch. And unsupervised domain adaptation is the same thing, only that now during training, we, you have also the target domain, but un unlabeled, unsupervised. So the source domain is supervised and the target domain is unsupervised. So we can't use those tasks because we don't have any labels during training. So we are using our uh, domain invariant representation for, the, for these tasks, which are the unsupervised version of the task uh, we saw before. So first, unsupervised domain generalization, which is the same as domain generalization, only that we have no labels during training. And double unsupervised domain adaptation is the same as unsupervised domain adaptation, only that now both the target and the source domain are unlabeled, unsupervised. This is a new benchmark that we propose. And we also propose another new benchmark, which is training on one data set and testing on completely different data sets. So we, we, we are training on uns, unsupervisedly on several domains and then test on unseen, uh, another data set with unseen domain and unseen classes. Okay, we are based on uh, MOCO v2. MOCO is uh, one of the leading uh, self-supervised contrastive method, methods, uh, which is known to produce discriminative feature, and this is why we chose it. Uh, this is the, what you see here is the architecture, the training architecture of MOCO. So the input image goes through 
to augmentation, random augmentation, and the contrastive loss requires that the representations of those two augmentations will be closer together, comparing to representation of other images that are stored in this queue in the memory. So the first augmentation goes through backbone and projection, and the second goes through momentum backward and projection, which, which are like a running average over previous version of the backbone, backbone, backbone and projection. And this is what goes into the queue. Uh, we added four modifications or, uh, for a contribution to this uh, architecture. First of all, we replace this queue to a per domain queue, a separate queue for each domain. The intuition here is that uh, for, the, for the MOCO algorithm, for contrastive algorithm, it is easier to separate between the, the domains and not the object inside the domain. But when we have a separate queue for each domain, we, we are forcing the algorithm to find discriminative feature and separate the object themselves. Uh, another thing we added is bread. Uh, this uh, bread transform here, psi n. n is the index of the domain because we can have different transform from different, for different domains. So each one of the um, images of the augmentation go through psi n and we get the two bread images, the two edge-like images. And now we need two contrastive losses. The first one uh, compares the edge, the, this image to this edge. You can see the blue and red lines here. The second uh, contrastive loss compares this edge to this image, which are the green and pink line, lines here. Uh, so it's a uh, symmetrical edge to image, image to edge. Um, into the queue goes both the image and the bread image, the original and the, and the, and the edge. Psi n here can be an off-the-shelf uh, edge detector, like Kenny or like Head. Uh, head is a module, a model that is trained on uh, manually annotated edges, uh, uh, like uh, this is an example: original Kenny edges and Head edges. So if we choose Psi n to be off-the-shelf edge detector, we will get better results comparing to vanilla Moco. But if we let Psi n train change during training, then we'll get much better results. So in our case, Psi n is a trainable, uh, is trainable and it is initialized to head as the architecture of head and uh, the initial weights are head width. We also add a domain discriminator, which we are trying to fool in order to get domain invariant features. Uh, the input to the, domain, to the domain discriminator is the representation of the bread images because we want bread domain to be domain invariant. And we, last thing, we added this regularization here. As I said before, we want the bread images to be edge-like. So we are using an off-the-shelf edge detector. It can be, we, use, we are using head, we can also use Kenny, and we compare pixel-wise the edge image to the bread image, and this is the regularization. So now you can see the entire training architecture. And during test, we apply this backbone on the test image and get the representation. Let's see some results. Uh, first, the task of unsupervised domain generalization. In this task, we, we are training on multiple source domain unsupervisedly. Then we freeze the backbone and fit a classifier on a few labeled examples from, from each class in the source domain, what we call a few shot learning. And then we test the classifier on an unseen target domain. We tested it on packs and domain data sets and compared to several baselines, especially this one, DIUL, which is the, the paper where this task was proposed. And you can see our result both with K and N uh, classifier and linear classifier. You can see that our result, results are much better in all cases here. Um, this is for 1% label data, 10% label data, and same from the, for the mainnet. In parks, the training was done on a live one out basis, meaning we trained on three domains and tested on the, on the remaining one in each one of those columns here. In the mainnet, we tested on, we trained on three domains and tested on each one of the remaining and vice versa. The second test, double unsupervised domain adaptation, it's the same as in the do domain generalization case, only that now we also have the target domain, unseen, uh, unlabeled target domain during training. Um, here, this is a new, we tested on domain net, but this is a new benchmark, so we don't have baselines to compare to, but we compare to something close, which is few shot unsupervised domain adaptation. This, was, uh, this is a task that was proposed by this paper, PCS. And in few shots, instead of having completely unsupervised source domain, 
we do have a few labeled examples for each um, a class in the source domain. So all those baselines here was used the few shot example for the training of the backbone itself. But in our case, the backbone is completely unsupervised and the few shots was, were used only for the classifier. But you, could, you can see that still our results are much, much better. Another issue is that all the baselines use a separate model for each pair of source and target domains, each one of these columns. But in our case, we can train one single model on all the domains. Uh, so in order to have fair comparison, we also trained our model separately for each pair of domain. You can see the results here in the, our pairwise results for K and N and linear classifier. Uh, the two numbers here are for one shot and for three shot classifier. Uh, you can see that the pairwise, pairwise results are already much better than the baseline, but on the bottom, the single model results are even much better. Um, Okay, the last task, unsupervised generalization across data sets. Now we train on domain it with the domain painting, real, clip art, and sketch, but tested on, an, on other data sets, office home, PAX, and VISDA. And you can see here the, the domains of those uh, data sets. So some of the domains are shared between training and test, like uh, clip art, real, sketch, but some of them are completely new in the test, like product here and 3D rendering. For each one of those data set, we took two domains, one for source, one for target, train a few shot classifier on the source and tested on the target. And then we averaged over all the pairs of source and domain. And this is what the numbers you see in the table for one shot and for three, three shot classifier. And we compared here for, to all the recent uh, contrastive learning methods. You can see that our results are better, meaning we can generalize better to new, domain, to, uh, new domains and new, class, uh, new classes. Unseen domain, unseen classes. Uh, okay, some visualization. Uh, you, there is some original images here for a real domain, painting, clip art, and sketch. Here you can see the canny edges, which are quite noisy. The head edges, which lack some of the details. And then the bread, edge, bread images, which um, you can see that they preserve the edges, the important edges, or the important details, or the discriminative details. Let's say, in, for instance, the, the windows of the house or the eyes of the dog, and you can zoom in on the giraffe, you can see the texture of the neck, on the neck, which is much better than head and not as noisy as Kenny. And same for the sketch of the giraffe. Okay, okay, I wanted to show you a live demo, but there are some severe technical issues. So I will just show you some screenshots. In the, in the demo we have, we can choose the query domain, the search domain, a number of results, and then pick a random index, I mean random image from the query domain, and get the closest images in, in the search domains. For instance, here we got a cartoon of an elephant, we compare it to, we, we get the, the closest uh, uh, photos, we, which are all elephants, closest painting, closest cartoons, and closest the um, sketches, and all of them are elephant, and all of them are in the same pose, elephant from the front. Same goes for the sketch of the giraffe, we got all giraffes. And uh, now, th this is from Pax dataset, this is now from a um, uh, domain, it. We, can, we got a cut. There are some mistakes here, like those two are tigers, but reasonable mistakes, and the index of this image, the class of this image is rabbit, but there is a cut in the image. Same for hot dog. There, Apparently this image is lobster and not hot dog, but <laughs> looks the same to me. Um, aircraft carrier and watermelon. Here in the watermelon, you can see again that the pose is, is similar. All of them are sliced and not a whole water, watermelon because sim it's similar to the um, query. Well, that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Siva. This was very exciting. Uh, let's see if there are any questions from the audience. I see one. Um, do you need to know how many domains you have? No, we, we, we need to know the index of the domain because we, we are using it for the discriminator. But the number of the domains, is, we, can, we can work with more domain or less domain. We just need to know which domain each image came from. So is it, how does it scale with the number of domains? Uh, is it linear in the number of domains? You mean the, the training time? Yeah. Yeah. And so can you go extreme and not even specify for each image to what domain it belongs to? 
say again? Can I, can I what? So if I understand it correctly, currently you know for each image to which domain it belongs to. This yes. is an image, this is a clip, this is a yes. drawing, whatnot. Can you go one step further and just dump a bunch of images of different domains Without on the algorithm the and let the it uh, figure out what are the different types? Uh, we didn't try it because we, we, in the architecture we use domain, uh, domain uh, discriminator. We need to know which, uh, and we, we use per domain queue and we can't do it if we don't know which domain it came from. Yeah. And I, I'm somewhat surprised. I was thought that edges are not very stable and not are, are not a good I feature to work with images. I um, heard it too, but it works. And also, it's not like just using Ken. You know, we can there's because it's not exactly an edge image. Let me see some example. Um, I have one here, I think. Okay, the bread images. Are, well, do you see my screen? Because I don't see it. it uh, went, yeah, now we see it. Okay, like here, for example. Uh, the full screen, did it work? So I will try like this. This is, you, you can see here, this person here. It is not an edge image. It's yeah. gray level. Yeah. So it's not exactly an edge image, but, but the, con the outside contour it, it is, ed it, is the, what the, is, is the meaningful uh, details that you need. So it, it's not exactly edge, but it works. <laughs> this is amazing, having to revisit all the assumptions and things that we were taught back in school. Uh, <laughs> let's see, any other questions? Uh, no, I don't see. People really enjoy the work. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, let's uh, move on. Thank you very much, Sivan. Thank you. And we're moving uh, to the last talk of this uh, session by uh, Marina. Alterman and Anat Levin from the Technion. And Marina is going to give the talk. Marina, can you share in the screen? Do you see my screen? Yeah, okay, go ahead. The floor is yours. Second. Okay, so hi everyone. I will talk about our work on imaging with local specular intensity correlations. And this is a joint work uh, with Chen Bar, Yanis Gekurekas, and Danat Levy. So we're interested in imaging algorithms for seeing through scattering. And this means creating clear images of an illumination pattern that is hidden from the camera by scattering layer, for example, the tissue. This is actually a difficult problem because as emitted light propagates through the scattering layer, it scatters multiple times, producing speckle image on the camera sensor. So we focus on scenes through scattering algorithms that work by taking advantage of the memory effect property of these speckle images. This means that as we shift the single point eliminator behind the scattering layer, the resulting speckle images are correlated shifted versions of each other. So a well-known imaging through scattering algorithm was proposed by Ori Katz and colleagues, and it recovers a clear image of the hidden illuminators from the autocorrelation of these speckle images. So this general approach is very promising for tissue imaging applications, but applying it in practice is actually challenging uh, for these reasons. So uh, let's see the reasons. So first, the size of the illuminated pattern it can recover is actually very limited because it assumes that the memory effect property holds between any two points on the pattern, but the memory effect range can actually be very small. Second, the density of the illuminators that the algorithm can recover is also very limited. Because as illuminator density increases, speckle contrast decays. And third, most previous experimental realizations of this approach operated in far field conditions. This means placing the hidden illuminators several centimeters away from the scattering layer. This is very different from the near field conditions required in the medical applications where, for example, uh, fluorescent sources are located inside the tissue layer rather than far behind it. So in this work, we look to better understand and overcome these three challenges. 
So let's see our contributions. So we first use theory and physics-based rendering simulations to study the properties of this memory effect. We focus in this work on near field conditions, which are representative of tissue imaging applications and actually little studied in prior work. We aim to understand similarities and differences with far field conditions, as well as discover new properties of speckles that we can use for imaging. We then use our findings to develop a new algorithm for imaging through scattering based on the memory effect. And our algorithm is much more robust than the original algorithm. In particular, we show that it can construct illumination patterns that are a order of magnitude denser and larger. And also it can work under both far field and near field conditions. And at the end, uh, we show results from real leg experiments using real tissue samples, uh, both for near and far field settings. So uh, due to lack of time here, I won't get into detailed theoretical analysis, but I will summarize the main findings. So in the paper, we show that in the near field, the memory effect only applies for scattering layers of modest thickness which is much smaller than in the far field case. We also find that under near field conditions at such thicknesses, the speckle patterns have local support. And this is in stark contrast with previous far field approaches where speckle patterns spread over the entire sensor. We'll study the prior work. We will, we will now show you how we can use these observations and the, uh, specifically the local support property to develop better imaging through scattering algorithms. So uh, before uh, introducing our approach, let's briefly review the original method of uh, Katz et al for imaging through scattering using the memory effect. So for this, consider a point eliminator behind the scattering layer. Due to multiple scattering, a camera placed at the opposite side of the layer will measure a speckle image. If we consider other illuminators placed on uh, nearby locations on the same plane, they also produce speckle images. The memory effect property of speckle implies that when the displacement between the illuminators is small enough, the speckle images are shifted versions of each other. If the illuminator plane contains three incoherent illuminators, the camera measures the incoherent summation of their individual speckle images. Then the memory effect means that the total image I is approximately equal to the correlation of the clear image O of the illuminator plane with the speckle image S produced by a single illuminator. We can now consider the autocorrelation of the total speckle image I as the speckle pattern S is approximately zero mean independent noise, its autocorrelation is approximately in impulse, and as a result, autocorrelation of I approximately equals to the autocorrelation of the clear image O. So this means that we can recover O from the autocorrelation of I using a phase retrieval algorithms. And in the rest of the talk, we will be referring to this classic algorithm as the full frame autocorrelation Algorithm. So this uh, classical algorithm was originally developed for applications where speckle images cover the entire sensor. But in this work, we argue that if speckle images have local support, as they do under, under tissue imaging settings, we can use this property to significantly improve over the full frame autocorrelation algorithm. So to see this, let's see how speckle correlation is computed. So suppose we have this speckle image and we attempt to detect which sources are present. So we consider different shifts of this image and compute the correlation between the original and the shifted copy, which basically involves multiplying them and summing. But here is a key difference. Previous algorithms summed over the entire image. But if we know that the speckle spread is local, we also know that the correlation emerges only from this local region. On the other hand, uh, the pixels, for example, in this blob are only noise, which will not contribute to the correlation. So if we sum only inside this green window, we can actually reject the other noise. So in the paper, we prove 
the distilling this simple change results in an order of magnitude improvement in the signal to noise ratio of the correlation. To see the difference between local and global correlation, consider this example. So we can compute the full form of the correlation of this arc, but this is uh, very noisy. The contrast here is the local autocorrelation in three windows. So it is less noisy and it also provides some information on the latent illuminator pattern. In particular, you can see the local orientation of the illumination arc in each region. So now let's move to some of our experimental results. So in our lab, we built two imaging setups corresponding to far and near field imaging configurations. We use them to capture speckle images produced by illuminator patterns occluded by chicken breast tissue uh, of different thicknesses. So in far field setting, the object was far from the uh, tissue sample, where in the near field, it was right at the back of the tissue sample. So first, we show results from the far field setup. And even under far field conditions, when the tissue layer has modest thickness, we can take advantage of this local support of the produced speckle patterns. So our local autocorrelation approach successfully recovers this image, whereas the original full frame autocorrelation here is unsuccessful. For the full frame algorithm, we show the densest pattern that it can reconstruct. And in this example, it is four times sparser than the pattern reconstructed by our approach. Uh, see that in this case, the illuminator pattern is actually small enough to fit inside the whole memory effect range. And the reason the full frame approach fails here is not that the correlation does not exist, but the fact that this SNR of the correlation it can detect is actually very low because of the high illuminator density. So uh, to see this better, we can zoom in on a small window from the input image. And so you can see that when there are fewer illuminators, the speckle patterns have higher variance, and this makes the autocorrelation less noisy. So the uh, algorithm uh, reconstruction is easier. Let's now look at thicker samples. Here, the illuminator density for which our algorithm produces correct reconstructions is even higher compared to what the full frame algorithm can handle. We note that in this example, the pattern we recover is much wider than the memory effect range. So on the full image, the full frame approach fails completely. And we try to see what portion of this image it can actually reconstruct and ended up with this small region. And the reason our algorithm can recover patterns wider than the memory effect range is that it only relies on local correlations between nearby illuminators. Unlike the full frame algorithm, our algorithm does not require the correlation exists between every pair of uh, illuminators in the latent pattern. So overall, we see that our algorithm can increase both the density and the size of recoverable patterns. But recall that this far field configuration is actually unrealistic for biomedical imaging where the sources may be inside the tissue. So I will now show you some near field results, which are more challenging. So this is a near field example. It images a thinner tissue layer where scattering is modest and the latent pattern may be a bit recognizable from the speckle image. But even for this modest degradation, it's challenging for the full frame approach which fails unless applied on a very, very sparse set of illuminators. By contrast, our approach produces correct reconstruction for both illuminator densities. Now let's see a few more challenging experiments. So you can see here that the degradation due to multiple scattering is much stronger and our local algorithm still outperforms the full frame approach. However, we can notice some artifacts even in our construction. We zoom in on a couple of digits here to show reconstructions for different illuminator densities. So let's see, here are digits for few densities. So you can see that our local approach performs worse for, de for denser patterns, but still outperforms the full frame approach. And the full frame approach here only successful at considerably sparser patterns. 
We also made some attempts to recover real fluorescent beads placed at the back of a real tissue layer. This experiment is much harder because given how weakly these beads fluoresce, the measured images contain a lot of noise. The speckle contrast is very, very weak, but still uh, here is a nice result where we managed to reconstruct the beads. So let me summarize uh, this talk. First, we performed a theoretical and simulation-based analysis of the memory effect, and we characterized the similarities and differences between imaging through scattering applications, both under far field and the near field imaging conditions. For the near field case, we showed that we can use memory effect to image through layers of only modest thickness. In turn, such layers produce speckle images with local support. We can use this local support property to develop a new algorithm for imaging through scattering. And our algorithm is applicable under both far field and near field settings and is much more robust compared to the original full frame algorithm. In particular, our algorithm provides an order of magnitude improvement in both the size and the density of recoverable luminator patterns. And we've demonstrated the improved performance of the algorithm through multiple lab experiments on the both near field and far field settings. And that's it, thanks for your attention. And uh, you can see the details in uh, our paper. Thank you very much, Marina, for the talk. Let's see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, I see one. Uh, so here is one question. Uh, all illuminators at once, it seems that the complexity should be much lower than when considering all pairwise illuminators. How is it when you consider closed pairs? Uh, again, I, I, can you repeat? Can you repeat, please? Yeah, sorry. So I, I guess the question is in terms of efficiency, you have uh, in, in, in the full frame, I need you, sorry, just a sec. To shut um, in, in the full frame, you need to essentially do autocorrelation over the entire image. And when you do it in, in patches, it, it works much faster. So, what is the time, uh, I guess, the speed difference between the two? I think, uh, well, actually, the, uh, the runtime. You can speed the runtime maybe using some uh, GPU implementations uh, because you need to go over all these uh, windows. Um, uh, so we have in the paper some, I don't um, remember now some uh, time comparison, but uh, for sure you can speed up this uh, computation by, by uh, using a GPU implementation, for example. No, but, but in your implementation, What's the time difference? Is it an order of magnitude difference or is it the same time roughly? Uh, it's, I think, uh, well, I don't have the exact times uh, here right now uh, with me, but I don't, I don't think it's an order of magnitude. So, so the, main, the main difference here is that you can actually recover the clean image. It's not a matter of speed. It's, it's a, a matter it's of, a matter of uh, yes. So you you because you do this local uh, correlation, you get better SNR and you can get better results. So we didn't concentrate on speed in this. Uh, hmm. This wasn't our purpose to do yeah. like faster things. We we wanted to do better in quality. Okay, a, a couple more questions. Did you handle differently the near field problem from the far field? Did you what? Did you what? Did Do you treat differently near field problems from far field problems, or you treat them both the same? You mean treat uh, in the algorithm? Yeah. Do you need to know ahead of time that you're running on a near field or a far mm, field? No. No. Okay. And I guess the last question. Uh, have you tried using an image to image CNN translation uh, on this problem? So essentially, train it on pairs of uh, input images and clean images, let the CNN figure out what's going on and compare results. So, so uh, obviously I think learning can, uh, can uh, uh, we can try learning on this data. We, we 
haven't tried this. We do have uh, you some. You want to understand. Uh, so first we want, so analytical solutions are always uh, good uh, to do. Um, obviously, you need to do some learning here and we can benefit from this. But first to do learning on this kind of data, you need to have the data. Um, and this data, to capture this data is not very easy. Uh, so, to, so since we have our uh, physically based simulator, we can actually create a lot of data for this and then try to, uh, to do some learning. We haven't done this yet. We have some preliminary work in our lab uh, 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 starting to do this. Uh, we haven't done this yet. There, there is a work uh, from Boston University about learning from speckles. Um, they have good results on their data sets of like letters and things like that. I'm not really sure how it will work for this kind of data. Um, but uh, definitely learning could do uh, good things for this as long as you have data sets to learn from. Okay, uh, well, thank you, Marina. Thanks all the speakers in the interest of time. Let's stop here. This ends the first session um, and we'll reconvene at 11.15. Thank you all and hope to see you again at 11.15. That's all the time.
So we are back. Um, so the YouTube is back uh, to be live. Um, so we'll start in one minute. So we are back. Um, okay. We'll start again in one minute. Okay, so welcome to the second session of uh, the Vision Day. So uh, due to the circumstances, we have to do it as a live event. Um, if you have uh, questions, uh, please uh, post them in the live chat. Uh, notice that there, will, there is a delay between uh, the Zoom and the YouTube, so you are seeing the talk in a delay of one or two of, of about one minute. So if you have a question during the talk, please post it. And then in the Q&A session, we will so our first speakers uh, in this session are uh, Ron uh, Slosberg and Ibrahim Jubran uh, with a joint work with Ron Kimmel on unsupervised high fidelity facial texture generation and reconstruction. So uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Raja, for the introduction. Uh, I am Ron <clears throat> and my colleague here, uh, Ibrahim, and this is our joint work that we will now present to you. Uh, and our topic, as Raja said, is uh, unsupervised high fidelity facial texture and generation and reconstruction. So let's begin. So our mo main motivation for this work is that uh, we've been looking at the uh, great success of um, the recent line of works of Stylegun and uh, similar works in the domain of uh, 2D generation and specifically uh, 2D generation of human faces. So we see that uh, such works are able to achieve very high levels of realism, but uh, it's difficult to control within 2D images the attributes such as lighting uh, and the expression and pose that require 3D uh, uh, or uh, ge 3D geometry. So we would like to have a similar capability of generation in the 3D domain. And we want to leverage our approaches to leverage these tools and these uh, techniques from the 2D domain towards our goal of a 3D facial generation. So what is 3D facial generation? So, the task is to uh, generate some random uh, human face, which consists of a pair of both the geometry and the corresponding uh, full texture of the face. So given some random noise uh, uh, vector, we would like to uh, generate this uh, texture image as well as the corresponding uh, geometric mesh. And they are able to be uh, rendered together uh, as such a realistic face. So the secondary task that we perform of uh, facial reconstruction from a single image, uh, this is an ill-posed Ill task where given some target image, we would like to have some reconstruction algorithm that the output of this algorithm should be the corresponding texture to the input image as well as the corresponding uh, geometry. And the final uh, reconstructed uh, face should look like this where all the areas of the face, even the ones occluded from the camera uh, should be visible. So of course, this is ill posed both the geometry and the texture, and it requires a good knowledge and a good prior of the uh, manifold of the human faces. So uh, we will utilize our uh, generative model towards this uh, goal as well. So the main bottleneck of uh, uh, such uh, works is collecting the data, and we want to completely circumvent this uh, bottleneck. So why is this a problem? 
scanning uh, people, scanning faces of people is uh, very difficult. The scanners are very expensive. They're not very common and the scans are not freely distributed. We can't just download them off the internet. So we would like to use just the freely available 2D datasets. <clears throat> so many of the previous works uh, that we uh, compare ourselves to rely on such uh, 3D scans and therefore they are very difficult to, uh, uh, to reproduce. Uh, they also don't provide necessarily high fidelity uh, results and they often don't produce a generative model. They, most of the previous works, they focus just on the, uh, on the uh, reconstruction uh, aspect of, the, of this uh, uh, problem. Our work, however, ticks all of these boxes uh, simultaneously. So our main contribution is that we provide a, a high fidelity generation pipeline for a coupled uh, geometry as well as texture. What does it mean coupled? For instance, if I produce an image texture image of an old man, I don't want to have a geometry of a young girl. They don't fit together. I need to have a geometry that is uh, corresponding and will be uh, realistic together with the texture. Okay, and uh, we do this by decoupling the intrinsic texture features uh, from the extrinsic properties such as pose and, uh, and lighting. Uh, the second thing that we do is that we have a texture recovery um, uh, algorithm for a single image, which relies on the same generative pipeline that we uh, trained before. And we are able to reconstruct both the frontal as well as the peripheral facial details. And we achieve state-of-the-art results in both of these tasks. So how can we uh, accomplish our task of uh, transporting our 2D, uh, the success from the 2D domain into the 3D? Let's uh, consider this uh, naive pipeline and build upon it. So uh, having some uh, 2D generator, uh, which produces textures, we will task it to produce some texture image and we will uh, generate some random facial uh, geometry and pose. And we can render this uh, texture on top of the rendered, on, on top of the uh, facial geometry to achieve some sort of synthetic image. Now, the problem with such uh, an approach is that the synthetic image does not look anything like the real image. We see that the real image has hair, background, uh, a neck, and so forth. So how can we uh, remedy this in order to perform uh, good adversarial training? So we look at the, both of the samples, and one approach could be to uh, segment the real image uh, out of the background. But we see that this approach is not uh, exactly um, uh, very successful because the uh, segmentation process might miss a little bit of the background. It might add a little bit of the neck and the shape of the segmentation does not correspond to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to, our, to our geometry uh, geometric model. Uh, our approach on the other hand uh, is to add a synthetic background into our synthetically generated face. So we, uh, if this is done properly, we see that we can have a face rendered on top of some synthetic background, which adds back in the, the hair, the background, the teeth, and so forth. So how do we achieve this? We introduce a secondary pre-trained uh, style gun generator, which produces a, a facial image, which we term the background image. We fit through a, a 3 d mm fitting procedure proposed by Deng et al. Uh, 3D geometry that fits exactly on top of this background image. And then we can uh, simply render our textured geometry on top of this background image. And we task our texture generator to generate a texture that will fit well within this uh, background image. This way, after the texture generator is trained, we will have a, a realistic uh, synthetic sample. Now my colleague Ibrahim will take over uh, from here. Okay. Um, so one important thing to note is that both generators received are fed by the same uh, noise input vector Z. So what is the problem with this naive pipeline? So it suffers from three uh, inherent problems. First of all, since most of, most of the randomly generated background images contain frontal poses of people due to the style gun pre trained generator, our final rendered image will only present the central region of our generated texture. Why is this a problem? Because our generator is thus not penalized when it generates blurry details in other regions. 
Thus, slowly during training, our generator will produce high level of details in the center of the texture, but might ignore uh, uh, other regions. How do we mitigate this problem? We need to have control over the poses of the, of the faces and the background images. To do so, instead of using a randomly generated latent vector W to, to produce the background image, we first plug this vector W into a pre-trained off-the-shelf deep feature manipulation component proposed by Tiwari et al., which alternates this vector W as to encode a, a specific facial pose inside this vector W. This way we can have control over the, the poses and we can uh, make sure that all the poses appear in the background images. The second problem in, our, in the Nave pipeline is that there is nothing constraining our generator from uh, uh, decoupling the lighting from the generated texture. And we would like to decouple those two. To do so, during the geometry fitting step, we also recover the background's lighting parameters and use them to post relight our uh, rendered texture. This way, the generator will be forced to produce lightless textures so that after our post relighting, this rendered uh, image will look realistic on top of the background image. And lastly, we have observed empirically that the uh, alignment accuracy between our generated texture and the background image is crucial, especially in the mouth region where our texture contains uh, a hole. To make sure this alignment is perfect, we invoke another off-the-shelf pre-trained component proposed by Cartinique et al., which recovers a set of dense landmarks on top of the background image. We use those landmarks to produce a mouth mask and use this mouth mask to manually mask out the mouth region from our rendered texture. This way, we make sure that our texture aligns perfectly with the background in this uh, very uh, important region. So this is our training pipeline. Uh, I will show an ablation study which shows that those three components are indeed crucial. At inference time for the generation task, we uh, randomly generate a vector Z, we plug it into our two pre-trained mapping networks to produce two latent vectors. The first one is used to produce a texture uh, using our pre-trained generator. And the second one is used to recover geometry parameters. Those two, our texture and the geometry parameters correspond to each other since they were both produced by the same input vector. We render those two together to produce our random textured 3D model. As of the reconstruction task, given an input image, we first again uh, uh, recover the geometry parameters from this image. We then plug our optimization parameters or vector W that we wish to recover into our pre-trained texture generator to produce a texture image. We render those two together to obtain a rendered texture. We compose it on top of the background image similar to the pipeline of training to produce a, a, some realistic image. We plug it into some differentiable loss and back propagate the gradients back to the optimization parameters and repeat until convergence. This pipeline results at the end of the day uh, with a recovered full textured model of the input image. As of experimental results uh, for the generation task. In this figure, we present our randomly generated texture images along with the zoomed in crop to show the high level of details. We also present the full textured model, uh, the texture composed on top of the geometry. In the four rightmost columns, you see two competing methods. Uh, as you can see, our method obtains higher level of details and higher level uh, of realism and diversity as compared to the competing methods when some of the competing methods are supervised while our, while our pipeline is unsupervised by textured scans. As of the construction task, in the following figure, we present visual comparison on a known uh, benchmark between our method and five state-of-the-art methods. As you can see, our results are at least comparable or slightly better than the competing methods when some of the competing methods are, are supervised methods. Numerically, however, we show uh, on various known metrics that our method achieves consistently better results than the state-of-the-art uh, uh, pipelines when tested on the Celeba test. In the following figure, we present additional reconstruction results in high resolution. Uh, as you can see, even when the input image contains frontal human poses, our generated results contains high level of details throughout the texture, not only in the central region. And as of the ablation study, in the following, uh, in the first column, we present the results using our full pipeline. In the second column, we remove the deep feature manipulation component. And as you can see, we start uh, seeing blurry regions as predicted. Without the post relighting component, we see that the lighting is now baked into the texture. texture. 
And lastly, without the mouth masking component, we see we can see severe uh, teeth artifacts again baked into the light into the, the texture, which means that our three uh, additional components are indeed crucial for the final results. And thank you for listening, and we invite you to read our full paper uh, online. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, there is a question. Do you have any background geometric model? Uh, so the geome only geometric model that we incorporate is the 3DMM model through the 3DMM fitting uh, stage. And also our geometry uh, is based on this model as well. But the training itself, all the training data for the textures is only uh, 2D pictures, 2D images. Okay, I have another question. Uh, can you use the technique you propose to train 3D uh, phase detection techniques? Phase detection? Phase detection? Yes. Or, or, or uh, identification. Identification, so, yeah. yeah. You might be able to generate uh, synthetic data and then use it within any application that you like. So it can be as, as perhaps synthetic data for um, for uh, face detection. Uh, indeed, there is such a paper that uh, has uh, uh, results that are far less realistic, but they show also that they are successful in improving facial recognition. So it should be uh, possible to improve facial recognition. Okay, then another question, what's the training loss and isn't it affected by the face on background stitching artifact? Um, so the main pipeline uh, uses a, a a gun loss, a discriminator loss, a W gun in, uh, uh, in our case. Um, and what was the, the second part of the, the question? The face teaching. Uh, yeah. We observed that, that the, this alignment is crucial, as I said, which is why we did the last component of the mouth masking. So this uh, alignment is indeed uh, crucial. Um, so yeah. um, we didn't observe uh, any um, really uh, effect of this uh, stitching, uh, as long as the face uh, covers exactly the correct uh, area in the, in the background image. Okay, and the last question, how does the model compare to either applying a 3D reconstruction to a number of images or train a 3D GAN model on top of this 3D reconstructions? So, sorry, it's two no. steps. So first, apply a 3D reconstruction to a number of images and then train a 3D GAN model on top of this with 3D reconstructions. So, uh, so in order to train the 3D reconstruction, you also need uh, some type of uh, 3D data. So it's a uh, chicken and egg. You need uh, the data to train the 3D reconstruction. Also, um, um, you don't know if the reconstruction um, really produces uh, uh, realistic faces. The 2D faces that we have, we know that they are uh, original data, that they are realistic. So you're going through some several stages of uh, unrealism, un uh, but uh, it, might, it might also uh, be an approach that can work. We, we don't know, we haven't tested it. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, we will move to the next uh, speaker. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's Isik Ben Shabbat uh, that will present a work about th seeing through the point clouds uh, with uh, Adi Mesika and Ayelet Tal. So Isik, you are on mute. You can start. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry for that. Um, okay, thanks for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Itzik Ben Shabbat, and this talk is titled Seeing Through the Point Clouds, a postdoctoral journey towards 3D understanding, since it's been, it brings together a body of research works that I did as part of my Marie Curie Global Individual Fellowship in collaboration with Professor Ayelet Tal's lab at Technion, and Professor Steve Gould group at the Australian National University. 
Um, we had several papers come out in 2021, including GopherBot and the IKEA assembly dataset, which was a massive group effort when I was still a part of the Australian Center for Robotic Vision. But due to the time constraint today, I will briefly cover CloudWalker and then dive deep into DIGS. Um, CloudWalker was born in Ayala Tal's lab, and most of the heavy lifting was done by Adi. This work takes on the challenge of learning a semantically meaningful representation for 3D point clouds. Um, 3D point clouds are a challenging data structure for deep architectures, since it is unordered, unstructured, may have a different number of points per shape and lack connectivity information. This is in addition to various possible data corruptions, including perturbation noise, outliers, and density variations. The key idea in CloudWalker is to impose structure using multiple random walks. We saw that utilizing the power of randomness and exploring different local regions of the shape can improve the representation in the context of classification and retrieval, retrieval tasks. I won't go too deep into the details, but the method takes a point cloud as input and generates multiple random walks. The, these walks are then used as input to a deep architecture that uses an MLP to learn a per point representation and a GRU to learn a per walk representation, which are then aggregated using a multi-walk aggregation module. We achieve state-of-the-art results on the tasks of classification and retrieval. Um, and for further details and results, please see the paper on archive. Um, moving on to our DIGS work, DIGS takes on the task of surface reconstruction and shape space learning from unoriented point clouds using implicit neural representations. This work was done during my time with Steve's group at ANU and in collaboration with Chamin. So given an input unoriented point cloud, our goal is to find the surface on which these points were sampled on. One way of representing these surfaces is the implicit rep representation. This means that the surface is the zero level set of an unknown function. Two types of functions are often used in this context, an indicator function and a sign distance function. The first outputs an inside-outside value, and the other a distance to the surface for each point. The implicit function theorem states that if you have a point on the zero level set of the function and the gradient of the function at that point is not vanishing, then locally the zero level set can be described as a graph of the function. This means that the zero level set is a manifold in the mathematical sense. Now, in research years, many groups have tackled different aspects of these problems. For example, DeepSDF, Occupancy Network, and Chen and Zhang showed that these functions can be learned using a neural network. Later, several works from Lipman's group showed better ways to train these networks using geometric initialization and different losses. And most recently, Sitzman et al. showed that sinusoidal activation functions can be used instead of ReLUs to improve fidelity and decrease the number of parameters and training time significantly. Um, before I dive deep into the proposed approach, I want to point out the two key ideas of our work. The first is the use of divergent the, the divergence loss during training. And the second is the use of a geometric in initialization for silence. These two combined allow to achieve good reconstruction results for unoriented point clouds. Okay, let's dive in. So most previous works, include, including ours, share the same general architecture. So given an input point, we want to get its distance to the surface as output. So given many points sampled on the circle in this example, the output will look something like this. The colors represent the distance to the surface and the arrows, the gradient at each grid point. The problem is that many methods show that without ground truth normal information at each point, this is how to train and sometimes does not convert to the desired solution or includes many undesired ghost geometries. So the first question we tackle is how can we train shape implicit neural representation without normals? This is where digs come in. It uses the divergence to guide the training process. It relies on the observation that for most shapes, the distance field has a low divergence value almost everywhere. Therefore, introducing a loss term that explicitly penalizes high divergence will help guide the network towards a better solution. Note that this is only applicable to networks that use an 
activation function that has non-zero second derivative. In our case, we use sinusoidal activation. A better intuition for understanding why this will help training by looking into the divergence theorem, which state that integrating over the outward flow in a volume using a triple int integral of the divergence is equivalent to a double integral of the flux through its encapsulating surface. In the context of neural shape representation learning, this intuitively means that the proposed divergence constraints incorporate additional local information of surrounding normals vectors of the learned sine distance function. Here we give the proposed loss, which includes the zero level set term that pushes points on the surface to have zero distance, the iconal term that pushes the magnitude of the gradients to be of unit size, the interterm that penalizes low values close to the surface, and the proposed divergence term, which pushes the divergence to be low almost everywhere. Note that we anneal the divergence term as training progresses to allow a tighter surface fit since penalizing the divergence too harshly yields over smooth result results. So while this is very effective for reconstruction, for some tasks, such as shape-based learning, a geometric initial initialization is required. That is, how can we set the initial weights of the network in such a way that they produce a known geometry like a sphere? Sitzman et al. proposed to initialize the network using a uniform distribution. This is shown to give good results for scene and high detail objects, but problematic for shape-based learning and simple shapes, especially without normal supervision. Here we can see on the left uh, a 2D, the sine, uh, sine distance function. Blue green represents negative values and red high positive values, and a bold black line represents the zero level set. Note the high frequencies and lack of zero level set in the siren original initialization. We propose the geometric initialization. By setting specific values to the weights of the last two layers, we initialize to a sphere. However, we witnessed in our experiments that with this smooth initialization, the network is not able to recover some high frequencies during training. Therefore, we propose the multi-frequency geometric initialization or MFGI in short, which adds these high frequencies to the first layer, but suppresses them down in the second layer. As training progresses, the required frequencies can recover. In the paper, we provide the mathematical derivation and proofs for these initialization. So just to recap, the proposed training procedure starts by initializing using MFGI, and then training in three stages. The high divergence phase, which applies a strong penalty for high divergence, and encourages a smooth solution into a coarse shape, an annealing phase where we incrementally decrease the divergence penalty, and the final low divergence phase where we significantly reduce the divergence constraint and allow the network to capture high detail. Let's see it in action. The above video captures the reconstructed shape at different training iterations for the proposed approach on the left and for siren without normal supervision on the right. Here, color represents distance to the surface. It shows coarse shape obtained at the end of the high divergence phase, and then as training progresses, it becomes tighter and tighter. In comparison, siren without normals supervision gets stuck with persistent ghost geometries very early on. We evaluate our approach on the task of surface reconstruction, scene reconstruction, and shapes-based learning. In shapes-based learning, we reconstruct geometries never seen before by the network based on a learned latent code. We use the standard data set and benchmark, including the surface reconstruction benchmark, shape net for, for surface reconstruction, and defaust for shape space learning. Um, qualitatively, our digs is particularly good at suppressing ghost geometries, like the ones appearing near the top of the first shape or the tip of the node, the nose in this second shape. Quantitatively, we compare using the chamfer and Hausdorff distance between the reconstructed and input point clouds. The results show that without normals for supervision, Diggs is able to outperform its competitors. In the paper, we also include an extensive ablation study and compare to methods that use normals for supervision where we achieve comparable results. We also qualitatively show the results for scene reconstruction. Similar to the gargoyle example before, when normal information is missing, siren without normals obtains a tighter fit in some regions, but tends to have many 
persistent ghost geometries. The curtain in this example uh, is one example where digs is a bit over smooth, over smooth, while the interior avoids many of the ghost pile of sand like ghost geometries. Shape space learning, on the other hand, is a much more challenging task. The results show that Diggs learns a human-like shape that resembles the ground truth, but is over smooth and has lots of ghost geometries, while IGR is, for example, IGR without normals is unable to converge. Um, to be fair, we also compare with normal supervision. IGL shows more detail, but also many ghost geometries and disappearing hands. Diggs is over smooth, but with much less ghost geometries and structural errors. Note that the frames with the pink overlay are the only ones that exist in, tra in the training set. Um, so to sum up, we introduce uh, divergence-based shape neural representation learning, which incorporates soft second-order de derivative constraints to guide the shape representation learning process. Additionally, we derive a new geometric initialization method for sinusoidal-based neural shape representation networks that lead to better learned uh, implicit shapes. And most notably, we learn from raw point clouds without ground truth normal vectors or distance to manifold information. Before I take questions, I would like to use this opportunity and invite uh, the other speakers here to be a guest on my podcast. Talking Papers is a podcast by researchers for researchers and aim to become a new medium for disseminating research. Please reach out if you're interested. Uh, finally, I would like to extend a huge thanks to my collaborator at the Technion and ANU and let you know that the papers are available on archive and the code will soon be available on GitHub. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, uh, Itzik, for the very interesting uh, talk. Uh, there are several questions. Uh, first, why you don't train with uh, just estimated normals or how your results compare with just using estimated normals? Yeah, so, so that's an excellent question. So it's important to, to note that estimated normals are very noisy and problematic. I have two previous works, one called NestiNet and DeepFit, which tackled exactly the problem of estimating normals. And although there has been a very big progress in getting reliable normals, there, there are still uh, significant errors in, in those estimations that can cause a lot of problems for, um, for this type of shape reconstruction and shape space learning um, approaches. Another question, have you tried using uh, the principal curvature for the supervision? Uh, yes, so um, because we have the second derivative, uh, so obviously the div pushing the divergence to be zero is, is one way of looking at it. We tried estimating the, the, the curvatures around using local neighborhood. Um, and then pushing the, using the divergence constraint, uh, the, sorry, using the divergence to, to get, uh, so to create a loss that uses the curvature for supervision. However, because the curvature's estimation is so noisy, we actually got a degradation in result. So um, yeah, we tried that. Okay, another question. So uh, the divergence, of uh, the division gradient of the distance function is equal to the mean curvature of the level sets. So if you minimize for the Laplacian uniformly, you would get a, a bias that is undesired. Why you, why you don't just use a prescribed curvature? You have the explicit equation for that, the rather than a just a uh, use the, the, the uh, minimize the integral over the divergence of the gradient, which is H. Um, that was a bit, I, so I think it, it kind of resembled the, the previous questions uh, pertaining to the principal curvatures. I will just say that um, we apply the, the, the divergence term everywhere outside the surface, right? So, so on the surface, um, we don't penalize for the divergence and we anneal it as the training progresses. So if we would have had a good estimation or even a ground truth curvature, then maybe that would have helped. But in practice, when you use that constraint um, with estimated curvatures, the amount of noise and inaccuracies in the estimation just degrade the results. Uh, okay, so... Okay, thank you. 
Uh, yeah, be, be, because now when, be, when you have the uh, all uh, when you have the implicit function, so you cannot calculate the curvature explicitly. So you have an explicit equation for that. You don't need to estimate that. Well, yeah, the, the, but we don't have that as a ground truth, right? We get that as an output of our network. So in order to penalize and get that as supervision, we need to have the ground truth for that, right? Does yeah. that make sense? Or maybe I misunderstood the question somehow. Okay, so maybe we'll take it after the talk. So yeah, let's take it offline. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so our next speaker is Itai Lang. Uh, that we talk about uh, geometric adversarial attacks and defense on uh, 3D point clouds. Uh, this is a work with uh, Uriel uh, Kotlitsky and Shaya Vidan. Okay. Thank you, Raja. So. <clears throat> Hello everyone, my name is Itai Lang. I'm a PhD candidate at Tel Aviv University, advised by a professor, Professor Shai Vidan. And today I will present our work on geometric adversarial attacks and defenses on 3D point clouds. This is, this is a joint work with Uriel Kotitsky from Tel Aviv University. Let's begin with the demonstration of what our attack can do. Suppose that the 3D point cloud is to be processed by an autoencoder model for compression on transmission purposes. Normally, the autoencoder will reconstruct the geometry of the input shape. In our work, we propose a novel framework for geometric attack. That is, by small perturbation to the input point cloud, we fool the autoencoder and cause it to reconstruct a completely different 3D shape. In this case, it turns a bench into a car. Now let's continue with motivating adversarial attacks in general and geometric uh, adversarial attacks in particular. In re recent years, 3D data and artificial intelligence model are used in everyday life application, uh, applications. And recently, deep learning models are integrated in safety critical systems, such as the self-driving car and 3D medical imaging. Now note that these applications should have a precise geometric perception of their environment. For example, the car should know the size of the other vehicles in the scene, whether it's a big truck or a small motorcycle, in order to keep a proper distance. And for the medical imaging case, we would like the system to measure the volume of the heart or the length of the bone with a high accuracy for the success of the medical procedure. Despite the great popularity and success of deep neural networks, it turns out that they are highly vulnerable to adversarial attacks that maliciously alter the network's outcome. This topic has drawn much attention in the case of 2D images, where the main focus has been on the semantic level, meaning adversarial examples of images that mislead image classifiers. For example, in the work of Ian Goodfellow, uh, Ian Goodfellow and uh, colleagues, they showed that by small perturbation to the pixel values, they can create this adversarial example that looks similar to the original image, to the panda image, but, but misclassified as a given. And very recently, adversarial attacks have, have been extended to 3D point cloud classification. However, a point cloud is also a geometric entity typically used in the context of encoding and reconstructing the geometry by an autoencoder model. Thus, a natural question is whether adversarial attacks are possible at a geometric level. Or more specifically, we asked ourselves, can we make a small perturbation to an input point cloud to change the reconstructed geometry by an autoencoder model? And in our work, we show for the first time that this type of attack is possible. Let's talk about the problem statement of the attack or what are the rules of the game? Suppose that there is a source class of shape instances with the same meaning in this example, benches, and the source instance, a source point cloud is selected in random. 
Now, what we would like our attack to do is to perturb the coordinates of the point cloud, meaning to change the x, y, z coordinates of the point cloud say, sum in order that when the, point, the adversarial example is fed through the autoencoder, the autoencoder will reconstruct a shape instance from a different target class. In this case, a target class of cars. Now note that since we would like to reconstruct a shape from the target class, we have the, the freedom of selecting the, the target that we want. So we select the target such that it is close geometrically to the source shape and it improves the, the uh, performance of the attack in, in, in the sense of the perturbation to the source and the reconstruction quality of the target. Now note the sharp contrast to the semantic attack, to the ex existing semantic attacks. While a semantic attack operates on a classifier and aims at changing the, the label of the source to the label of the target class, we would like to, we, we operate on an autoencoder model and would like to change in its reconstructed output to an instance, to a true instance from the target class. Once we have the source and target shapes for, for the attack, we take a victim autoencoder, which is pre-trained and fixed during the attack. Then we add a perturbation, which is the which is optimized by, by the attack to get an adversarial example, feed it through the autoencoder and get a reconstructed output. Now note that the attack is an optimization problem that must reconcile two contradicting demands. On the one hand, we would like the adversarial example in red to be similar to the, to the source point cloud on the left. On the other, we would like its reconstruction to match a true uh, different target shape the yellow reconstruction and the target point cloud on the right. In order to cope with this challenge, we select the, the target uh, wisely, as I explained before, uh, according to the geometric proximity between the possible targets and the source point cloud under attack. And also, we optimize the attack with two loss terms, the perturbation. The first one requires a small distance between the adversarial example and the source point cloud, which operates on the input. And the other loss requires a small reconstruction loss between the output of the autoencoder and the target shape. Overall, this is the optimization of the attack of P, the perturbation, where we implement the loss at the output by chamfer distance between the reconstruction and the target shape. And similarly, we use chamfer distance to measure the distance between the adversarial example Q and the source point cloud S. Where chamfer distance is a popular and a very popular metric to measure distance between point clouds. We use the ShapeNet dataset, which is a popular dataset in the autoencoders research, and it contains a, a shape instances, man-made instances such as car, airplanes, chair, sofas, tables, etc., etc. Let's see some results of the attack. Here is a source point cloud of a table and its reconstruction by the autoencoder, which is also uh, has the geometry of a table. Here is the target uh, of the attack, a uh, shape of sofa, and its reconstruction by the autoencoder, which is also a sofa. And this is the result of our attack and its reconstruction by the autoencoder. Now, as you can see, the adversarial example is similar to the source shape, while its reconstruction by the autoencoder is very similar to the reconstruction of the original uh, target shape, this, uh, of the original sofa, which shows that the attack achieves its goal. A small perturbation to the input shape, shape changes, changes the geometry of the, uh, the reconstructed geometry and the output, output of the autoencoder to a desired target shape. Quantitatively, we evaluate the geometric performance of the attack as follows. We take the recon uh, reconstruction error of the target when the adversarial example is in red is at the input and divided by the reconstruction error of the autoencoder where the target shape in blue is at its input to get the target normalized reconstruction error. And on average, on the set of uh, source and target pairs of the attack, 
we get a, a score of 1.11, which means that the reconstruction error by an adversarial example is only increased by 11% in, in comparison to the original reconstruction error of the, of the autoencoder, which means that the reconstruction quality is very similar, to, very similar, very good as of the autoencoder. For the input, we measure and we count the number of points that the attack shifts outside the surface of the ship, which means that they are far, their nearest neighbor is uh, far more than, a dis more than a threshold on the distance. And we get on average 24 of surface points, which are less than 1% of the total number of points in the point column, which, we, which is very relatively low. Now, since semantic attack is very popular in, in the literature, an interesting question is whether it, it is effective as a geometric attack on the autoencoder. Here is a semantic attack, semantic uh, adversarial example that mislead image classifier to the sofa label. Now, the question is whether when it fed to the autoencoder, it will be reconstructed as a sofa. Well, it doesn't. It is reconstructed as a table. And moreover, when the classifier is, uh, operates on the reconstructed shape, it is not classified as a sofa any anymore, but rather correctly as a table, which means that, that the semantic attack is ineffective after passing through the autoencoder. In contrast, our attack is much more effective since it changes the geometry at the output of the autoencoder to the sofa target shape. And also when the classifier operates on this, this uh, shape, it is, it is misled to the sofa label, which means that our geometric attack also have a side effect semantic adversarial uh, attack at the decoder side. In our work, we also evaluate the robustness of the attack to a counter defense. Let's see an example. Here is a, a shape of a table, which is, re which is reconstructed as a table. And here is its adversarial example, which is reconstructed as a sofa. As I said before, some of the points are shifted by the attack away from the shape. And a straightforward defense is to take these points and filter them, them, uh, filter them out, uh, which means take a point with its nearest neighbor uh, too far and then throw this point away. And this is how we get a defendant input. So now, we should probably get the reconstruction of the original table, uh, the yellow shape on the, on the left, correct? Well, not exactly. In this experiment, we noticed a surprising behavior. A residual effect of the attack still remains at the output after applying the defense to the input. And let's see what it means. At the original reconstruction of the, of the short shape, mm -hmm. the top of the shape is flat. However, the reconstruction of the defended point cloud is not flat anymore. It is rather curved, similar to the way that the target shape of the attack, the sofa, is curved. And it shows that the attack is, has robustness to the defense in the geometric aspect. To summarize, in our work, we propose a geometric adversarial attack, which is an attack that operates on an autoencoder and changes the reconstructed geometry at, it, in, at its output. And this is in sharp contrast to the existing work on semantic attack, which operates on a, a classifier and aim, aims to change the semantic label, the predicted label. We show that the attack is not entirely defendable since even after applying a defense to the input, we see a geometric characteristics at the reconstructed output of the target shape of the attack. Our paper and code are publicly available. There are much more results and analysis and explanations there. I encourage you to have a look. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, so there is a question. Uh, the, it seems like your target shape is always of the same orientation and size as the source shape. Uh, this is not a constraint in adversarial attacks on images. Is this is a necessity of your method? Okay, so um, what we did is uh, we took the, the data set that is typically used uh, in the autoencoder uh, autoencoders research in which the shapes are aligned. Uh, and basically it is not a constraint. Uh, constraint. I can take a shape with a different orientation and 
and the fermo can be applied to such a shape. In this case, we may probably find the target shape, maybe a different target shape that is close geometrically to the source shape that we attack, maybe in a different orientation. So it's not a necessity, but, but this is the data set that it's typically used, and we follow the existing work on the uh, on autoencoders. Thank you. Uh, there is a, another two questions. Other questions. Did you try this method on an autoencoder which was trained with geometric perturbations? Would this defense work better than removing uh, just uh, distant points? Uh, so we didn't try it. Uh, this type of defense is uh, adversarial training. We didn't try it um, since we worked with with the, the we we took the autoencoders uh, that are published in the literature. We took uh, the autoencoder of Achilleoptas is uh, and trained it as he, he uh, instructed, and also we took other autoencoders uh, and trained them as the authors uh, instructed. And uh, I think typically autoencoders are not trained with uh, in such uh, perturbations because this is a recursion problem and, and uh, the blanket may be too short. And if there are too much perturbations, uh, augmentations in, in the training, so the blanket uh, will tear up and then the autoencoder will not be able to uh, reconstruct what it should reconstruct. So no, we, we did not try this uh, method, um, but it, it is interesting uh, to try it. Okay, another question is, uh, do you know if there, if such uh, adversarial attacks on autoencoder exist also in 2D images domain? Namely yes, yes, I know that there are attack, the, there is a paper on, uh, on autoencoder attack on images, um, but we did something, but we did something else, uh, else the, the way that they select the the target of the image and, and the, uh, evaluate the success of their attack is different than ours. Uh, so there is, but what we do is different. And what we do is the first time that uh, such such an attack is tried on, on point codes. Okay, another question is, does training on these adversarially generated samples improve the robustness of the autoencoder? So I, I think uh, I should I should go after the <laughs> after the lecture and try it because I, I think it would be very interesting to see whether that encoder uh, can be immune to such attack. What I think uh, it will do is it will be able to overcome such uh, these adversarial examples, but, but I think the framework can can uh, find another adversarial uh, examples that will be able to still mis mislead the, the autoencoder and change the reconstructed geometry. And can you retrain autoencoder using adversarial noise recursively until you already don't distinguish the clean source? What's the question again? Uh, can you retrain autoencoder using adversarial noise recursively until you already don't distinguish the clean source? You mean uh, that that the perturbation? Um, I guess that the perturbation uh, destroys the structure of the of the of the point cloud. Uh, okay, so if the attack is not uh, correctly regularized, so uh, we may we may reconstruct the desired target shape, but then the the source shape can be much distorted. So. Uh, I think it is possible, but what we did is to balance be between the loss terms such that we both get uh, as small as possible perturbation and as small as possible reconstruction error of the target. Okay, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, uh, Yaniv uh, Benny, uh, that uh, will uh, talk about uh, dynamic dual output diffusion models. Uh, which is a joint work with uh, Professor uh, Lior Wolf. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, thanks everyone. And thank you, uh, Raja and uh, Shai for organizing uh, this, uh, this meeting. Um, let me just uh, share the screen. I will start.
<laughs> okay. Um, so again, um, my name is Yaniv Benny, and I'm a PhD student under the guidance of uh, Professor Leo Wolf at uh, Tel Aviv University. And um, I will be presenting our work uh, on dynamic dual output diffusion models. Um, first, I'm going to talk about diffusion models because understanding uh, how this, uh, this uh, class of models work is crucial for understanding what we then uh, later did in our work. Um, diffusion models, it was uh, in 2020, uh, was presented by uh, Ho et al. And it's a generative model that uh, operates in such a way that um, a clean image uh, can be uh, iteratively uh, noised so that um, in each step it, it comes, uh, it, be, it gets closer to become a Gaussian noise. And then it is then possible to train a model to be able to uh, predict a denoising step in each step. So that then later a uh, fully, uh, fully noise image can be then uh, after uh, a lot of iterations be, uh, uh, be refined into a clean image. Um, the, so we talked about two different stages. First, we have a diffusion stage. Uh, in here, um, we want to take a clean image and then uh, perform one step of uh, noising. Um, to be closer to uh, to some noise image, and what what the original paper did and all the other following papers is that they applied uh, a Gaussian noise on the image, and this has a very good property because um, it is then also po uh, possible to jump from clean image into every any intermediate step. Um, by aggregating the, the noise and applying it once. And this is very efficient for training uh, because otherwise, in order to get to any intermediate state, we would have to apply a lot of uh, noising steps, but instead we can, uh, we can do it very efficiently and fast. And so because we have assumed a Gaussian, uh, um, Gaussian process for the, uh, for the diffusion process, we can also assume a Gaussian uh, process for the denoising stage. And then we define a function that is parameterized uh, with a mu component and sigma component. And we basically want to predict the distribution of uh, the previous step uh, given the current step and some information about uh, which step it is. And the, the objective is then to minimize the KL divergence loss um, between the real distribution of the probability for uh, the previous step given the current step and our model that tries to predict it. Now, the first problem with this, um, with this approach is that uh, this uh, this estimation has a very high variance. And this is because there are a lot of previous steps that could have resulted in the current step XT. And so the first thing that was, uh, uh, that was solved in the original work is instead of using the high variance estimation, we use a lower variance estimation that uses uh, also the information of x0, which is the original image. Now, we can do this because um, when we, th this is not the learned part of the model, this is only the objective. And during the training, we know what the original image was, so we can use it as additional information into um, what the most likely uh, previous step from the one that we see, to, uh, that we see now. And the, um, the equation is then to, uh, to predict the previous step with the combined information of the current step and the original image. And so what we get, we, we get uh, the same unbiased estimator, but now the beta component, which is the variance of the estimation, is now uh, smaller than what we uh, would have got if we only used the, the current step. Um, another simplification of the denoising step is that instead of uh, 
predicting both the mu component and the sigma component. Uh, the sigma component was fixed to uh, to some parameter that is uh, that, that meets the the diffusion uh, iteration, and then we all only have to predict the mu component, which makes the k divergence loss much simplified, and it is now only um, square distance between um, the predicted and the, the real uh, mu component. Um, now, so now we're gonna go deeper into uh, what we did in this in this work. Uh, so using the equation that we had for the real distribution of uh, t minus one, uh, uh, conditioned on the current step and the original one, um, we get this uh, equation of the new component. The problem here is that uh, during uh, during the reconstruction, we do not know what uh, the original image was. So we cannot use this uh, th this equation directly. But what we can do, we can use an estimation of the original image. And this is now predicted by our model. And we can use uh, this step in order to, uh, to estimate what the mu component uh, should be. Um, now, the estimation uh, can be done in two orthogonal ways, actually. Uh, one is to directly estimate the, the original image, like a lot of models do. Uh, but the other one is to uh, understand that the current uh, noisy image XT uh, is basically uh, a clear, the original image and then some noise applied to it. So instead of uh, directly predicting the, the original image, we can predict the, the noise that was applied and then subtract it from the current state to estimate the original image in a different way. And this results in then two different equations for how we uh, we can estimate the, the mu component. One uses the estimation of the original image directly, and one uses the estimation of the uh, of the noise. We can see that the the first one. So both of them uh, it uses the the current state, and then it adds something that. Uh, has to do with the estimation of the currents of the original image. The other one uh, uses uh, the estimation of the noise. And we can also, something that, uh, that is inter interesting to notice is that the first, uh, the first process um, adds, so it, it adds some component to the, to the current state and interpolates between them. And the other one subtracts something from the current state. So throughout the paper, we when we refer to this uh, to these two approaches, we call the first one the additive path and the second one the subtractive path. And now we're going to talk about uh, so what we actually did in the paper, and uh, so we ask what is the advantage of each method, and each method actually has a different temporal region where it is superior. Um, the predicting of the original image x theta directly uh, is better during the early stages. In the graph, you can see the, the loss of the mu component where the, the denoising step goes from right to left. So the original state, the original, uh, the, the initial uh, iterations are on the right and the final iterations are on the left. And we can see that uh, the loss for the uh, X theta component is much lower during the early stages. And this can be explained that uh, during the early stages, the image is very noisy. And so predicting the, the, mu the noise component is, is, uh, is more difficult than predicting some very smooth uh, estimation of, uh, of the mean of all the options. So this is why the uh, predicting some uh, blurred image directly is uh, has uh, less error than predicting the noise. But later during the, during the denoising, we get that um, actually the predicting of the noise gets a lower loss than, uh, than predicting the image. 
And this can be explained with that um, at later stages, it is easier to subtract small amounts of noise than to predict the image every time uh, from scratch. And we also, we also analyzed how the, the variance of the predicting of the original image uh, is a, uh, um, occurs over time. And we can see that uh, indeed, when we look at the estimation using the noise, then there are a lot of uh, steps where the model is uh, trying to cope with uh, errors that it made during the initial steps. And this is why uh, we have a high variance that uh, the model tries to reduce the, the variance of the epsilon theta for a lot of iterations, which is not present for the uh, predicting the image directly. And this again, uh, highlights why uh, estimating the image directly in the first uh, the first half of the of the denoising might be better. And so we then uh, with that with this uh, realization and the analysis, we thought about uh, how to come up with a solution that uh, that makes a benefit of both. Uh, of both approaches. And so we propose a, a, a solution that dynamically combines the two paths. And so during uh, an arbitrary uh, step T, uh, we use our model in order to predict both the, uh, the original image and the, and the applied noise. The applied noise is then subtracted from the current image for in order to get a second uh, prediction of the current state and then both and, and then we use both uh, equations that we had before in order to predict both the mu component uh, given the original image and the mu component given the noise and then we have a final third output which helps us to interpolate dynamically between uh, between the options so that the model can use uh, different weights um, on each output given the current situation. Um, we, we then looked at how this, uh, this dynamic uh, interpolation uh, affects, the, um, affects the results. And we can see that, it, uh, that the, um, the values of the interpolation uh, highly change between uh, each step. And so this gives us an, another intuition that the, the, interpolate, the dynamic interpolation is really necessary and we cannot uh, uh, um, replace it with simply applying some, uh, some constant interpolation factor for each time step. Um, now for the results. So the first uh, two data sets that we do, did our experiments on was, were CFAR10 and CELEB-A. And so in these uh, results, we can see the top one is, uh, in, in each example, is the result when you're using the, uh, the prediction of the, of the noise component only. And so we can, we can see the, the, the progress from uh, right to left on how the, the image was, uh, was refined. Uh, the second option shows how the model uh, used uh, only predicting the image directly. So instead of starting with a very noisy image, uh, which uh, is gradually uh, denoised, uh, what we get is a, is a very gray and blurry image that iteratively gets more content added to it. So we can see that the two, uh, that the two approaches are very different from each other. And so the both giving very different results and the application of each path heavily uh, um, changes how the final image uh, gets. And so finally, we show uh, how the, the result gets from using our combined uh, dynamic uh, combination of the two approaches. And first on C4, you can see that, the mo that our image is uh, far more detailed than the, than the blurred one and also more structured um, than the noise one. And also in Celeb A, we can, uh, we can see that um, the image is a bit sharper and also has a clearer 
uh, clear attributes such as the glasses. Um, we also uh, numerically compared our uh, results with, uh, with other methods and got that in almost all, all cases, uh, the FID in our method was lower than when uh, comparing to the other methods. And we compared it on a um, different amount of iteration steps. And we saw that it mostly, uh, it mostly helps when applying it on low iteration, which is a very important property. Uh, but it's also beneficial when applying more iterations. Um, finally, uh, we also uh, we also evaluated on ImageNet, which the uh, state-of-the-art architecture used by uh, Dariva and Nicole um, in uh, last year's paper. And the original paper, so they they could they could train it for a lot of uh, uh, for four million iterations, and they had a lot of uh, compute resources, which we didn't have. But what we could do, we, we could manage to run uh, some shorter uh, experiment. So instead of 4 million iterations, we only did 80,000 iterations. But we already saw that even in that case, uh, our method works better than when we uh, perform the same experiment, but only with the noise or the predicted image. Uh, and not uh, dynamically uh, interchangeable uh, one. And so uh, this, were the, uh, this was the presentation uh, and uh, I hope it was interesting for you. And are there some questions? Okay, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, so uh, I have a question. So, mm -hmm. If you run a lot of, so the advantage of your method is when you want to use the diffusion model with a few steps, right? Because if you, for example, will run with 1000 steps as is, as is done in the work of diffusion model bit scans, you will not get an advantage, but uh, with a small number of steps, you will get much better results. Uh, yes, so when, when you run, thousand iterations, then there is not really uh, much of a difference between uh, if, you, if you perform in this, uh, in this method or the other one. But the problem is that, uh, and this is the real drawback of uh, uh, how diffusion models were originally, is that it takes a lot of time in order to, to process an image. And there is a lot of uh, a lot of focus uh, now uh, in the research community on trying to uh, reduce the the amount of iterations in order to make the these uh, uh, these models much more applicable. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah and these models are really nice, but it takes a lot of time to generate images with them. Yes, it's really useful. So another question is, do you think diffusion models can be used for domain adaptation of the same content with different styles? Um, well, I think there are a lot of things that can be that can be done with diffusion models and we can already see a lot of uh, uh, nice applications of it. Um, there, is, there is a problem with the, so I, um, I think it's very likely that it can be done, but um, some some novel trick needs to be found in order to um, to make this work because um, the this straightforward training uh, makes make, it makes it a lot harder in order to um, to then do some style transfer and and that sort of stuff uh, with uh, with these models. But I think there are definitely novel tricks that can be done in order to make it work. And the last question is, have you tried it on high resolution images? Um, so the, the image, the image natural images that I showed uh, above, these are uh, 256 by 256 pixels. Um, we did not do it on any higher resolution. Um, but uh, okay, and is the I code available? It's, really, um, it's still not available. It's gonna be. Um, 
but uh, th this, by the way, this work is still under, it's under submission to CVPR. You cannot do it. Not, uh, okay. Anyway, so uh, the, we will move to the uh, next uh, speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Niv Nyman. Um, so uh, he will talk about the uh, constrained neural architecture, architecture search. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So let me start. Um, my name is Niv Nyman, and I will present uh, Artcore NAS, Art Constrained Differentiable Neural Architecture Search. Um, this work was done in collaboration with Jonathan Aflalo, Asaf Noy, and Lita Nikmanor. It was published in ICML 21, and it was presented as oral in ICLR NAS Workshop 21. So let's start with a little bit of background uh, about neural architecture search. So the goal is uh, when given a data set and the related task, we want to generate an, act uh, to generate an architecture uh, to do well on this task. But this is a, a hard optimization problem because it consists of a huge categorical space, search space. And within its solution is very expensive to evaluate because it involves training a neural network to convergence. We divide the search space into two categories. One is the micro search, when we use repeated cell structure along the network and we want to configure each of those cells. For example, to, to configure the current size of the convolution layers. The second is a macroscopic search, which deals with the number of layers, the depth of the neural network and the width, the number of channels and the wiring, um, how the, the layers are connected to one another. So here is a little bit of motivation for this specific work. So realistic use of neural networks often requires adhering to multiple constraints on latency and energy memory over different platforms such as CPU, GPU, and mobile devices. So in this work, we aim at searching for the best performing architecture under strict resource constraints such that we want to maximize the accuracy with respect to the architecture structure under some latency constraints. Um, let me uh, cite Go et al from their paper's post. It is challenging to satisfy both the equations simultaneously. Some works augment the loss function with soft loss terms that consider the architecture latency as indeed happened in several uh, leading our papers, while other heuristically add multiplicative terms to the loss. All involve uh, hyperparameters to be tuned. They conclude by it is hard, if not impossible, to guarantee a art constraint. And we do just that. So let's formulate um, this NAS problem as a B-level optimization problem. First, we want to optimize um, the validation loss with respect to the architecture structure governed by alpha and beta under some latency constraints, which is, which is determined by the, the structure of the neural network, alpha and beta. And for each uh, possible alpha and beta, we want to come up with a set of converged weights of the convolution, for example, uh, term W, uh, to do well on the train on the train set. So the latter is called the inner problem, and the former is called the outer problem of the B-level optimization. So let's um, break this down one by one. First, we want to describe the search space of architectures and how we, how we sample from it. So we built this huge super network, um, which is uh, constructed by uh, concatenating MobileNet V2 based uh, inverted bottleneck blocks, such that we have several stages. In each stage, we have the same input resolution for all the blocks in that stage. And we want to uh, configure the depth of each stage, which is governed by the parameters beta. 
Then for each block in every stage, we want to configure the microscopic structure such that we want to uh, find the width, the expansion ratio of the separable convolution and the kernel size of the depthwise convolution and whether or not we have a squeeze and excitation layer or not. So we have a total of 12 configurations for each block in this uh, super network. Then we sample from this uh, continuous search space uh, by using the Gamble softmax tricks uh, in order to keep the whole thing differentiable. And then we extract subnetworks in this way from the big super network. So now let's describe the latency uh, constraints. So what we do is actually we take every block and take every possible configuration and actually deploy it on the target device. Then we measure the latency of each such block and maintain a lookup table with all those latency measurements. Then once we have every individual latency, we want to come up with the formula for the, in, the aggregated latency of the entire subnetwork. So what we do is for each block, we take the expected latency over all the configurations possible of this, for this block. And then imagine beta number two is chosen. Then it means that both block number one and block number two participate in the subnetwork. So we sum over the latencies the expected latencies of, the, of those blocks. We see that both for GPU and CPU, the latency formula is very accurate um, uh, compared to the actual le measured latency of the subnetwork. This is also true when uh, using more advanced deployment mechanisms such as Onyx and OpenVINO. So, now for each possible alpha and beta, we want to find the set of weights that does well, that do well on the, on the train set. For the purpose actually of ranking different architectures from the search space so that we can find the best architecture under some latency budget. But obtaining this W star for each possible uh, subnetwork in the search space is intractable. So many other works are uh, different differentiable methods try to approximate this W star solution by either simultaneously or alternately uh, updating both W and alpha beta. But this uh, as a, a built-in uh, bias towards strengthening networks with fewer parameters as those ten, turn, tend to learn faster and then to be sampled even more frequently. And this happens in a positive loop manner. And several, several remedies were proposed, but those only mitigate the problem and it's not entirely solved. So let's repeat what we try to do. Let's say we have a huge super network and its weights are converged. Then we sample two subnetworks, subnetwork A and B from the super network. And we know that subnetwork A is better than subnetwork B. We want to be able uh, for this to tell us that also network A trained from scratch is better than the same uh, network B trained from scratch. And this means that we can rank architectures well. So we want to be able to train the super network in order to be able to do that. So instead of uh, finding W star for each possible solution in the search space, we want this W star to do uniformly well for all uh, architectures in the search space. So what other methods do is take an entire batch of images and sample a subnetwork from the, from the super network and drive this batch through, through this subnetwork. But this results in high variance of gradients with respect to different subnetworks. It's better to drive every single image through different subnetwork and this lowers the variance significantly. We managed to do that simultaneously within a batch very efficiently and show that this indeed results in very high ranking correlations of subnetworks. And we do that in just a few lines of code very efficiently. So now that we are able to rank architectures well, we can regard this W star as given and deal only with finding the best architectures. Um, so solving the outer problem. So the resulting outer problem is in fact a stochastic optimization problem 
with quadratic constraints. So we want, so the, quadra the quadratic constraint is originated in the latency constraint being quadratic. So we re relax the, prog the problem to be continuous rather than discrete. And we use the Frank Wolf algorithm to solve a continuous a constrained continuous optimization problem, such that in each step, the Frank Wolf algorithm uh, keep us inside the feasible region under the latency constraints. But the problem is that the Frank Wolf algorithm uh, requires the feasible region to be convex, but our constraints are constructed from the latency me uh, measurements, which is not necessarily positive semi-definite. Hence, it is possible for the domain to not be convex and we can step out of this domain uh, through the optimization. So we go around this problem by decoupling the optimization, uh, the, uh, the steps of alpha and beta. Instead of taking a step both on alpha and beta at the same time, we use what we call the block coordinate stochastic frank wolf such that in each step, we either take a single step only on alpha parameters solving a linear program, which is definitely convex, or either on only the beta block of coordinates. And we do that uniformly at random. So let me use a small toy problem to demonstrate the effectiveness of this block coordinates, Frank Wolf, compared to the gradient descent with soft penalties as done in many other methods as I mentioned. So, in this graph, we see on the left y-axis, we see the loss. And on the right axis, we see the penalty, the soft penalty, which we want to be zero. So first of all, we see that the gradient descent requires much tuning of the hyperparameter alpha when the Frank Wolf algorithm does not need any tuning. It also converges slower in this case compared to the Frank Wolf algorithm. Well, the Frank Wolf algorithm strictly satisfies the constraint by definition while the gradient descent algorithm violates the constraint. Finally, on the real uh, objective, we get state-of-the-art accuracy, top one accuracy on ImageNet um, um, and latency compared to other uh, leading NAS methods. This is also true for flops, although our, our models are not uh, explicitly uh, optimized for flops, but only for latency. Another advantage is our search uh, uh, time being um, more affordable, only 400 GPU hours required for the training of the neural network, and then an additional marginal cost of only 15 additional GPU hours are required for uh, every different target device and every different uh, latency requirement. So this is about it. Uh, you can read the takeaways and we have our code um, open sourced in this uh, GitHub page. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, I have a, a question for you. Uh, so for the Frank, for, for the, uh, Frank Wolf uh, algorithm that you use, do you know any advantages of one Frank Wolf also for training uh, regular networks compared to gradient descent? So you show here an advantage for architecture search. The question if what yeah, you have done so, can go beyond. So actually there is one work um, trying to optimize the actual weights, for example, of the convolutions or fully connected networks. Uh, using the Frank Wolf algorithm rather than stochastic gradient descent. Um, and they show some competitive results. Well, but we have to keep in mind that in those weights, uh, uh, optimizing those weights are usually done in an unconstrained manner because we usually do not want to constrain the weights, although we do use some regularization such as weight decay and L L1, L2, etc. So what they try to do in this paper is they were trying instead of using a soft re regularization term to the loss. They try to incorporate this as a, as a art constraint in the Frank Wolf algorithm. And they actually show some com competitive results. Um, but I don't see the big advantage here. Okay. And so 
what what you have shown here so, so what, what, one of the problems as I know in uh, architecture research is that random is really good so if you construct a really good search space and then you sample from it randomly a lot of architecture so eventually the best one will be very close to the one that you find so how large is the gap in your case well I well I could I can say that if you want to um First of all, you have to generate many architectures and then to um, uh, eliminate those with latency um, that are not, uh, comp that do not uh, uh, satisfy the latency constraint, right? So then you remain only with a sub, 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 um, subset of the networks that you, that you randomly sampled. And then you have to see if you can do much better than this. In my experiment, our algorithm works much better than run search. Um, uh, specifically in, in, in the constraints, uh, in the constraint optimization, when you want to constrain your network to, to be under some latency budget or parameters uh, or number of parameters or, or energy or stuff like that. So in my case, it, it, it does much better than random search when, when you have to generate many more random samples. Um, yeah, I think we are past that by now. Okay. So uh, I think the, this session, and now we will uh, go to a lunch break uh, till uh, two o'clock, and uh, at two o'clock we will uh, return to our uh, third uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. And in this work, we uh, suggested a new way uh, to derive an uh, algorithm called contrastive divergence, which is an algorithm which is used to train energy-based models. Um, so I'll start by a short introduction to what energy-based models are. So in general, we can look at the very basic task uh, in unsupervised learning, which is trying to fit a distribution to a set of samples in a given data set. So as you know, there are, there are a lot of ways to solve this problem. Uh, in general, we can divide uh, the methods into two groups, implicit and implicit methods. So in the implicit methods, we usually try to generate samples from the distribution without actually learning the distribution itself. Um, as for example, in GANs and VAEs and diffusion models and a few more. Uh, on, on the other hand, in explicit methods, uh, we try to learn explicitly the distribution P of X. Uh, this is slightly harder a task, but it has its own benefits. Uh, so over here, we can find autoregressive methods, invertible normalizing flow, score-based methods, and also energy-based models, which is what I'm going to talk about now. So what we would like to do, we would like to take some parametric distribution and adjust the parameters of the distribution such that the distribution uh, would fit as good as possible to the samples in the data sets. And specifically, in energy-based model, what we would like to do is we would like to model not the distribution itself, but the minus log of the distribution uh, up to some constant. So basically, the distribution would be e to the power of minus some parametric uh, function e, uh, which is usually uh, referred to as the energy function, divided by some normalizing constant. And the problem is that this normalizing constant is usually intractable because cal calculating it uh, requires integrating over the entire space of X. So what we need to actually do is find a way to train these energy functions without actually calculating uh, the normalizing constant. And apparently we can do so by using the good old maximum likelihood estimation uh, so it turns out that if we try to minimize the negative log likelihood with gradient descent, uh, we can write the gradient step in the following way. So basically, this is uh, the regular gradient descent update 
uh, algorithm where the gradient is equal to uh, minus the expectation of the difference between uh, the gradient of the energy evaluated at two places. So in green, we have samples taken from our current model. And in blue, we have samples from the data set. Uh, so basically what the algorithm tries to do in each step is it tries to maximize E over the samples from the model and minimize it over the samples from the data sets. Uh, and let me just remind you that this uh, energy function is equal to minus the log of the probability, which means that lower energy is higher probability. So uh, what it's trying to do is really intuitive. It, it tries to increase the probability of the samples from the data set and reduce it everywhere else, explicitly on the green points, which are taken from the model. And the big question is, how do we uh, generate these samples from the model? So uh, the most straightforward forward approach is to use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, and by using Markov chain Monte Carlo, we can start from any random initialization and take a series of steps. And if done correctly, we are guaranteed that after a sufficient number of steps, we would start producing samples from the model. Uh, so this could work in theory, but there's a big problem here. And uh, that is that it usually requires quite a lot of steps until we reach the distribution of the model. Uh, and this is impractical because we need to do it for every gradient step we want to take. And this takes quite a lot of time. Uh, so there are a few ways to solve this problem. And the most famous one is to use contrastive divergence. So contrastive divergence replaces this long Markov chains with relatively short ones, which are initialized from samples from the data set. So we have uh, short MCMC chains, chains which don't actually uh, samples, sa generate samples from the data set, but generate samples which are slightly closer to the distribution of the model than the samples that we initialized it with, uh, which are taken from the data set. So basically, we'd like to take these new samples and use the exact same update rule as before, but instead of maximizing the energy over the samples from the data set, we would maximize the energy over the samples that we have just produced. And there's a big question uh, whether this is mathematically correct. So empirically, this algorithm has been put to use for a large range of applications in the past, uh, producing relatively good results, uh, mostly in the past. Um, and uh, there still remain the question, is this mathematically correct? Will this algorithm actually make the model converge to the model of the, uh, of the samples in the data set? So in order to answer that question, let's look at the original derivation of contrastive divergence. So uh, contrastive divergence was proposed by Hinton in a paper from 2002, where he suggested to take the following loss function, and I won't go too much into detail, but in general, the loss function is composed of two kullback leibler terms, one between the distribution of the data and the distribution of the model, and the other between the distribution of the contrastive samples and the model. Um, and the details are not important here, but uh, the main idea is if we take this loss and try to minimize it using gradient descent, we get the following update rule. So basically, uh, this is almost what we saw before. We have the expectation over the two energy, the orange one and the blue ones. But we also have a third term, uh, which turns out to be, uh, to be in, uh, intractable. And what Hinton suggested in, in his original paper is to simply ignore this term. I did this without any justification, apart from the fact that even when ignoring this term, this algorithm still produces a relatively good result. Um, and there's a big question whether this is correct mathematically or not. And apparently over the last two decades, there were a lot of attempts to try and answer these questions, ranging from papers which show that uh, in really simple toy models, this term could actually be neglected, uh, all the way to paper who try to approximate this term and uh, claim to produce better result when adding an approximation of this third term. Uh, and this is still an open question. And what we suggest to do is uh, to take a completely different approach. We uh, disregard the loss that we saw before, and we show that the exact same update step can be derived in a completely different manner without any uh, approximation uh, or any assumption on 
uh, the model itself. So what is this alternative derivation? Um, so let's for simplicity look at a single chain. So a single chain is uh, composed of a starting point, which is taken from the data set and a small number of steps, in this case, five steps, uh, um, which, uh, uh, which generate samples, which become more and more closer to the distribution of our model. And what we suggest to do is to take this chain and with a probability of 50%, flip its order. So we can get either the original chain or a chain in a reversed order, but the first point is the last point from before. Um, so uh, what we would like to do with this model is to then take a classifier and train it to identify which is the correct order of the chain. So our setup is as following. We have a chain with an unknown direction, which we would like to feed into a discriminator, which should output the probability of each of the directions. And the key point here is that we want to make calculate this probability of each direction based on our probability model, which is the energy based model. Um, so actually doing so, calculating this probability is uh, pretty straightforward once we have the model. Uh, so the model actually gives us the probability of the starting point and the probability of the full chain is the probability of the first point multiplied by all the transitions. And the probability of this transition is known because this is given to us by the Monte Carlo Markov chain. Um, so we can calculate all transitions and we use the model to only calculate the first and the end point, which are required to calculate the, the complete uh, probability of each of the directions. So once we have these probabilities of the two chains, we can, uh, we can then uh, optimize our discriminator, our discriminator um, using the regular binary cross entropy loss. So if we apply gradient descent to, to the binary cross entropy loss on this setup, we get the following update tool, which is again really similar to what we saw before with the um, expectation over the green energy, the orange energy and the blue energy. But we also have a an additional multiplicative constant, which we denoted by alpha, uh, which does not depend on the parameter. This is actually a number which could be calculated for each chain. So we can assign a unique number for each chain. Um, and uh, it turns out that this half alpha has uh, some nice properties. And the most important one is that it actually measures how, how much the Markov chains that we use deviate from obeying detailed balance, which is uh, what this, these Markov chains are usually uh, designed to do. So uh, a perfect uh, MCMC would actually obey perfectly the detailed balance criteria uh, and if it deviates from that, this alpha term is supposed to correct for that. Um, but it also turns out that if we do have MCMC, which uh, exactly obey the detailed balance criteria, this alpha term is exactly equal to half. And in this case, we can out take it out of the expectation and in fact, actually ignore it. And we get the exact same update rule uh, if we saw in contrastive divergence. Uh, so this is a complete different way to derive the exact same update tool that we saw in the original contrastive divergence, but we didn't make any approximation. Uh, and we even got a correction for the cases where the Markov chains are not, uh, do not actually obey the little balance criteria uh, accurately. Um, and this is also interesting because it sheds a different light on the way this algorithm works. And it answers some questions that were open regarding to the properties of the algorithm. So uh, it turns out that this algorithm doesn't actually uh, try to minimize a fixed loss as has, uh, this is something that has been shown before in other papers, but in fact, it plays an adversarial game where the loss gets updated as the model gets better and better. So what actually happens is that we have the MCMC process, which acts as a, a generator, and it can peek in each state into the discriminator and see the model it uses, and uses that knowledge in order to produce a chain, uh, which has a high chance of confusing the discriminator. This chain is then uh, fed into the discriminator, which tries to predict the correct order of the chain. Um, 
So basically, we hope that this uh, alternative derivation would shed new light on the algorithm and maybe uh, motivate some new advances in how to improve this algorithm. Some uh, ideas of improving this algorithm based on these ideas are some of the stuff we're currently working on. Um, and that's it for now. And I hope you enjoyed and I'll, I'm happy to take any question. Thank you very much for an excellent talk and a really interesting uh, theoretical um, uh, results. Um, I, am, I remind everyone to post your um, questions on the chat. Okay, so maybe I will um, ask a question. So um, your model uh, was very general. And um, so I was wondering how that would be extended um, to uh, multiple parametric uh, mixture, to a mixture of models instead of a single model. Uh, a model of what? The model is the model. Uh, your of model. I mean, if it was a mixture of probability um, distributions. Like, like in Gaussian mixture models or a bunch of models. So basically, um, uh, it's, it, the setup is very general. So um, you can have uh, a few models and a weighting term that weights all of them together. Um, and mainly in this setup, uh, you're not required to have a normalized uh, distribution function. So uh, you, you won't get uh, uh, a weighting function that sum up, sums up to one, which mix the mo many models together, uh, but it would be correct up to some constant. And it, it doesn't matter if it's, I, I don't believe that it would matter if it's a mixture or if it's a single model, uh, as long as we have some parametric function that tries to describe distribution of the points. Okay, thank you. Um, thank are, you very much. are there more questions from the audience? Okay, so uh, there is the question, how does it compare with the state of the art? Um, um. Okay, so um, contrastive divergence is a really old algorithm. It, it's been here for uh, two decades. It, been, it has been used uh, to train with rest, um, restricted Boltzmann machines. Uh, very, uh, it was the go-to model for training them, um, but it suffers from a lot of problems uh, which occurred when trying to learn a, uh, the distribution of data that sits around a very small, a low dimensional manifold, like in the case of images. Um, so, so we didn't fix anything in the algorithm. We just uh, showed a different way uh, to derive it. Uh, but there are a lot of advances in this field that try to improve the algorithm. And um, some of the we're currently working on some uh, uh, on some extensions of the algorithm that could deal with uh, distributions like that. Where the data sits really close to a manifold, a low dimensional manifold in a high dimensional space. Um, so uh, there's still work to do to get this algorithm uh, be good as current state of the art solution. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. so uh, maybe we should move to the next speaker. Thank you, Omer. Um, thank you. So the next speaker is Yoni Kastan um, of Tel Aviv University. It's work with Amit Vermano. Um, oh, so you need to share your screen. Um, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Weizmann Institute, yes. Um, so please share your screen. Okay. Okay, so uh, my name is uh, Yoni, and I will be presenting our work, Large Neural Atlases for Consistent Video Editing. This work was done together with the Level 3, Oliver Wang, and Tali Dekel. In this work, we address the problem of how to easily and intuitively edit everyday videos in a consistent manner. 
For example, we can take this video of a child biking and artistically stylize the background in a consistent manner. Or, for example, map textures onto objects like this flower on the dress or coloring this bench. Note that shadows are correctly preserved on the edit. While editing a single frame in this video is feasible, for example, using Photoshop, editing the entire video in a consistent manner is far more challenging. Using our method, the user edits only a single image and the edits are automatically propagated to the entire video. Our key, our key idea is to decompose the video into a set of layered 2D atlases. Each atlas can be thought of as a 2D image. One atlas represents the entire background and another represents the foreground object. Each pixel location in the video is mapped onto the set of atlases which provide a unified representation of the video in a 2D domain. This allows us to perform video editing by directly editing the atlases and then mapping them back onto the original video in a consistent manner. Our work is inspired by Unwrap Mosaics by Ravaha et al, which decomposes the video into a set of 2D mosaics and computes a mapping from each mosaic to each video frame. Editing is then applied directly on the mosaics and mapped back to the video. We share the same editing goal, but our method differs in a few key ways. Unwrap mosaics takes as input binary segmentation masks, which are assumed to be accurate. They don't refine the masks and cannot model complex scene effects such as shadows, whereas our method solves for a layered decomposition of the scene and only uses rough segmentation masks as input. Also, instead of relying on long range point tracking, we use pairwise optical flow as a soft constraint. Lastly, while Unwrap Mosaics use discrete atlas set with predetermined resolution, we use continuous atlas sets represented by coordinate-based MLPs, which make our method more robust to different scene types. Our approach is also inspired by Omnimat, a, re a recent deep learning-based video decomposition method. Omnimat breaks each video frame into RGBA layers but it provides only a per frame representation of the video and there is no direct way to propagate information across time. In contrast, our atlases provide a unified representation which allows easy and intuitive editing across, editing across time. In more details, given a video, each pixel location, x, y, t, is first mapped to 2D coordinates UV in the atlas space of foreground and background atlases that specify where this video position is mapped to. These 2D coordinates are then fed into the atlas network, which returns the RGB colors of these UV locations. In this visualization, we show a discretized version of these 2D continuous atlases that are represented by the atlas network. Each video position is also fed into an alpha MLP that produces a foreground opacity value. This allows us to reconstruct the color of this position P by just using alpha blending. Mapping atlas sets and alphas are all represented by coordinate-based MLPs, which allows for the system to be trained end-to-end -end with a simple L2 reconstruction loss together with other regularization losses. Our entire framework is trained in a self-supervised manner using the following losses. Our main driving loss is the reconstruction loss, a squared L2 loss between the original video colors and the reconstructed ones encourages our uh, model to be a valid decomposition of the original video. But the reconstruction loss by itself is not enough for obtaining interpretable atlases that can be intuitively edited. For that, we introduce the rigidity loss, which encourages smooth deformations in the mapping network that preserve structures in the original video frames. The rigidity loss encourages the Jacobian matrix of each mapping network at each location to be a rotation matrix, such that orthogonal vectors with length one in each frame will keep their length and orthogonality in the atlas. 
In the absence of this loss, the mapping result, results in distorted atlases and intuitive editing is not possible. Ideally, we would like each point in the atlas to represent the physical point in the world. In order to encourage that with no 3D information, we apply an optical flow loss that encourages each pair of corresponding points to be mapped to the same UV coordinates in the atlas and to have the same alpha value. Without the optical flow loss, we're still able to obtain a panorama of the background and intuitive atlases for editing. But we can see some distortions in the atlases. In this example, both atlases have artifacts and the larger plant is duplicated and split in the atlas. Finally, we use a sparsity loss to prevent duplications in the atlas by encouraging non-used foreground atlas colors to be black. Here's an example of duplications, which happen when we don't apply this loss. In this case, the foreground atlas contains two instances of the same foreground object, before and after an occlusion. Since there is no optical flow behind the occlusion, the optical flow loss by itself cannot prevent this duplication. Editing such an atlas would be difficult, as the same edit would have to be applied to both duplicated objects. Training our model with this complete set of losses allows us to obtain a decomposition that can be used for intuitive editing of the entire video. As input to our model, we require the original video, as well as per frame course masks that identify what regions should belong to each layer. This part can be automatically computed, for example, with mask RCNN or user provided. We apply a binary cross entropy loss between our pair frame alpha outputs and the supplied mask of the frame. Then after this bootstrapping phase, we turn this loss off and the alpha network is allowed to correct inaccuracies in the input mask and also model secondary effects such as shadows and reflections. And so the input masks do not have to be particularly accurate. In this case, mask RCNN did not find the foreground objects, so we supply very coarse user masks. It can be seen that the network refines the masks and also adds secondary effects like the moving clouds to the foreground layer. Here we show some example decomposition visualizations. In each case, we show the input video followed by the learned atlases a visualization of the mapping and opacity and the reconstructed video. In this case, the car is rotated in 3D by 90 degrees, and you can see that our model unwraps the car into a panoramic representation. Notice that the shadows are decomposed correctly. In this case, the foreground object is occluded repeatedly, and the optical flow gives only a weak signal for tracking the dog. Still, we see that the network decomposes the video into layers correctly and tracks the dog successfully. For showing the importance of having continuous atlases, as ablation, we replace our atlases with fixed size learnable grids. Overall, we noticed better decomposition with our neural atlases compared to the grid atlases. In this example, we can see that the grid atlases fail to decompose the foreground and background of the video and that the dog is not tracked at all. Now that we have our layered atlases in hand, all we need to do to edit a video is to apply simple edits in the atlas space. In this case, we apply a style transfer on the foreground object and its reflection. It is also possible to directly draw on the input atlas or frame. In this case, we draw a semi-transparent purple line together with some stars on the background layer. Then in the edited video, the stars are floating on the waves. We can change the background scene by replacing the atlas with another image entirely. In this case, we replace the background atlas with an Arctic image.
Using our decomposition, it is possible in some cases to remove the foreground object by setting alpha to be zero and reconstructing the video. And here is another example. Our model has several limitations. Our model has a limited capacity and cannot work accurately on more than 100 frames, so we're able to handle only short videos. Our atlases are fixed in time, so we can handle some temporal effects, but complicated reflections like on the card's window cannot be handled correctly. Self-occlusions with one foreground layer cannot be handled well, as we will see in the next slide. In the paper, we suggest a way to split one foreground layer to more layers using simple user inputs. Here we show an example of a failure case of our method. In this video, the foreground character undergoes rapid motion, larger formations, and self-occlusions, and the resulting atlas is incomplete. For example, it is missing the legs of the man. In these missing regions, we have no usable mapping, and so we cannot place edits there. Instead, the network tries to incorrectly render the limbs using the alpha channel. When we edit the background using the atlas shown at the bottom right, the edits track well with the motion of the camera, but the occlusions are incorrect in these missing regions. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much. Very impressive results. Um, I encourage everybody to post the questions on the chat. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, will it work if the background is not static? Um, up to some level. I mean, if, if there is a... a emotion in the background that um, has a parallax, large parallax with the background, it is better to model this uh, emotion with a separate uh, foreground layer. We can support multiple foreground layers. So in this case, we'll have better results if we model it as another uh, foreground layer. Otherwise you will have some uh, uh, artifacts when you try to apply the rigidity loss on something that is not rigid which is the foreground with respect to the background behind it. Thanks. Uh, can you explain why there is a limit of 100 frames? Um, we think that it is uh, the capacity of the network that we worked with. Uh, we have a, a specific architecture that we worked with, and we believe that with more uh, parameters, it will uh, we will be able to model a uh, more frames, but we didn't test it. So it is remain at the future work, but I think that it's possible. And there is another question that um, asks whether you can provide some more details on the MLP models. Yes, so, so we use, use coordinate-based uh, coordinate MLPs. So each mapping network is a coordinate-based MLP and also the atlases and the alpha network. Um, similar to NERF style um, that um, is very famous uh, recently. Um, and we apply positional encoding on the alpha network and the Atlas networks and not on the mapping networks because we saw that this gives some implicit regularization to uh, prevent high frequencies in the mapping network. So it gave us better results. Uh, but uh, we have much more detail in the paper, so I guess uh, possible to read it over there. Yeah, of course. Um, so there are two questions, one related to the training time of the model and one to the inference time of the single video. Okay, so training time is pretty long. It takes about uh, 10 hours for now. I guess that it can be accelerated with the recent uh, development uh, of uh, accelerations for NERF. Inference time, including editing, takes about seven minutes. So it's, it is much uh, shorter. Um, that's it, I think. Thank you very much. So that was work uh, presented by Yoni of the Weizmann Institute with the group of uh, Tali Dekel. And now we should move on to our next speaker, Ben Maman of Tel Aviv University. I work with Amit Burnell. Um, so Ben, you can share the screen and start. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ben Maman. Uh, I'm a PhD student under the instruction of Amit Bermano. I'll uh, present our work on self-refinement and unaligned supervision. This is a general approach for domain adaptation in sequential domains, and I'll show its application to two real-life problems. Uh, the first is uh, flat surface uh, typing, and the second is automatic music transcription. So uh, we all know the um, central challenge for uh, deep neural networks is that they require massive amounts of uh, annotated uh, data. And to do this manually is very expensive. Sometimes it's also even uh, impossible. And if we're dealing with audio and the uh, video sequence, the problem is, is even worse. So we need ways of unsupervised or at least uh, uh, weekly supervised learning. So what we propose is to use unaligned supervision and what is unaligned supervision? It's when we know the content of the sequence, but we don't know exactly the precise timing of individual events. Uh, and this kind of uh, this kind of supervision is very uh, easy to obtain. So, uh, for example, uh, for example. Um, uh, classical music performances follow a uh, strictly follow a musical score, and uh, this score can be regarded as a, a weak label or unaligned label to for any performance of of uh, this uh, uh, musical piece. So, using our approach, we can take just existing uh, uh, recordings and with their corresponding sheet notes and uh, and train uh, models. For example, we can. A train a, a transcriber, which uh, transcriber is a model that can uh, detect note events in an audio recording. So I'll just play an example of a, a transcription performed by our system. So this is the original audio. And this is our transcription. It's a MIDI file. We render it and also visualize it. We detect both notes and instruments. So this is the example, uh, example of the uh, music transcription. So now let's talk about uh, a brief, uh, uh, we'll talk briefly about self-refinement in, in general. So the question is, can a network uh, generate annotation for itself to further improve itself? So if we just take raw predictions of a network uh, and, and use them as labels, we will probably not gain very much, maybe maybe a little bit of, uh, of improvement. But uh, the idea is that if we have uh, some structure or prior on the domain, we can get very accurate predictions, even with a, a weak detector. And we can then use these predictions as labels to uh, retrain uh, the model and improvement. And we can also do this iteratively uh, relabel and retrain. This is called uh, expectation maximization (EM), and it can solve all kinds of problems. For example, um, learning the uh, word-level transcription based on paired uh, paired word-level uh, transcription between languages, based on uh, um, paired uh, sentences, or also pose estimation by applying RANSAC on multiple views of the uh, same post. And uh, the type of problems that we'll talk about today, the knowledge that we have is the, the content of the sequence. So, for example, I already spoke about the music transcription, but also for speech recognition, um, the movie subtitles can be regarded as a weak or unaligned label for uh, for speech recognition because they give us the content with uh, approximate timing. So. The general framework that we work with uh, in, in, in this work is to train 
some initial train an initial weak detector on some initial data and how to get this data this depends on the specific specific uh, problem and typically usually this uh, the, this data will have a domain that's slightly different than the real uh, target domain it will be similar but but uh, still different and and then for a new unannotated data where we only have the unaligned supervision uh, we align it with the probabilities predicted by the network and we get this way um, for, uh, full labels which we can retrain the network on so this is a general uh, framework and how to implement it it depends on on the problem so now I'll talk about the first problem uh, this is uh, defense of the stage typing or this called typenet i presented it recently in uh, wakabi so uh, in this work, we uh, developed a system that allows touch typing on any uh, flat surface, and it requires only a uh, only a simple camera. And we rely on standard touch typing, which is pressed by a certain finger, and uh, has a, a distinct hand configuration that's associated with it. The system learns to detect these hand configurations, so it's not a constraint to specific key locations. The user can change a location of uh, the hands. It also allows interaction with multiple users because the hand configurations that system detects are, are common uh, across users. Uh, most previous works are before deep neural networks. They require additional uh, equipment. So one of the novelties of our method is the requirement of only a, a simple camera. Now, uh, the data we need to annotate for this task is a uh, surface typing. Uh, obviously, there's no direct way to, to annotate this automatically. So for this, we use the self-refinement approach. And the weak detector, we train the weak detector on keyboard data where we can get the uh, annotation automatically using the keyboard press and release event. And uh, this is only a weak detector because there are style differences between keyboard typing and surface typing. But we as, as I described, we can use this weak detector to annotate uh, surface typing. We record users typing on surfaces text that we provide. Uh, so we have indeed the unaligned supervision because we know the text and that we compute alignment and can retrain. Uh, there's also handling of the uh, typos uh, discrepancies uh, by discarding uh, singular points of the alignment. We do something similar in uh, transcription. I'll get to it uh, soon. So uh, our mean accuracy over the 10 users we evaluated on is 93.5. These are familiar users. And for a new user, accuracy is 85.7. Now, in our data set, we have 26 users. So it's uh, still pretty promising, given the small amount of users. And we can also see the significant uh, improvement the self-refinement uh, gives in the bottom right uh, table. OK, so now we'll talk about uh, music transcription. So what is transcription? Our input is an audio signal spectrogram, and our uh, output is a list of uh, note events, say, usually represented as a MIDI, and it can contain either only uh, notes, or we can also can contain, uh, we can detect uh, note and instrument. So let's see a few examples. So uh, this is the original recording. And this is our transcription. We detect both note and instrument. And we can also do uh, pop music. This is the transcription. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I'll, I'll just note here that uh, uh, for currently for pop music, we, we detect the uh, note, and for classical music, we can also detect uh, the instrument. Now, the main components uh, we detect in, in the music transcription are onsets and frames. So what are onsets? Onsets are the beginnings of note, the moment when the note begins. And this is the, the important part of, of the note. Uh, perceptually, it's the more important part. And the frames is the note activation or note presence and determines the duration uh, of the note. And it's a, a complement uh, to the onset. Now, uh, what's the existing data? So specifically for piano transcription, we have a uh, wonderful machine that can uh, uh, annotate real performances, uh, very accurate. But there's no uh, 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 equivalent for other instruments. We have very small uh, guitar data set. was done semi-automatically. And, and for other instruments, we don't really have uh, something that's really uh, supervised. But what we do have is the, uh, the unaligned supervision. So in the case of music transcription, we perform the alignment between the onset information of the MIDI and the predicted onset heat map as the initial network. And uh, I'll, I'll describe the initial network in a moment. And we um, there's also handling. The alignment cannot always be perfect. There are discrepancies, there are nuances in, in performance. So uh, there, there's handling of, of uh, this sort of discrepancies uh, by discarding the singular points of the alignment. And there are a few more uh, details in this. Um, and the initial network we query on a synthetic data. There's also a component uh, of uh, um, the tonal structure. So uh, we can use uh, apply uh, uh, pitch shift augmentation or pitch shift uh, consistency depends how how uh, you look at it. Um, I'll, um, I'll show uh, results for piano transcription, but we, we also have results for, for other instruments. But for piano transcription, we, we have uh, large and very reliable uh, benchmarks and uh, maestro and, and maps. Uh, and maps is only used for testing. Usually systems are trained on maestro and tested on uh, maestro and uh, maps. And we can see supervised methods uh, get very high accuracy uh, on both data sets, but still we can see that the, the performance drops in the cross evaluation data set when you train on maestro and evaluate on, on uh, maps. Now, uh, the synth model here uh, is the initial uh, weak detector that we train on the synthetic data, and we can see it, it gets uh, achieves uh, reasonable accuracy. Now, um, next to rows, if we uh, further train this model on a data set called MusicNet that was annotated by aligning spectral features, uh, we can see that the accuracy actually drops. So we're better off only with the uh, synthetic data. But, and this is a very important uh, result of our work, if we train this model on the exact same music net recordings, but with our generated annotation, we can we then uh, get almost a 90% uh, note level accuracy on Maestro. And note, note level accuracy means the onset uh, detection. And on the MAPS data set, we get 87.3. And this is already better than supervised methods, which is uh, very good. And uh, for frame level, accuracy is uh, still lower, but we can see that on MAPS data set, it's already close to supervised level. And another important point here is that we can also uh, get similar results with um, data that we collect on our own download from uh, wherever on the internet. And we can uh, get similar results. So it's very easy to collect the uh, data for uh, this uh, our approach. I'll just show a few more uh, examples if we have time. Um, so there's, actually, there's a single network that uh, uh, transcribes, uh, does all of these uh, pieces and can detect both uh, note and instrument. So it can do multiple instruments uh, simultaneously, like here. This was the original and the transcript. This is the transcription. So 
it can handle, for example, a harpsichord and string instruments uh, simultaneously. Um, just uh, a little bit of uh, comparison. So this is a recent, I'll, I'll play a uh, transcription of ours, and then I'll play a transcription of the same piece by recent uh, Google work. <laughs> Ours and uh, this is the uh, Google work. Um, there are okay. We, we have uh, some more examples. Um, I think uh, this is uh, enough. If there are any questions? I'll be glad to answer. Thank you, Ben, for the very interesting talk. We are a little bit behind in time, so we have uh, time for a single question. So I encourage the audience to post on chat. Okay, so um, so I, I, will, I will remind the discussion to later on so you can still answer questions that will um, come in uh, via chat. And um, I would uh, welcome our next speaker, Dvir, Dvir Ginsburg of uh, Tel Aviv University. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Um, Dvir, you can share your screen. It's work uh, from Tel Aviv University with Dan Ravi. Uh, I'm Dylan Ginsburg, uh, and I'll be presenting Deep Confidence Guided Distance for 3D Partial Shape Registration published in this year, Chip AI, and the work was done by Dan Raviv and myself. Partial to partial, partial 3D rigid alignment is a ubiquitous task in computer vision, where the task is to align multiple objects or scenes, given that we know the underlying, rotation, uh, underlying transformation is rigid, meaning that we need to find the rotation and translation parameters that aligning the objects. We see rigid alignments in multi-view geometry, where I want us to imagine multiple cars enter a junction, each with only a slight over overlap with the other cars, and yet we wish to somehow create a unified scene of all cars, or in medical imaging, where we have multiple modalities of the same object and we wish to align them together, and of course, in robotics and SLAM algorithms. Unfortunately, alignment is hard. And alignment using external sensors like LiDAR, radar, and depth cameras within our phones is even harder. Well, the first two problems are, of course, noise and outlier. Another big caveat is partiality. As multiple sensors see the objects from different angles, not all points appear both in the source and target. And because to create rigid alignments, we need good dense correspondences we need to find which points appear both in the source and in the target. In our scenarios, we have an overlap of less than 30%. And this is why finding those overlapping points is a crucial task. Lastly, we have the problem of acute rotations. And by acute rotations, we mean that the underlying uh, transformation is larger than 90 degrees. Because the external sensors using, use Euclidean coordinates as the input features, when we have internal symmetries or co-occurring segments like arms and legs of humans, sometimes when the rotation is large, actually the input features of a right arm is closer to the left arm than the true corresponding part, which results in latent descriptors that are also more similar to the corresponding part. And thus, sometimes the uh, algorithms also suggest a rotation and a transformation that is the opposite by 180 degrees. And here we see an example of TCP, a state-of-the-art method published two years ago, where the input rotations are severe and the mistakenly answer of a rotation that is the opposite by 180 degrees. For that, we present deep confidence guided distance a neural network-based method for partial uh, uh, 3D uh, alignment that adheres the problem of large rotations, outliers, and noise. 
Deep confidence guided distance is based on four main columns. First, we generate a per point confidence metric, a latent metric telling us how much, e uh, uh, what is the confidence of each point to be appeared both in the source and in the target. Next, we use dense shape correspondence maps. As we understand, the rigid alignment is all, only a proxy to the underlying task, which is finding good dense correspondences. We find or generate the dense maps directly. Next, we use robust optimization techniques. As we understand, the amount of noise and outliers is extremely high in our scenarios. We will propose multiple hypothesis groups and choose the best transformation. And lastly, we will use rotation invariant features instead of the input Euclidean coordinates. And rotation invariant features is a known subject within the point cloud community. Rotation invariant features are used for classification and segmentation tasks, but until today, no one has used it for solving the rigid alignment. And the reason is that while rotation invariant features solve some of the problems we mentioned earlier, the rotation invariant transformation that uses only angles and distances within local neighborhoods of the point clouds actually acts as a low pass filters, mitigate high frequency knowledge and loses critical information. So on the one hand, we mitigated some of the problems we mentioned earlier, but on the other hand, we increased the outliers and noise and we need to face them in another manner. Then the next stage is of course the Fisher extraction network. But let me declutter this mess and zoom in on, on the upper part as we use a CMEs-like architecture with shared weights between the source and target objects, where we use a network that is based on a, a point net plus plus, which is a unit-like structure for point cloud, where we first in a, a subsample points for sparse representation and then interpolate back to have a pair point feature descriptor. The next stage is to create a pointwise similarity map. Our similarity matrix notated by P is the so a cosine similarity between each uh, point in the source and each point in the target. After we generated the length and descriptor for each point in the source and each point in the target, P is actually the soft alignment mapping. And one of the most important insights we had during research is that source points that actually appeared also in the target had some signal, had some high value cosine similarities within that matrix, within their row, while points that did not appear in the target did not have any indicator, any high cosine value within their row. And from that, we defined the confidence metric. And the confidence metric is the maximum likelihood value within each row normalized by all the other maximum likelihood values to generate a normalized distribution function. So let's pause for a second and understand what we have until now. We are using rotation invariant features to mitigate the problem of large rotation. But on the other hand, rotation invariant features are not optimal and added noise and outliers to the system. And we have C, which is a learned unsupervised signal for true correspondences. And the question is now, how do we use that C to find the best, the best rigid alignment? And for that, we use robust optimization. Similar to RANSAC, a known robust optimization method, we will subsample many hypothesis groups, extract the dense correspondences from our soft alignment map for each dense alignment, compute the rigid alignment from that dense map and choose the best transformation. And how will we choose the best transformation? We will use chamfer distance, where chamfer distance is a known method to evaluate how much two point clouds overlap. So we will take the source point cloud, apply the rigid alignment by each of the hypothesis groups in parallel, of course, and choose the transformation that is optimal using the chamfer distance metric. Unfortunately, the method I described now does not work for partial alignment. And the reason it does not work for partial alignment is because we subsample many hypothesis groups, 
some of the hypothesis groups does not even appear in the target shape because of the partiality. And because chamfer distance is optimal in the least square sense, some of the hypotheses may fit in a not natural way, as we see in the example here. And for that, we present an extension we call a deep confidence guided distance metric that fuses not only the spatial proximity between points, but also the latent similarity. And now some of you might ask, okay, but you used rotation invariant features and you presented a new uh, dense correspondence uh, map and you used a neural network to create latent features. Why don't you use randomly sampled hypothesis groups similarly to RANSAC instead of your confidence-based sampling? And in this graph, we present how RANSAC-like methods need 42,000 experiments groups per rigid alignment computation because of the high number of outliers and noise, while our method needs only a fraction of that to reach the same state-of-the-art results. And using 42,000 experiments groups per rigid alignment computation is simply not practical, not in terms of runtime performance or memory consumption. As to the training objective, I will not go deeply into the loss function because of the time limitations, but I will say this. We understand that the rotation and translation parameters are only a proxy to the underlying test, which is finding good dense correspondences. And because of that, unlike previous methods that optimize the rotation and translation parameters, we optimize the dense correspondence instead. And for that, we present the repulsion loss that compels faraway points to have different latent embeddings. While for the final stage where we have pair point features, we compel near points to have close latent embeddings. As to the result part, we present results of all, all known uh, state-of-the-art methods in the domain, and of course ours. And as for the partiality test, we present results where the, where the overlap of the partial shapes is less than 30%. On the ModelNet 40 dataset that comprised more than 12,000 auto-generated models, we present state-of-the-art results. But a more interesting task is to find the rotation invariance of the previous methods, where we show how all methods act relatively decent when the rotation input is relatively low, less than 60 degrees, but as we increase the input rotation, we see how previous methods become irrelevant as to they are not rotation invariants. For the Faust scales dataset, which is a dataset generated by real world sensors with internal partiality and sparsity, we again show better results than previous methods. Well, as we indicated earlier, as we increase the input rotation group, uh, uh, other methods generate not suitable results. To summarize, we presented a method for rigid alignment where we use rotation invariant features instead of the Euclidean coordinates to mitigate the problem of, of acute rotations with internal symmetries. We use a confidence-based sampling technique instead of sampling the hypothesis groups randomly as we have a lot of outliers and noise. We optimize the underlying task instead of the rigid alignment parameters. And we factor the confidence in the evaluation metric itself to adhere partial correspondences. We had to form set of the art methods. We published our code and paper. I welcome you to ask questions here or to reach out privately. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dvir. Very interesting talk, very interesting work. I uh, encourage people to post uh, questions um, via chat. Uh, so um, there is, uh, I can see a few questions here. Um, uh, to what other sequential data can you extend your, ah, no, sorry, this is not to you. So maybe I should start with uh, um, a question. Um, so can you tell anything about the training time and inference runtime? Yes, yes. So actually that, that's a fantastic question because one of the caveats of using 
of optimizing the rigid alignment parameters, meaning optimizing the rotation and translation parameters, is that when you optimize the rotation and translation parameters, the gradient propagation is actually uh, much worse than optimizing the dense correspondences themselves. And this is why our training time takes less than a couple of hours, less than two hours in the modern at 40 a, a data set. Well, when, you, when we trained and evaluated previous methods, we saw that the training time might take even more than a couple of days. So when we need to propagate the gradients backwards from the a, a singular value decomposition needed for the rotation and recession parameters, because of the a, a convergence a, a properties of the singular value decomposition, decomposition the learning test becomes much more uh, uh, complex. And this is why optimizing the dense correspondences not only helps in the results part, but also in the convergence part. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so I, um, did you try this method for non-rigid alignment or how would you generalize this method uh, yeah, to so non-rigid problems? Thank you very much for the question. As my main research or focus is a, a non-rigid alignment and we research uh, dense correspondences. And indeed, we base this work on our networks for non-rigid alignment. I will say that using robust optimization techniques for non-rigid alignment is a complex task as to generate multiple hypothesis groups for dense mappings is something that is, is less discussed and less researched. And one of the directions is actually using rigid alignments and propagating dense correspondences to generate multiple hypothesis groups. But to extend a, a robust optimization to non-rigid alignment is actually an interesting topic we, we currently research. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, um, very interesting work. How does it behave when the point density becomes sparser? Yes, so the bottom line is that our method is pretty robust to sparsity. Actually, when the input point clouds have different uh, densities, our network still uh, uh, suggests good rigid alignment. And my hypothesis is that because of our repulsion loss, our network is able to uh, somehow create a latent space where faraway points have different embeddings. And because of our orthogonality, uh, latent orthogonality in space, I, I believe our dense mappings suggest good alignments. And when you have dense correspondences, I think this is the bottom line. When you have good dense correspondences, finding the rigid alignment is an easy task. And this is why I believe our met met method is able to create good uh, alignments, even under sparse representations. And uh, thank you, thank you, Gvir. Um, so we should welcome our next speaker. Um, Dwyer Shmuel, and this is a joint work with um, um, Gal Chechnik of uh, Bar Ilan University. It's a joint work with NVIDIA. Um, so you can share the screen and go ahead. Can you see the screen? Yes, sure. Okay, so hi, uh, my name is Dwyer Samuel, and I'll be presenting our paper, Distribution and Robustness Loss for Long Tail Learning together with Professor Galcecic from Barilan University and Invid. So real data is usually strongly unbalanced across classes. If we sort classes by their frequency, there is a small number of head classes with many samples and many tail classes that are far less frequent. Long tail data poses two major challenges to learning. First, data paucity. Low count of samples of tail classes leads to overfitting and poor accuracy for those classes and second, data imbalance. Models favor and overrepresent the rich classes in terms of models parameters. To address unbalanced data, most studies try balancing data, the loss, or the classifier, sorry, the data, the loss, or the classifier to, to, to reduce the classification by a steward head classes, I'm sorry. In fact, most recent work is focused on balancing the classifier, reaching state-of-the-art results on unbalanced benchmarks. Far less attention has been given to the latent representation learned with unbalanced data. So we wanted to quantify this bias in the latent space. And to do that, we did the following experiment. We trained the ResNet32 on the long-tailed CIFAR100 dataset 
For each layer of the network, we computed the centroids of each class, and we then used them to classify all samples using a nearest centroid neighbor classifier. We observed that a substantial difference in accuracy between head and tail classes is presented. This happened in every layer that we tested, even in the low layers that are believed to represent class agnostic features. You can see the gap in the figure. We conjecture that the learned representation becomes biased towards head classes, hurting any classifier applied to that representation. So a natural approach to address this challenge is to add a loss, a representation learning loss, for example, a contrastive loss, which pulls each sample towards the estimated centroid of its own class and pushes away samples from other classes. More formally, given a sample XI with a label YI that belongs to class C, we denote the centroid of class C by mu C and the feature representation of the sample XI by ZI. So a commonly used model of the conditional likelihood that a sample I belongs to class C has this kind of form, where D is the distance between mu C and ZI. In other words, as the distance between ZI and the centroid becomes smaller, the probability of ZI being classified as C becomes larger. We can generalize this formulation to a set of samples from class C, set as C for ZI where all ZI belongs to class C where the log likelihood is the sum of the log likelihood of individual samples, you can see it here. The total loss is the negative log, li log likelihood loss, where, the sum, where we sum over classes with class weights. The loss is very intuitive and commonly used in representation. So we have a loss, okay, but there is a problem. The loss uses the real data centroids, mu c, which we do not have. And a naive solution that we might suggest is we would like to estimate the centroids from the training data. So for each class, we are gonna calculate the presentation of all training samples and then find their centroids, mu c hat, which is the estimated centroid. This approach is known as empirical minimization ERM. In ERM, we aim to learn a classifier F that minimizes loss over the data distribution. Since the data distribution is unknown, ERM uses the empirical distribution of the training data to estimate the distribution. Unfortunately, this does not work well in our case. Our data set is long-tailed, which means tail classes contain very few samples. The estimated centroid mu C hat for those classes may be a poor approximation of mu C, the real centroids. This is illustrated here with a large gap between the real mu C, the real centroid, and the estimated. So in other words, the ERM naive assumption is that the test distribution is close to the empirical train distribution, which is not true for the tail classes in our case. To address this problem, we propose to use an alternative to ERM, which is called DRO, or distributionally robust optimization. So the idea is this, instead of optimizing the loss for a single distribution, for a single distribution, the empirical training distribution, DRO minimizes the loss within a family of possible distributions. So DRO aims to perform well simultaneously for a set of test distribution defined by an uncertainty set. The set of distribution U is typically chosen as a hyperbole of radius epsilon around the empirical training distribution. So how does this loss work? So we first calculate the estimated centroid given the training data. For each centroid, we define an area called the uncertainty area using a sphere with a radius epsilon. The distance between a sample and a class is computed as the distance between the sample and the worst case, and not the, the distance between a sample and the estimated sample. This is the worst case is the farthest point in the set. This makes the model more robust to the variability we have in tail classes, but we still have a small problem. Computing such a worst case loss may be computationally hard. So to overcome this challenge, we derive an upper bound on the worst case loss that we can compute Using the empirical centroid, we use this upper bound as a surrogate loss. Minimizing the upper bound pushes down the original loss. The form of the bound is very intuitive. It can be viewed as a modification of the contrast loss that I described earlier, where the distance between a sample and an empirical centroid is increased by a term that depends on the radius of the uncertainty ball, circled in blue. In practice, the model is trained with a combination of two losses, a standard cost entropy loss is applied to the output of the classification layer, and a representation loss is applied to the latent representation of the penalty metric. 
The size, note the size of the uncertainty epsilon ball around each class plays an important role. When the uncertainty radius is too small, the probability that the true centroid is within the uncertainty area decreases, together with the probability that the bound holds. When the radius, when the radius is too large, sorry, the bound is more likely to hold, but, be, but it becomes less tight. So we explored three ways to determine the radius. The first one, shared epsilon. All classes share the same uncertainty radius. The second one, sample count. The class radius scales with one divided by square root of n, where n is the number of training samples. The scaling is based on the fact that the standard error of the mean decays as a square root of n and leads, of, and leads to tail classes having a larger safety radius. And lastly, learned epsilon. We treated the radius as a learnable parameter and tuned its value during training. Uh, we evaluated our proposed method using experiments on four major long-tailed recognition benchmarks, long-tailed CIFAR-10, long-tailed CIFAR-100, long-tailed ImageNet, and iNetworks. We report the top one accuracy over all classes on class balance tests. And for long-tailed CIFAR-100 and long-tailed ImageNet, we also report many short, medium short, and few short performance settings. So we can see that our method achieves best results on all data sets and performs well on tail classes without sacrificing, sacrificing head classes. You can see it here, for example, on ImageNet, where we, we maintain the many shot accuracy and increase the few shot accuracy without hurting the many shot accuracy. This suggests that our method learns high quality features for all classes. To gain additional I look at the Disney projection of learned representation and compa compared vanilla cross entropy loss with our proposed method. The figure shows that our learned feature space is more compact with margins around head and tail classes. Tail classes have larger margins since the estimation of their features is less accurate. We also compare train error and test error between a model trained with a cross entropy loss, which is red, and a model trained with our approach, blue. <clears throat> our loss is expected to improve recognition mostly at tail classes, and indeed, using a robustness loss cuts down error substantially in tail classes without hurting head classes. So to conclude, learning with unbalanced data leads to representations that are biased in favor of head class. We introduced a novel loss based on distributional robust theory, which improves the learned representation. And training deep representations with the distributionally robustest loss outperforms all baseline on four unbalanced benchmarks. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Vir, for a very interesting talk. Um, so again, I encourage the audience to post uh, questions in chat. Um, let me see. Um, okay. Um, so um, I will start with the questions until we get um, Sam. Um, how would you compare the training uh, with the additional loss you suggest with training with just a cross entropy loss? So training with this loss might be very computationally uh, with, the, with the computational cost because we calculate the centroids for each class and do it naively might take a lot of hours to train, but there are a lot of options that we can that we can use instead of calculating the centroids, we can even train the centroids like vector doing training and change this doing training. So training time would be much, much lower than training with, uh, with without calculating the centroids of the data. Okay, thank you. And I have another question. How would um, the entire convergence would change if the mixture between um, head classes and 10 classes will change. Suppose that you have one single head class and many um, tail classes. So because we used an learnable epsilon, uh, we use the learning epsilon variant, so it learns which class has few samples and which class has more samples, and it adjusts the epsilons, the area, uncertainty area uh, for those classes. So if the data distribution changes, the epsilons will change too, and the the training would be would be okay, would be robust to this too. 
Okay, thank you. So we have a question. So it's great work. Uh, two questions actually. How do you calculate class mean? Do you use a pre trained model for this? And the second one, okay, start with the first one. And so, so, first, we train the first few epochs with cross entropy loss only to gain uh, initial feature representation. And to calculate the centroid, we take all the data uh, for, class, uh, for the first class, let's say. We calculate the representation features and we do a mean over all of them. This is the centroid for each class. As I said before, there are different ways, efficient ways to calculate the centroids during training. And um, another question uh, of, the same, uh, of the same person, how do you calculate the uncertainty radius? So we don't really calculate them. We propose three, three variants, the three epsilons that we might use. And the best one that worked for us is the learnable epsilon, which the model learns to put the uncertainty, the uncertainty area during training. So we don't really calculate it. The model learns it by itself. Okay, and there is um, there are two other questions actually. Um, yeah. Is it just like clustering the embedded features with an epsilon condition? I'm not familiar really with clustering in the feature space, I think, but it's, uh, I am not sure, but I think it's different because, because during training, the model tr adjusts the epsilons uh, to create, to form clusters that are much more compact and, and, and separate them from other classes. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but that's what we do. Okay, so I, I guess you can um, uh, still correspond via the, the chat later yeah. on after this talk. Yeah. Uh, there is another question. How do you explain the noise behavior for optimal epsilon? Should it be uh, monotonic? Does, uh, I'm not sure. I uh, how do you explain uh, the noise? Um, so um, when you choose the optimal epsilon, there is still noise. Um, and, and then there is a question, shouldn't it be uh, monotonic? The, the, the epsilon should be monotonic? No, the noise behavior. The noise behavior should be monotonic. I'm not sure. I'm gonna uh, answer it on the chat. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Chat. So uh, answer that on the chat. So thank you, Dvir. Thank um, you very much. And then we should welcome the next speaker and uh, the last one for this session, Dror Moran. It's work with Odaya, um, Yoni, Chagai, Mirav Galum, and Ronen Batri, all from the Weizmann Institute. Hi. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dro Moan, and I will talk about uh, deep permutation equivariant structure for motion. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with uh, Odea Koslovki, Yoni Kasten, Merav Galun, and Ronen Basri from the Weizmann Institute of Science, and Chagai Maron from uh, the VDA Research. Um, in this work, we address the fundamental problem of structure for motion. Given an unordered set of images of a static scene, we need to find the camera parameters P1 to Pn, marked in red here, and a 3D representation of the scene, here represented as a point cloud. A structure for motion was traditionally approached with tools from projective geometry and optimization. One popular approach involves a pre-processing -pre step in finding matches between a pair of images, followed by an incremental recovery of cameras and structure, by expanding the set of processed images by one image at each step. Those approaches generally achieve highly accurate reconstructions. However, they usually have produced uh, sparse reconstructions, they rely on some heuristics, and they require a pre-processing pre step, which is prone to error. In recent years, uh, deep methods have achieved accurate reconstructions in multi-view stereo setup, in which the camera parameters are given. In addition, various deep techniques were proposed that also recover the camera parameters, However, those are generally, generally applied in limited setting when the number of in input images is small or when the camera motion is limited. In addition, those methods are generally non-trainable and therefore the optimization time is, uh, it is, it is time consuming to, to use. In this work, we ask ourselves if we can use a deep neural network for structure for motion even in its classical setting where the output is sparse. 
uh, as in classical method, we start with a pre-processing step that involves feature extractions, matching, and outlier removal for extracting a sparse tensor of point tracks. A point track is a set of projection of a single CV points detected in a given image. Column one in the input tensor, for example, includes the detected position of the same points marked in orange in images two and three. Similarly, each column in the input tensor represents the detected position of a different 3D scene point. Each row in the tensor contains the points detected in, the, in a single image. Note that each detected position is two-dimensional, and therefore the size of the measurement tensor is the number of images times the number of point tracks times two. We also know that the measurement tensor is sparse. Many of the entries may be uh, empty due to occlusions or uh, detection failures. In order to design an architecture that is fit to our task, let's first look on the symmetries of our input. Consider a model for structure for motion described as a function f that given a point track tensor yields the camera parameters p and the 3D point uh, x. Now consider a permutation of the point track star. If we apply the same model f to the permuted matrix, what should be our output? Since point tracks form a set, we expect that there should be no difference in the model output except for the order. In other words, we expect that the model prediction for the permuted matrix should be identical to applying the same permutation to the original output. We therefore expect our model to be equivalent to the permutation of the columns. This insight also holds for the matrix rows. Since the input images form a set, given a permutation of the matrix rows, our model prediction for the permuted matrix should be identical to permuting the model's original output. Using, using this insight, we introduced a deep network architecture for structure for motion that is equivalent for permutation of both images and point tracks. So how can we build a model that respects those images? So first, let's see how can we build an equivalent model for a single set X. In their paper from 2018, Zahir et al. have this uh, following dilemma regarding uh, Sets. Any equivalent affine map L from a feature space with D channels to a feature space with D track channels can be represented in the following way. Uh, every entry equals to some linear operation on that entry and a linear operation on the element sum. This expression is, equal, uh, is equals to all the elements of the sets and therefore we refer to it as the global feature of the set. But our input is a multiset, so we need a, uh, a layer that will be permutation equivalent for both rows and columns. In the paper from 2018, Hartford et al. had uh, the, the following extension for the, for the previous lemma. Any equivalent alpha map uh, L from a feature space with D channels to a feature space with D tag channel uh, can be represented in the following way. So as before, uh, we use a linear layer on each element of the set. Then a linear operation is applied on the column sum. This operation produces a global feature for each point track. Similarly, a linear operation is applied on the row sum, producing a global feature for, the, uh, for each camera. And finally, a linear operation is applied to the sum of the full matrix, producing a global feature for the whole thing. And also we know that in our model, we replace the sum with averages uh, to handle missing entries. So our network is, is composed of three main parts, a shared feature encoder and two sub-networks that reduce the recovered cameras and 3D points. The encoder takes our input M and outputs some latent representation E of M. The encoder is permutation equivalent for a multiset. It, it is composed of F equivalent layers interleaved with pointwise non-linearity. It is important to note that the activation functions maintain uh, equivalence. The point has take as input the column sum, which is a set of n elements. So therefore it is implemented as a permutation equivalent set network. It outputs a metric, a metric representation of the 3D points. The camera has takes as input the row sum, which is a set of m elements. Therefore it is also implemented as a permutation equivalent set network. It outputs a, a metric rep representation of the camera parameters, which is in the uncalibrated setup a vector of size 12, and in the calibrated setup a vector of size 7, where the first four entries represent the camera rotation and the last three uh, represent the camera location. 
So why should we use uh, equivariant models? Uh, above all, equivariant architecture and code the tax structures, those providing a strong inductive bias uh, for our task. In addition, uh, parameter sharing uh, yields considerably fewer parameters. For example, uh, with D channels, uh, one, la uh, one layer use uh, D squared parameter instead of N squared, N squared, D squared. It's improved the efficiency of our models. It have a better gen generalizations, training on any input tensor expose the network to all its different realizations uh, by different point and camera orders. And another advantage that is crucial for, uh, specifically for our, uh, for our task is the network ability to uh, handle uh, variable size input. And finally, uh, while equivalent model might suffer from a loss of expressive power, it was proven by Maron et al. that the network architecture we use enjoy a universal approximation property uh, under some mild uh, assumption on the input domain. So in other words, with sufficient uh, layers and, and channels and with proper set of weights, it can approximate any continuous function that is equivalent to permutation of both world and part. Um, our network minimizes a loss function made of two terms, a reprojection terms and range terms. The reprojection terms measure the Euclidean distance between the projection 2D points and the measure 2D, uh, 2D points given in the input tensor. The hinge term is encouraged the recovered depth to be uh, positive. Uh, most importantly, the loss function enable us to train our network in an unsupervised way. So overall, our model takes a set of images, extract point tracks, then it uses a permutation equivalent model to recover the camera parameters and the 3D points. And then the model is trained in an unsupervised way using a reprojection test. Uh, we first tested our model in the single scene mode. We optimized our model on a single scene using our loss. The, those videos show the result of optimization with our network in the calibrated, calibrated settings, followed by bundle adjustment. As you can see, our model converges, achieving accurate recovery of camera parameters and 3D point location, locations in large scenes. We also compare our result to previous structure for motion methods. Uh, Castan et al, GSFM, and Jiang et al linear methods are, bo are both global methods as uh, our methods. Schoenberger et al, COMAP is the current state of the art method, but it uses a uh, sequential optimization. We show camera locations uh, errors in meters, orientation errors in degrees, and reprojection errors in pixels. As you can see, we achieve more accurate results uh, compared to the global methods. Uh, but when comparing ourselves to the sequential comap, we suffer from uh, some failure cases as, uh, where our model does not converge to uh, sufficiently accurate uh, solutions. This seems to occur uh, in particular in uh, scenes in which the camera is completing a circle around the scenes. But such issues can be resolved and it is done by optimizing our network in an, increment, in an incremental fashion. Uh, more details about it can be uh, found in our paper. Uh, we, we next tested the ability of our model to generalize to novel scenes. We trained our model in an unsupervised way, and then a test applied to novel scenes. We find that an additional short refinement step enable accurate recovery of camera poses and three points positions. We compared the result, uh, the result of, our of our trained model. As you can see, during inference, our model was able to converge only in five out of, scene, of 10 scenes. Therefore, we use this short refinement step that uh, it's random to be similar to COMAP to achieve more accurate reconstructions. We also compare our result to, uh, to our non trained model after a short optimization. Our results are comparable to the state of the art COMAP in accuracy and uh, runtime. We hope in future work that with additional training on larger data set, we will be able to achieve more accurate results on inference and by that reduce the, uh, the runtime from a few minutes to uh, milliseconds. Uh, similar results are obtained uh, with our model in uncalibrated settings. Uh, so for summary, we introduced uh, equivalent SFM, the first network to construct uh, large scale scenes. We use an equivariant network architecture that respects the symmetries of our task. We have tested our methods in two setups, single scene optimization and inference. We, in inference, we train models. Our code is, is also available on GitHub. And regarding future work, our task is to combine the success of DNN in a multi-view set, uh, setup with, uh, with our model to create an end-to-end -end model that doesn't require any pre-processing 
and and here the dense sequence function. Uh, thank you for listening. For listening. Thank you. Very interesting talk. I encourage uh, everyone in the audience to post questions. Um, maybe in the meantime, um, I will ask a question. Um, so uh, I can understand that your uh, method can accommodate missing entries in the input matrix. Yep. Um, so what? how sensitive it is to, to missing entries? Um, how, can, uh, how many can you tolerate? It, it doesn't affect uh, on, on your uh, uh, on your on our, on our results. You just uh, you know the number of points and number of matching points between uh, um, between the cameras. We you need uh, you need you need matching between the cameras, but we, the method doesn't affect if we have uh, not a, if we have a lot of missing data. So it's more depend on the number of matches between the pair of images. Then. The total okay. number of uh, no, not the number, but the ratio. Would that be affected? Uh, yeah. So the ratio, um, you, like for for general, uh, for to understand the uh, the relation between two 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 images, you need at least uh, eight uh, eight points or five points, depending on the algorithm. So we but, haven't but tested our, have our the... methods, but. Okay. Uh, but as long as you have the, the necessary number of, yeah. of uh, mm -hmm. matching points, that would be okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I see. Um, and then um, you showed really nice results where you could generalize mm -hmm. uh, from um, to unknown um, unknown scenes. So yeah. and and for some scenes, you 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 was very successful. So um, is there something uh, common to the successful uh, reconstruction to the scene uh, with successful reconstructions? Were they more similar to the training? Actually, we, we haven't checked it, but it is uh, interesting. Actually, this is the result of our paper, but uh, we, uh, we have, we now we have more, uh, we have better results now. So it's, uh, we have, uh, we, we were able to, to generalize to like eight of the eight of the ten scenes, so even now the results are quite better. Uh, but it is interesting to 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 try to find out why those uh, methods uh, were able to generalize, and which not uh, we, but we haven't tested it. Okay, so we have uh, um, another question. How do you handle outliers? Um, so this is also our model is, is like L2, we have an L2 loss, so it's quite robust to outliers, but with a uh, high amount of uh, outliers, our model uh, doesn't, ma it doesn't manage to converge and where we have a lot of outliers. Um, this is why we removed the outliers in the pre-processing pre step. Um, we are currently working on a model that will be also able to, to remove the outlier more uh, to, to handle b a bigger amount of outliers. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of two very interesting questions. Uh, one is, is this approach can be applicable for panoramic video from single camera? From uh, panoramic video for single cameras. Um, tricky. <laughs> yeah, tricky. Let me think about it. Uh, I think it depends. Mm -hmm. I think it depends if you can uh, recover the depth from from the scene from the panoramic uh, from the panoramic images, and I'm not sure that you can do it. But I need to think about this. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so you can continue chatting. Uh, will it work also when objects are in close range to the camera? Um, yeah, I don't think it will have any effect on on our algorithm. We haven't. Tested. I don't know what. How close uh, did you mean? You, it's, but it, it, it shouldn't be a problem. Like we have the this found, uh, fountain uh, data set, and it's quite close. It's like three meters from the object, and it's, we're able to to solve it also on quite uh, closer uh, things. Okay. Thank you very much. So this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Edward. And this uh, closes the session and see you in the first session and the last one.
Okay. Thank you for hanging in there. We are entering the last session of the day today. And we have uh, six more exciting talks. And the first talk will be given by Sagi Ben Naim. It's a joint collaboration between Tel Aviv University and the University of Chicago. Sagi, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Let me share the screen. Okay, can you share? Can you see my uh, screen well? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, okay, uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my name is uh, Sagi Benaim, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, text to mesh, text driven stylization uh, for meshes. And uh, this is joint work with Oscar Michel, Richard Liu, uh, Roy Baron, and uh, Rana Hanok. Okay. Okay, so when we talk about the task of uh, 3D object editing, we, this can be loosely defined as uh, taking a sort of a 3D object, uh, which could be represented, uh, for example, as a mesh, uh, together with some uh, user input and manipulating or editing that object uh, according to uh, the user specification, according to that input. Um, however, uh, editing 3D objects often requires uh, significant uh, expertise and it's sort of usually done by uh, sophisticated software uh, in a manual manner. Um, there are uh, other uh, data-driven approach for uh, 3D object uh, manipulations, but these often require a significant amount of training data in the form of 3D objects. And so while in the 2D case, we sort of have um, really good data sets such as ImageNet with many categories uh, and, and images, uh, this is not so much the case in 3D where uh, much fewer categories and images um, and, um, exist. And so in this project, uh, our goal was to stylize and input a 3D object in an intuitive manner using a user-specified uh, text specification. So for example, uh, if we are given this uh, horse on the left, uh, we want to pro produce a matching stylization uh, according to a given text. And so in particular, uh, this does not require any expertise from the user as the user must can, can only provide uh, a text specification. And uh, also uh, our algorithm is, does not require a 3D data set. It, it does all of this in a sort of a zero shot manner. Okay, so what, what do we require of our stylization? Our stylization needs to capture a number of important properties. So for example, we want to stylize an input. Uh, let's, let's take this um, input mesh shown as the, in, in gray. Uh, we want the stylization to be, to produce a part aware a global semantic stylization. So for example, you can see here, uh, when we uh, give the prompt of an Iron Man, uh, we want to consider muscles, clothing, uh, material, uh, as well as different textures. Uh, here's another example. And so in this case, we, our network must consider um, both the orientation of textures as well as uh, semantic, uh, semantic properties such as the, uh, such as, um, uh, the shape and so on. Uh, here is another example uh, that, um, so for example, if, if we take a brick lamp and uh, you can see here that we want to be able to capture the orientation of texture as well as uh, the lighting. So here we can also see uh, semantic uh, properties that emerge. And lastly, we also uh, consider these uh, out of domain manipulations. So for example, uh, we could uh, specify an astronaut horse. And as far as I'm aware, there's no astronaut horses around yet we are able to generate such uh, plausible stylizations. Okay, so let's see how this works. The input to our, um, uh, input to our method is a 3D object, which we represent using a 3D mesh. Um, and so we begin by, um, taking this input mesh and fitting it to a component which we call a neural style field. Um, in particular, the first component of our neural style field is a positional encoding, which you might be familiar from uh, um, uh, the NERF paper. And so uh, specifically we take uh, each vertex in, in the mesh uh, and we project it into random Fourier features. And in what, what this does is uh, control the frequency of the, uh, of the output mesh. 
So for example, you can see here by uh, changing the standard deviation uh, of, uh, of, of frequency encoding, uh, this controls the frequency of the details of the stylized output in this uh, example of, uh, of a donut mesh. Okay, the second component of the neural cell field is uh, simply two MLPs. These MLPs basically take as input the uh, projected uh, um, vertex and they predict uh, two things. The first thing they predict is an RGB uh, color for uh, that vertex. And the second thing they predict is a displacement. And um, the stylized mesh is basically obtained by applying this a predicted RGB color for each vertex, as well as a displacement, uh, uh, this displacement along the normal. So let's see. Uh, so here you can see the result of predicting both the color and displacement uh, for text from of uh, alien made of bark. If we just predicted the uh, geometry, so just a displacement along the normal, so you can see that the result is inferior. And if we just predict uh, color, so just an RGB uh, value, then what happens is the network tries to hallucinate uh, geometry. The result sort of looks uh, flat. Okay, so after we produced, uh, once we produced our stylization of, of the mesh, uh, we pass it through our next component. And in, in this component, we want to basically render, um, um, render the object from multiple uh, views and apply a set of 2D uh, augmentations. So let's look more closely at this component. Basically, we begin by choosing uh, an anchor view. And an anchor view uh, is basically a view that has a sort of high similarity uh, between the target um, uh, to the target text in a semantic space, which we call a uh, clip. Uh, clip, you might be familiar with it. So for example, for a camel mesh, uh, you can see that uh, the vertices that are colored according to clip score, um, basically, so, um, the, the yellow regions in this, uh, uh, the yellow regions for, of the camel, these are these, these capture sort of uh, uh, good good anchor views, and the uh, sort of the black regions these captures uh, bad views, and so um, intuitively we want these anchor views sort of capture uh, most of the semantic components of the of the mesh. Uh, once we do that, we sort of sample uh, many random views around. Uh, this anchor views, uh, this anchor view, and so uh, here you can see. Uh, and we also apply a set of both global and local augmentations on those um, on those different views. Okay, so this results in a set of two D uh, augmented views, uh, which we basically uh, this is our representation uh, of the stylized three uh, D objects. So uh, the final step is to use uh, a multimodal semantic embedding uh, of clip. And in particular, what we do is we embed the target text, okay, uh, as well as the, um, our augmented views. And we want, um, what we do is we want uh, to have, uh, uh, we, use, we use the semantic uh, loss to encourage high similarity uh, between uh, these two embeddings. Uh, and this loss, um, basically uh, is used to train uh, our neural style field. Okay, so let's, uh, let's summarize. We start with uh, an input mesh. Uh, we, patch, we, uh, we pass each vertex through uh, what we call our neural style field. Uh, so we begin by projecting each vertex into um, um, Fourier features using a positional uh, encoding. Uh, we then uh, pass these to two MLPs which predict uh, an RGB value and uh, displacement along the normal. Once this produces our stylized mesh, which we uh, basically, uh, we then use a differential renderer to render multiple views uh, from that mesh. Uh, and we apply a set of 2D augmentations. And the last component is basically uh, sort of matching uh, these two uh, 2D augmented views with our target text from using a clip. Okay, so each of the components uh, in our method basically induces uh, sort of uh, an important prior, uh, which is crucial for the uh, final stylization. So if we look at this example of a candle and the text from of candle made of bark, uh, then if we don't use the neural style field, that is we predict directly uh, the RGB and displacement of each component, 
of each vertex, then this, re uh, this uh, results in this uh, noisy and arbitrary uh, displacement. Um, interest, interestingly, uh, augmentations are very important. If we don't use any augmentations, then you can see that this stylization does not re uh, resemble at all uh, a candle made of bark. Uh, without the Fourier feature network, then uh, you can see that we cannot handle uh, fine details very well. And without uh, sort of um, local crop augmentations, um, so only global augmentations, we can see also here that fine details is lost. And lastly, uh, without displacements along the normal, the result uh, look uh, flat. Okay, so let's see uh, some results. So here you can see the example of, um, of a mesh of a shoe. And uh, we can, uh, once we space, we can say, for example, uh, a cactus or, uh, or bark or a brick, and you can see that uh, we, we sort of able to simulate realistic uh, uh, texture and materials. Uh, here's another example uh, of uh, um, crochet, and you can, again, specify uh, different target uh, text prompts. And uh, here's an interesting result where we were able to basically morph uh, between two different stylizations. So you can, for example, say, a camel made of poncho or a camel made of brick. And then you can consider basically an interpolation uh, between those two stylizations to produce these, uh, these morphings. And um, we can also uh, sort of use the method to stylize a uh, human. So here, for example, you can see, um, and, and the interesting thing is that uh, the method has this uh, uh, semantic understanding of individual uh, humans. So for example, you can see here that um, uh, it has an understanding of who Steve's job is and, the, uh, and therefore how to, to stylize a 3D mesh according to Steve, uh, to Steve Jobs or uh, of, of Messi. So note how, for example, uh, we have the uh, Messi's shirt uh, has the, the label of, has the writing of, uh, of Messi and how it can capture different parts such as the uh, socks and the shirt and so on. Another interesting aspect uh, that we found is that to be able to increase the granularity of the text prompt. So for example, you could start with a simple text prompt such as just a lamp uh, in this case, but you could be more specific. So for example, you could say, uh, I want a Luxo lamp or maybe uh, a blue steel Luxo lamp or even a blue steel uh, Luxo lamp with corrugated metal. And we sort of able to capture this uh, fine grain uh, detail I'd say in the in the text specification. Okay, so uh, we talked about uh, target text, but the interesting thing is because uh, Clip is sort of this multimodal embedding, uh, it can also um, so we can instead instead of uh, using a text embedding, we can replace that text embedding uh, with uh, an image uh, embedding. And what this does is basically uh, stylize our input mesh according. Uh, to a target image. So for example, here, if we take this uh, mesh of a pig, uh, we can basically specify uh, this, these different uh, target images and stylize the, the pig according to uh, these, these target images. And we can go even further. Uh, why stop here? And instead of looking at a, a, a target image, we can consider a, a target mesh. And we, uh, when we look at target mesh, we can basically do the same thing as we did uh, for the source mesh by uh, considering sort of a random uh, augmented views, embedding them into the clip space, and then uh, comparing the representation of the source mesh uh, into the, onto the target mesh. Okay, uh, so to conclude, um, we, uh, what we did in this, this project is to uh, stylize uh, 3D objects in the form of meshes in sort of an intuitive manner using a target uh, text specification. Um, it is it is zero shot, so we did not we didn't use a, sort of a three D data set or uh, organ for that matter. Um, we can sort of render arbitrary high resolutions because we use this uh, sort of MLP that can capture um, any any input resolution uh, that you wish. Um, also, an an interesting um, sort of 
byproduct, I would say, is that we have this, this entanglement between an explicit mesh uh, representation, which represent the contact, and this implicit neural style field. So um, in, in other words, such as NERF, you might, you might have a complete uh, implicit representation of both the uh, content and the style. And here we have this explicit implicit uh, disentanglement. Uh, we have this fine grained control, both in terms of text and the 3D shape. And we can capture sort of in the wild measures with arbitrary style as well as uh, out of the main uh, stylizations. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, you can visit the website for many more goals. Thank you very much, Sagi. Uh, let's see if there are questions from the audience. I see there is one. Uh, which kind of positional encoding did you use? Uh, so that's the, um, we, we use the Fourier based one. It's taken from uh, a Nurex Neur paper from, I think, 2020. Um, it was also used in, in the NERF paper, if you know. So it's, it's basically a bunch of cosines and sines with, uh, uh, with, where you can control the frequency using the uh, standard deviation. Um, okay. And I have a follow-up question. So the, the, the system generates a, a result. Can you somehow interact with it? Uh, say uh, you want to uh, get the texture, uh, a, a, I don't know, larger or a more gentle texture. Can you control the, the amplitude? That would be one question. The second part is, can you use positional information? So I want the head to have one texture and the legs to have a different one. Uh, how would you go about doing that? Okay, so uh, for the first question, there, there, there are two ways in which you can uh, control. Uh, for, for one, you can control the input frequency of the of, of your three D of your three D mesh because we we um, the, you, you basically specify an input mesh and, and that you can control the frequency of that. And you can also control the uh, within the positional encoding. We also we also see that changing the sort of the, the sigma results in different. Uh, frequency of stylization. So I guess you have two ways of, of controlling uh, controlling that. Uh, for the second uh, question, we don't yet have that ability, but that's a really a sort of interesting. Uh, I guess you, you might require some sort of a segmentation um, of the object of, or what you want to change exactly. But currently, we don't have that uh, part specific uh, stylization, I would say. Yeah. Okay, and a couple more questions from the audience. Um, is there a requirement for the input output meshes to be watertight? Um, I don't think there is the requirement, no, but uh, we, no, I don't think there is, there is no, no. You, you could probably try it on there. Uh, okay, uh, because. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, there, uh, it is no, there's no requirement like that. No. And the, the last question, uh, I guess, for now is it's a surprise that clip contains information about displacements. Can you dive in your intuition interpretation on this? Uh, into displacement? Uh, yeah, how come clip embedding contains information about displacement? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, for example, um, I, I mean, I, I, for example, why why would it capture also three uh, D information or three D specific information as well? Uh, when we what we do is we simply um, take the embeddings of the different views and we average them. Um, it, it's a good question, but if, for example. One, one intuition would be, for example, if I take a particular object and I uh, give it different views and I embed it into clip, the representation will actually be very close, much closer than a different object or something like that. So I don't know exactly why that happened, uh, but somehow it learned this additional okay. information from uh, 2D, 2D images only, you know? Uh, yeah, but it, it is... It, it knows more than, than it seems, <laughs> I would say. Okay, so with this philosophical question, we'll uh, end this part. Thanks very much. And we're ready to move to the next talk. The next talk is by uh, Aviv Gabay, 
Neve Cohen and Yadid Foshan from the Hebrew University. And I suspect Aviv is going to give the talk. Hey, yes. Go ahead. I'm here. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Aviv. I've recently completed uh, my PhD at the Hebrew University under the supervision of uh, Dr. Yadid Khoshan and uh, Professor Shmuel Peleg. Um, today I will be presenting uh, ZeroDim, which is a joint work with uh, Niv Cohen and Yadid Khoshan. Okay, so in representation learning, it is commonly assumed that high dimensional observations, such as images, are not truly high dimensional but are in fact the manifestation of a set of low dimensional factors of variation. For example, um, the generative factors uh, of human faces include attributes such as gender, hairstyle, and facial expression. Similarly, the appearance of animal faces can be described by attributes such as facial shape, fur texture, and head pose. In this entanglement, the goal is to learn a mapping from the observations to the attribute representations, whose structure should be similar to the ground truth ones. Uh, this may allow us to find the, the independent attributes composing an image and to manipulate some of them while not changing the others. Yeah. The ability to disentangle the different attributes is essential for many important tasks, such as solving analogies and manipulating real images. In general, disentanglement in machine learning paves the way for better interpretability, fairness, and abstract reasoning. Unsupervised disentanglement has been shown to be theoretically impossible without inductive biases on the models and the data. For example, the factors of variation learned by the model are not guaranteed to be access aligned and therefore may remain entangled. While several statistical assumptions on the data might sometimes resolve such ambiguities, they should be carefully designed for each task and are not generally applicable. Accordingly, Practical unsupervised approaches often achieve poor results despite multiple runs with different hyperparameters and initializations. The prominent approach for, to disentanglement is to introduce a limited amount of supervision at training time, uh, meaning assuming that a few samples are labeled with the true factors of variation. In a comprehensive study, Locatello et al. showed that disentangled representation can be learned with a relatively small amount of labeled examples by incorporating a supervised term into state-of-the-art unsupervised methods. The term basically encourages the encoder to predict the ground truth factors of variation for the labeled examples in the training set. However, two major limitations still remain in such semi-supervised methods. Manual annotation can be painstaking, even if it's only required for part of the images, say 100 or 1,000 samples. In our work, we study whether off-the-shelf general purpose classification models can be leveraged to obtain the minimal supervision required for this entanglement. Specifically, we consider the recent set of the art pre-trained language-guided image descriptors. Moreover, current semi-supervised methods focus on synthetic data sets in which each image is uniquely described by the ground root factors of variation. In modeling real data, such as natural images, the assumption that we can enumerate all the factors of variation does not hold anymore as there is no complete set of semantic and interpretable attributes that describe an image precisely. For example, one might ask, can an image of a human face be uniquely described with natural language? The answer is clearly negative, as a set of attributes such as age, gender, or hair color is far from uniquely defining a face. This motivates the modeling of the complementary set of residual attributes, which are never explicitly specified. Several labeling configurations have been considered in previous work. The work of Locatello et al. assumes that few labels are provided for each attribute, which is clearly not the case in natural images, where some of the attributes cannot even be enumerated or explicitly identified. On the other hand, methods as load are able to model a set of unlabeled attributes, but assume full supervision on the labeled attributes and therefore struggles when only partial labels are provided. Our method, tackles a more realistic setting in which for an arbitrary data set, we obtain annotations for some of the attributes in part of the images, while the rest of the attributes are completely unlabeled. In order to obtain labels for the attributes of interest with minimal human effort, we leverage CLIP, which is a recent language and image embedding model. The joint space in CLIP is learned such that the distance between the image and the text embedding is small for text image pairs, which are semantically related. This joint representation by CLIP was shown to have zero short classification capabilities using textual descriptions for the candidate categories. 
As Clip is already pre-trained on a wide range of image domains, it can provide rich labels for various visual concepts without any further manual effort. The reliance on general purpose classification models as Clip naturally fits our setting. As some of the image attributes cannot be well described with natural language, only part of them can be annotated. Moreover, the zero-shot classification capabilities of Clip are far from perfect, leaving many images with noisy or missing labels. Therefore, our zero-shot labeling approach is as follows. We define a list of attributes of interest and specify their optional values as adjectives in natural language, for example, blonde for describing hair color. To annotate a specific attribute, we embed the images along with several natural sentences containing the candidate labels into the joint embedding space of a pre-trained clip. The images which correlate the most with the query are assigned to a label. If none of the, uh, of the labels are assigned, the image remains unlabeled. We therefore begin with, by dividing the attributes into two categories. In the first category, there are the attributes of interest, which can be uh, labeled for some images. And the second category includes the residual attributes, which, which are never explicitly specified. Not that we do not aim to disentangle the residual attributes internally, as they are completely unsupervised and in many cases even uninterpretable. These attributes should be represented as a set by a single latent variable. We now introduce ZeroDim, our novel method for zero-shot disentangled image manipulation. ZeroDim suggests several principles uh, for disentangling the attributes of interest, as well as separating the complementary set of residual attributes. Recall that in our setting, an image I might or might not be assigned to a label for an attribute J. During training, we optimize a set of classifiers, one per attribute of interest, as well as a generator. Moreover, as not all the information is encoded by the attributes of interest, we optimize residual latent code that should account for the residual information needed for reconstructing the image. Given a partially labeled data set, the attributes classify our train with two complementary objectives. The first is predicting the true labels for the labeled examples, and the second is predicting a low entropy estimation of the missing labels. The entropy term constrains the information capacity and prevents the leakage of information not related to a specific attribute, encouraging the prediction to take a single value and improving this entanglement. The residual latent codes are trained with, uh, in a latent optimization fashion and regularized to recover the minimal information that is required for reconstructing the input image. As discovered in load, latent optimization improves this entanglement over encoder-based methods. Finally, the assignment of the attributes of interest along with the residual latent code are fed into a generator for synthesizing the image. To quantitatively evaluate the disentanglement performance, we first simulate the considered setting in a controlled environment with synthetic data and presents better disentanglement uh, of both the attributes of interest and the residual attributes than the baseline. We rely on synthetic data sets where all the attributes are known, but only allow the model to access a subset of them, which we designate as our attributes of interest for the actual experiment. We then show that our method can be effectively trained with partial labels obtained by CLIP to manipulate real world images in high resolution. As the evaluation in this case is merely qualitatively, and we present many visual comparisons to current text guided state of the art image manipulation methods, TeddyGun and StyleClip, both operating in the latent space of a pre trained StyleGun. As can be seen, StyleGun based approaches mainly disentangled highly localized visual concepts such as glasses while global concepts such as gender seem to be entangled with identity. In particular, static manipulation requires manual calibration, leading to negligible changes, as marked in blue here, where the new glasses are almost invisible, or extreme edits, as marked in red here, where the translation to Asian does not preserve the person identity. Our method generates highly disentangled results without manual tuning. Here are some more examples uh, for, of our manipulation on real human faces. The supervision for training the model is achieved in a zero-shot manner using CLIP. The manipulations are highly disentangled and require no manual tuning. Similarly, we automatically annotate tens of different animal species and breeds using CLIP. As a result, the trained model is able to preserve the pose of the animal, which is never explicitly specified, uh, while synthesizing images of different animal species. Lastly, we present similar manipulation idea 
Now for a model trained with partial labels for different uh, car types and colors. There should be noted two main limitations of our approach. Although our method does not require manual annotation, it is trained for a fixed set of attributes of interest in contrast to methods as style clip, which could adapt to a new visual concept at training time. Moreover, unlike unconditional image generative models such as StyleGAN, the construction-based methods as our struggle with synthesizing regions which exhibit large variability such as hairstyle. We believe that the trade-off between this entanglement and perceptual quality is an inter interesting research topic which is beyond the scope of this paper. Thank you for listening. I will be happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Aviv. Any questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, let me start with one. I, I have uh, something I, I didn't quite understand. You have some features for which you don't have any information, if mm -hmm. I understand you correctly. So what is it that causes the algorithm to learn this feature directions, if you will? Why not find some uh, linear transformation or some transformation of them? Okay, so as I, uh, as I said, uh, we aim to disentangle only the, the attributes that we have some sort of uh, supervision for, and all the other attributes, we want to disentangle them as a set. I mean, we want to learn a single latent uh, variable that would represent all the, uh, the information. So we are not aiming to do any sort of unsupervised disentanglement. We do not disentangle the, the attributes internally. So there might be some features that you didn't even specify that fall into this category. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any more questions from the audience? Going once, twice. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. And we move on to the next talk. Uh, the next talk is from uh, Larry Lan and Van Goyon University. Uh, it's a collaboration uh, between uh, Yaakov Goldberger and Tamir Iklim Raviv, and the student who actually did the job, Yael Ziv. Yael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shai. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Yael Ziv. I will present the method for stochastic weight pruning and discuss the role of regularization in shaping network structure. And so this is a joint work with my advisors, Professor Tamir Iklim Raviv and Professor Jakob Goldberger. So over the years, neural networks are getting deeper and heavier. This come at the cost of higher computational complexity and higher uh, memory and power usage. There are two main pruning strategies aiming to address inference time efficiency. One is weight pruning, where we prune individual weights. The other is node pruning, where we prune whole neurons in fully connected layers uh, or whole kernels in CNNs. In our method, we will concentrate on weight pruning. So we will start with an already trained network. We perform additional training session that enforce our solution. Uh, for every network uh, weight, first we update the weight as uh, we usually do, okay, with respect to the loss. And then we use a symmetrical function phi that monotonically maps the weight magnitude to the probability to be pruned. So if I have some uh, weight magnitude that is close to zero, as you see here, it is more likely to be pruned and vice versa. Then we calculate Z, a Bernoulli random variable according to this phi function and use it to set some of the weights to Z. Okay, let's illustrate. So as part of the backpropagation process, we update the network weights we then calculate the probability of the updated weights to be pruned. Obviously, lower magnitude weights are more likely to be pruned in our method. Note that in the following iteration, a removed weight may recover based on the gradient descent equation. 
We also add either L2 or L1 regularization term to our loss function. Uh, so let's look at the gradient descent equations. We can realize that since uh, lambda prime is small and positive, the regularization encourages solutions with small magnitude weights. Okay, this happens. And we hope that the regularization boosts the pruning ratios since small magnitude weights are most likely to be pruned. So we apply our algorithm on different networks for different tasks. Uh, for example, MLP for digital classification. And now that significant portion of the weight was reduced. In addition, 50% of the nodes were removed but we will discuss uh, the results uh, later. We also pruned VGG16 for CIFAR classification, uh, ResNet also for CIFAR10 and CIFAR100 classification, uh, MobileNet, which is a light network that was designed for mobile devices. MobileNet have much lower number of weights. Also, for recent network proposed for COVID-19 detection, the input are just uh, X-ray images, where the main challenge is to distinguish between COVID-19 and pneumonia patients. And for the unit for cell segmentation in microscopy images. We evaluate our method by computing the error rate before and after the pruning process. And we got a very competitive result with respect to other weight pruning algorithms for our task. However, the key contribution of the current study lies in utilizing regularization to the pruning process. Surprisingly, we see that if we had L1 or L2 regularization that are commonly used anyway, whole nodes may be removed. Okay, so let me show you a simple example using the MS classification with MLP pruning. Here you can see a visualization of two weight matrices for the connection between the second fully connected layer to the output layer. The left matrix exemplify pruning with L1 regularization, and the right depict the pruning without regularization. The weight size are color coded, where the zero weights are colored in green. In both cases, okay, 97% of the weight were pruned. So while no regularization was applied, the pattern of the remaining connection is random. When pruning is performed with L1 regularization, entire columns are removed. In other words, all neurons are pruned. So recall that the objective of the algorithm is weight pruning. However, in this case, in addition to the weight pruning, 84% of the second layer neurons were removed. Why is it so? So we came out with the following hypothesis. In the process of weight pruning, when no regularization is applied, the magnitude of the neighbors of the pruned weights increase to compensate for the removed weights. However, the presence of regularization suppresses the growth of the neighboring weights. This causes the entire neuron to be less informative for the global network, such that gradually the node and its weights are zero. and other neurons compensate for the pruned ones. So the regularization effect, those all filters are removed in the pruning process, appears in all the tested network. Okay, let's see example of the dark coordinate. On the bottom is the network architecture, and on the top is the corresponding percent of the pruned kernel in each layer. Okay, so in the presence of L1 or L2 regularization in the blue and red bars, entire filters of the deeper layer were pruned. When no regularization was applied, the filter pruning percentage was zero.
Here uh, you can see that our algorithm is competitive not only with respect to weight pooling algorithms, uh, but also with respect to not pooling algorithm when we apply regularization. Okay, here is the percent of the pruned neurons or pruned filter uh, out of the all uh, network. Okay, and here's some additional polling result for the dark COVID net and the unit. Uh, we compare our method with the uh, Python chat pruning. And know that the significant reduction of the flops using our method. So to assess our hypothesis, we conducted a series of experiments. In this experiment, we chose a specific layer of the MLP network and analyzed it throughout the training process. At the end of each epoch, we computed two things. Okay, first in pink is the mean and standard deviation of the ratio of prune weights per node. Second, in blue, we compute the mean and standard deviation of the magnitude of the non-zero weights per node. We have the remaining weights. So here, since uh, no regularization is applied, looking at the blue plot, we see that the magnitude of the remaining weights gradually increase to compensate for the missing ones. You can compare this with the plot obtained for pruning process with L2 regularization. The left plot presents the result for nodes that were not zero throughout the pruning process. Okay, in this case, we got similar tendency as before when the magnitude of the remaining weights gradually increased to compensate for the missing weights. The right plot presents the result for nodes that were eventually pruned. In this case, the remaining weights didn't compensate for their neighboring zeroed weights and their magnitude decreased to zero during the training. We apply this for other network and with other regularization term, and we see similar pattern for all the networks. Okay, so in order to conclude, uh, we present our algorithm way to node pruning a general stochastic approach for neural network pruning. It can be plugged in into any network regardless of its architecture, training regime, or loss function. Uh, but the main C is adding L1 or L2 regularization, allow high ratio of neurons and uh, filter pruning in addition to weight pruning. Our result and other details uh, can be found uh, in our paper. That's it. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Ed. Let's see if there are questions from the audience. Okay, here is one. Uh, did you try to prune uh, an untrained network? Uh, so yes, actually we tested it. We conducted two experiments, two sets of experiments. In the first one, we got the uh, a trend a network and then we prune it. And in the in the second um, experiment, we just you know took a, a network without training it. And we saw that in the in the first experiment when the network was already trained. So for the same for the same prune ratio, we get a little bit better uh, results in terms of accuracy. It did converge in both of the cases, um, but there is a there is a difference, and you can see it also in the paper. We uh, we did the comparison there. So does it mean that you can somehow uh, save memory during training uh, by using your technique, even if you get some lower accuracy eventually? But if you can during training prune ninety some percent of the of the weights. So you need, we need to think about it because um, well, the purpose in this method is that uh, weights that 
that zero can recover during the training. So we, we, we want to give this uh, option to the weights. So maybe after, you know, um, some epochs, you can say, okay, this, this uh, weight cannot uh, recover anymore. But at, uh, at, the fr at first, you, yeah, yeah, we need like all the weights and get the, give them the chance to recover. And do you think the regularization works better for the conv layers or for the fully connected layers? Um, well, it's hard to say. Like we experiment. Uh, yeah, I think it works very good in both of the cases. Like it's hard to say. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much, El. Thank you. And we can move to the next talk. Uh, the next talk is going to be given by Evgeny. And the talk is about contrast to divide, self-supervised pre-training for learning with noisy labels. Um, Thank you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Cool. So, hi, my name is Evgeny. And uh, I already introduced the paper, also uh, by myself, Chaim Baskin, Avi Mendelssohn, Alex Bernstein from Technion, and uh, Orly Tani from NVIDIA. So what is our problem? We are tackling the problem of learning with noisy labels. This is uh, the problem when we try to learn a classifier for which part of the labels are wrong. And there are multiple variations of this problem. First of all, you can have small clean subset, which you can be sure which is labeled properly. This makes problem significantly easier and boosts the performance by a lot. Uh, another question is whether the true label of the picture or sample in general is part of the labels you're classifying to. So for example, if you do cat dog classification, you can have some cats mislabeled as dogs, but you also may have some picture of, let's say, elephant. That's what's called open set noise, when uh, the real label is outside of the classification set, and uh, we didn't tackle it, we worked with closed set. And finally, the noise source, uh, it may be either synthetic. For synthetic, uh, two main uh, approaches is either just syn synthetically uh, just randomly assign some new label from uniform distribution to part of the images, which called symmetric noise, or the label may depend on the original class. For example, we want to change cat to dog, but not cat to car. That's what's called asymmetric noise. And of course, real life noise, which may come from uh, some crowdsourcing or maybe a web scrapping. Those are the usual sources of real life noise, which is of course, to have more complicated distribution. And one part, one important part of learning these noisy labels is warm up. Uh, this is a short supervised training in the beginning of the learning process on full noisy data set. Uh, the, the important observation is that uh, samples with noisy labels converge slower than uh, samples with clean ones. Uh, it is an intuitive observation because you can think of it that all clean labels want to do more or less the same. All clean, all cats labeled as cats want to converge to be a cat, but noisy labels are somehow an exception and the network needs to memorize them, which takes more time. And warm up is very important uh, to learning these noisy labels. And uh, we identified two main goals of warm up. First is loss separability. It means that uh, noisy samples still have high loss and can be distinguished from clean ones. And feature extraction, which means that uh, our network extracts meaningful features from the samples. Uh, the problem with warm up is that uh, its, its performance is bounded by memorization and uh, there is not much you can do with it. It's regular cross entropy training. Uh, all you can do is run it and hope for the best. And in, th in this paper, we identified that warm up is a major obstacle in ability to improve performance of learning with noisy labels. 
And uh, to convince you, let me show this plot. In this plot, we took some existing uh, benchmark, which is Cypher 100 with 50% noise and 90% noise. And we measured both of the both of the metrics we I talked earlier. Loss separability is measured as proca hook score of noise detection. So we try to detect for each uh, sample whether it's noisy labeled or cleanly labeled and calculate proca of this uh, uh, binary classification problem. And for feature extraction, we measure a linear accuracy of the a classifier, which means we freeze the feature extraction and train linear classifier on those features. And you can see that in both cases, for 50% and for 90% noise, uh, two measures peak simultaneously at some point. Each point uh, denotes an epoch of warm up. And especially for high noise level, there is much room for improvement. And I am giving you here a teaser that our method, which I haven't presented yet, is significantly improves in both metrics. Uh, another thing you can look at is uh, uh, distribution of features as a function of label. And uh, in this picture, you can see UMAP, which is uh, uh, this dimensional reduction technique uh, and improvement of TISNI. Uh, features extracted for Cypher 10 and colored by the true class. And you can see that uh, divide mix, one of the state of the art approaches to learning these noisy labels, uh, is not performing that well, especially for high noise. For 90% noise, it's basically uh, haven't detected any classes, maybe except for those two here at the bottom. And here is another hint for our method. You can see that self supervised training, which doesn't use any labels, can uh, get decently decently good separation of different classes and uh, which shows us that we can get good feature extraction without any labels at all. Uh, based on this, we propose a very simple and straightforward two-phase framework. First phase, uh, which we call contrast phase, performs uh, self-supervised contrast pre-training uh, to obtain high quality feature extractor. And in second uh, stage, we, which we call divide phase, we use some standard learning with noisy labels algorithm to train, uh, which can now better detect noisy labels. And similarly to transfer learning, we can use our approach to improve virtually any existing uh, method. It uh, doesn't matter how it works. Importantly, we don't need any cleanly labeled external data. For example, using ImageNet is a popular choice, but uh, if you are working in some different domain, uh, large external data, clean data may be not available. Finally, since we discard the labels, uh, the label no, no, it doesn't influence feature extraction, and thus we have a robust initialization of our second stage. So here you see some results on mini web vision. This is a, a data set acquired by web scrapping with the same classes and, as ImageNet. And the mini version uses 50 first classes. And you can see that our approach C2D improves significantly over previous methods, uh, divide mix and DLR plus. Even though we use a smaller network, we still uh, boost of one accuracy by two, three percent. And for synthetic noise, we looked at Cypher 10 and Cypher 100. For Cypher 100, we've seen that C2D is especially good at high noise rates, for example, 90 or 95 percent. Uh, for 90 percent, we get got a boost of 30 percent accuracy, which is large improvement, more than twofold. Uh, however, we noted that for these large noise rates, the improvement over uh, of uh, specialized learning with noisy labels algorithm, as opposed to standard cross entropy training with mix up, is very minor. For example, uh, we compare here ELR plus with cross entropy, and the difference is uh, 
not that big, even uh, cross entropy is even better for 90% uh, case. Uh, for closing Van M, this is a large data set of 1 million pictures and it is has a relatively high noise rate around 40%. We, we were able to get results similar to state of the art without using any supervised uh, pre-training. So the standard approach to closing Van M is use pre-trained to use a network pre-trained on ImageNet and uh, we didn't use one and still got competitive results without any pertaining. Uh, and we also show here that our method uh, can generalize to different self-supervised approaches. BT refers to Berlow twins and uh, SimCLR is SimCLR. And in both cases, we get good results, even though SimCLR is a bit better. And we see here a similar problem as in uh, Cypher 100 for since closing on them is very noisy, the improvement of uh, ELR plus over regular cross entropy is relatively small. For example, in case of Barrow twins, it's only half percent. Uh, finally, for we can uh, use semi supervised learning as an upper bound for learning with noisy labels. If you have a semi supervised pro problem, you can transform it to uh, learning with noisy labels by assigning random labels. And we can see that when we compare it to mix match, uh, for 80% noise, we get only 0.2% gap uh, in performance from C to D. Uh, for 90% noise, it's a bit larger, around 2%, but we almost close the gap to the upper bound of semi supervised learning. Uh, another thing we, you can take a look of is the uh, load distribution uh, after warm up. So we take a look at loss values and we plot a histogram with clean and noisy labels. And you can see that in case of C2D, the overlap between noisy and clean samples uh, is significantly smaller than in case of uh, vanilla divide mix. And in case of image and pertaining, this overlap is also large, uh, which takes me to the next point is that uh, how image and pertaining performs in uh, learning with noisy labels uh, framework. And uh, while it usually works well in noise free learning tasks and it is utilized in uh, uh, closing 1M uh, training, when we tried, uh, to do the same on Cypher 100, uh, it didn't really work. We didn't get the improvement of performance uh, for learning with noisy labels, both in the ELR plus case, uh, when it reduced the performance by around 10%. And in case of divide mix, uh, even though warm-up metrics increased a bit, uh, second stage does diverge and we weren't able to make it converge. It's a bit outside of the scope, main scope of the paper, but uh, we made a couple of experiments and it didn't work. So the, the main idea here is that uh, sometimes image pertaining doesn't work as you hope it will. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we identified and analyzed uh, a major obstacle in learning with nasal labels. Uh, which is warm-up performance, uh, which we characterize by loss separability and feature quality. We've shown that self-supervised pretending improves both goals and uh, thus significantly improves performance of uh, learning with noisy labels. Our method is uh, straightforward to implement. We don't require any external data. It works out of the box uh, with multiple existing approaches. Uh, however, our results uh, show that sometimes uh, existing methods are unable to utilize the improvement of warm up that, that our method brings. And if you're interested, you can find some more results and more analysis in the paper. And we made the code public. You can find the link in the paper. Uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. If you have some questions, you can ask now or contact me by email. Thank you very much, Evgeny. 
Well, let's see if there are any questions from the audience. While people are thinking, uh, let me start by one. So can you explain why what type of uh, label noise you injected in the experiments? So for real life noise, we don't inject any noise. This is just like noise which people got when they gathered the data set. For example, you scrub uh, Google images and you get some images which are not of the same class, but labeled wrongly. Uh, for synthetic data, we inject either uh, symmetric noise, which is just choose part of the images and replace their label with a random one, or an asymmetric one in which we have some specific class dependencies. For example, replace cats with dogs and uh, trucks with cars, stuff like that. So this is some particular scheme which is specified in the paper. So in, in the first case, we're dealing with real data. How do you measure success? So there is a clean validation set. In case of closing, they also have uh, some double label data, which allow to uh, measure some metrics like uh, confusion matrix of the labeling and uh, the level of the noise. But basically we use some clean validation data for web vision. You can also use uh, ImageNet validation set since it's the same uh, classes, but uh, usually use some clean data for testing. And, and what happens if you're using a, a clean label data set? Will the algorithm hurt performance? Uh, it may. Uh, usually if the data is clean, then the differences are not very large. Uh, it depends a lot on how hard is the task, I assume that for harder tasks, the gap may be a bit larger, but uh, it also depends on the second stage, right? Uh, we can use any second stage algorithms and some are more robust and some are less robust for, uh, for the clean data. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker. Thank you again. Thank you. And the next talk is going to be presented by Ron Shapira Weber. He's from, uh, let's see, either Ben Gurion. Yeah. Ben Gurion, yeah. Dawn University. And he's going to talk about the Fermorphic Temporal Alignment Net. Ron, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Shai. Um, hi. Uh, today I will present our work titled The Fiomorphic Temporal Alignment Nets. It's a joint work uh, of Ben Gurion University and the Technical University of Denmark. Um, and let's dive in. So uh, our goal is time series analysis. As we can see from the example here, we have some uh, very nice ECG uh, um, repetition, uh, ECG signals, and we can see on the right the mean signal and the standard deviation. And problems uh, start to arise when we have some uh, non-linear temporal misalignment of the data. So what we can see below are some uh, ECG uh, signals which are not aligned and the mean uh, signal is all smeared and the standard of deviation with respect to the amplitude is quite high. So our goal is a system that can jointly allarge, uh, align large time series ensembles, um, problems with previous uh, non-deep learning uh, alignment methods. It's uh, that they're usually either computationally expensive, they don't scale well with the number of signals or the signal length, they can't handle multiple classes, and there are usually no generalization capabilities. Our proposed solution, the Fiomorphic Temporal Alignment Nets, based on our papers from NeurIPS 2019 and ICIP 2021. A quick overview of the system and the problem. Um, during training, uh, the system is set to align uh, several classes. Here we can see the blue and the red class. They are uh, misaligned with respect to the temporal axis. And during training, we are set to minimize the variance within each class. And during inference, we want the system to align the signals without having uh, to need the class labels. Um, the framework is semi-supervised in the sense that we don't have any reference template signals. We're uh, looking for a solution or the mean signal uh, for the alignment. Um, our system is based on a temporal transformer net, which is the time series analog of the spatial transformer networks. In order to align the data, we chose a a family of transformation uh, titled CPUB. Uh, it is a family of the field of based on the integration of continuous piecewise affine velocity field. 
A diffeomorphism is a differentiable invertible map with a differentiable inverse. As we can see below, we can see a piecewise affine velocity field and below it a continuous piecewise affine velocity field. What we see next is an example of the transformation applied to a sine wave. Uh, on the top left, we can see the, velocity, the predicted velocity field. Below it, in blue, we can see the transformation of the time axis with respect to the identity transformation. And on the right, we can see the sine wave. Uh, on the top right, the original sine wave. And below, the sine wave being warped with the transformation. For application in 2D, you can see the papers below. So given the family of transformation we've chosen, we now need a loss function. Uh, again, uh, the system is unsupervised when we're working with one class or semi-supervised when working with several classes uh, with respect to the fact that we don't have a reference signals. So our loss function is the within class variance of the aligned signals here denoted by V. Um, in addition to the, uh, our data term, we also have a regularization term, uh, which is a covariance matrix with zero mean Gaussian of the uh, a title of a smoothness prior over the CPA fields. And uh, this will allow our system to uh, minimize the variance without causing uh, too large deformation, which are unrealistic. We will see some examples to, of this uh, prior in future slides. Now that we know the family of transformation and uh, uh, our loss function, let's dive in into the system. Given a, a set here of two classes, the blue and the red one, the localization network predicts theta, the parameters of the velocity field or the transformation. We integrate the velocity field to receive the actual CPOP warps. And then we align the data uh, with the warps to receive V, which is the aligned signals or the warp signals. Then we compute the loss with respect to the variance within, within each class and also apply our regularization term. Uh, in all of our experiments, we chose a very basic localization network, which is a 1D convolutional neural net. And we set the dimensionality of the velocity field for 232. A variation of our system is the recurrent data, which iteratively, iteratively uh, aligns the signals uh, and provide better refinement of the alignment. As we can see here, uh, given an uh, input, uh, several input signals uh, denoted in gray and their mean signal in blue, the system aligns the signals and then uh, the signal, the aligned signals are fed again to the same system. And it aligns it again uh, for several iteration, uh, which are uh, decided beforehand. Um, some advantages are that they are the localization network is shared, i.e. the number of trainable parameters does not increase. It is an easier optimization problem and it implies a non-stationary velocity field, which increases the exp expressiveness of the warps. And diving in into some experiments and result, uh, we work with the UCR time series classification archive, which is an archive of 85 uh, different data sets, uh, ranging from image outlines, motion captures, sensors, ECG, and more. And some uh, quantitative, qualitative examples uh, here for uh, video activity analysis. And this is one of the many data set in the archive. It's, uh, it holds um, repetition of the same yoga exercise by different users uh, and it denotes the outline of the activity. On the bottom left, we can see 10 repetition, which are temporally misaligned. And below we can see the mean signal and standard deviation. And on the right, we can see the aligned signals and their mean and standard, standard deviation. Here we are looking at uh, the system during inference, i.e. this is a test. And some more examples, uh, on top we can see uh, a classification problem of noise coming out from the motor. Uh, after aligning, we can see a very nice sine wave um, on wheels. And uh, below it, we can see a problem of uh, shape outlines. This is a data set of different planes outline, which is um, unravel into 1D. Coming back to, the, to our smoothness prior, as we can see here, we can see on the left, um, our system without the prior and on the right the system with it. Um, and as we can see on the left, the deformation are not quite realistic. As we can see on the bottom left, uh, the aligned signals are um, too squeezed in a sense, the typical ECG um, shape is lost. But this problem, this uh, solution does increase, does indeed minimize the variance. Therefore the system without the prior it is a good solution. Adding the prior or the regularization, uh, we can see that the typical shape is still uh, saved, but 
the signals are now uh, aligned. In comparison to other methods, um, more specifically time series averaging methods, which are based on dynamic time warping, in particular DBA, which is dynamic uh, time warping barysetter averaging, and soft DBA, which is DBA with soft DTW as a loss function. And we can see that DTAM on the right uh, achieves comparable results to, the, to soft DTW averaging, but can also generalize the test set, which is something that uh, usually cannot be done with DTW based methods. Uh, the top row uh, denotes uh, one class and the bottom row denotes another class. Uh, some quantitative results using the nearest centroid classification. Uh, this is a one nearest neighbor classifier where the train set is the centroid of each class. Uh, this is a typical way to measure um, the, how good the averaging of the system is. And uh, as uh, each dot on the panels here represents a single data set. Each point, each point above the line uh, indicates DTAN performed better uh, than the competing method, where we compare DTAN to a baseline of the Euclidean mean, DBA, and sub DTW based averaging. And um, as we can see below, uh, DTAN performed better than baseline on 93% of the data set, uh, to, from DBA on 77%, and uh, of sub DTW on 62% of the data set. Another experience that we uh, experiment that we ran uh, is using DTAN for time series alignment and then training another classifier on top of it. Here, uh, we use DTAN to align the signals and then train the classification network with identical architecture to predict the class labels. Again, comparing on the 85 data set of the UCL archive, we can see that uh, DTAN CNN works better when compared to the baseline CNN on 87% of the data set. This is the average test accuracy of five runs in order to answer to random initializations of the network. And some visualizations, here we can see uh, a data set titled faces UCR. It has 11 classes. On the left, we can see the TSNE embedding of the original data. This is not the embedding of the network. And on, the, on the right, we can see the aligned data. We can see here the cluster are nicely uh, a cluster within themselves and a bit further away from other clusters, which is a desired property of the system. Finally, a more recent advantage is uh, the cyclic diffeomorphic transformer nets for contour alignments. And we are ex it is extending our work to a counter reparameterization problem. And in order to uh, adapt to this, we need a close, uh, we need the velocity at the start of the signal to be equal to the velocity at the end. Uh, given the example here, we can see three shapes uh, representing the same uh, class forces uh, with different sampling along the contour. And uh, when we align them, we can see that the aligned mean is much more representative um, and it does not hurt the analysis of the data. In order to conclude, uh, let's go over what we saw here today. We saw our goal was a, system, a statistical analysis of time series data. Our problem was temporal misalignment of the data. Our proposed solution was DTAN, diffeomorphic temporal alignment nets, which is an unsupervised or semi-supervised deep learning framework for time series joint alignment and averaging. Additional contribution include the smoothness prior, the recurrent variation, DTAN CNN, and DTAN for contour alignment. Our code is publicly av available at the link below. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, let's see if we have questions from the audience. I see we have one. Uh, so do you have a, a bidirectional consistency loss on the alignment? When you're uh, doing alignment between S1 and S2, do you do the same from S2 to S1? It's a great question. Uh, actually, we are aligning with respect to the mean uh, shape. So given the sensor, they don't have a reference. The question is, I, do we align the mean back to the input signals, which um, we did not consider um, bidirectional loss in that sense. Okay. I hope I understood the question correctly. Yeah, I mean, so you, you generate the mean uh, result and you map everything to it, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so, so do you assume the signals are uh, trimmed to the correct size, so all of them you can uh, perfectly align, or are they kind of, uh, there is one very long sig signal that consists of all the repetitions and you somehow need to uh, crop it and, and do the alignment on it. Mm, excellent question. 
Um, in the data set we worked with uh, and the basic uh, configuration of the network, we assumed fixed length of the signal. Um, but given the var variety of data, um, especially the ECG example that we saw, uh, ECG is a continuous signal that usually we segmented uh, with respect to repetition of the heartbeat and we align with respect to repetitions. Um, but if you want to work with variable length, uh, you, you need uh, firstly a network, which is, in, uh, is capable of that. You can use an RNN or global, global average pooling. And in addition, you need some kind of loss function uh, which can handle variable le length signal uh, such as sub DTW perhaps. Okay, and, and mentioning sub DTW, there is a difference in the speed, either in train or uh, there is no train in, in, in a DTW, but in at inference time. Okay, so with respect to sub DTW, um, it is slower than just simply computing the within class variance. And especially during inference, um, you will need to compute DTW between either the signals to the train uh, mean. Well, then uh, every signal will take the much time it will take to compute DTW between them. And um, working within batch will even take longer. I, we can forward pass everything that answered in a single batch, batch and DTW is usually not optimized for that. So, uh, so think, sorry, go ahead. So no, with respect to runtime, uh, we, see, we see a very good increase. Uh, that being said, uh, some recent works have applied uh, some DTW to uh, uh, CUDA, which is quite uh, fast, uh, which we are actually running at the moment to see how it goes. Um, so yeah, um, uh, the key Euclidean mean and distance is quite faster than some DTW. So uh, how many signals can you process at once at inference time? Uh, we actually removed that slide uh, because of time, <laughs> but uh, we had, I think it was, uh, we had uh, 10,000 signals of length uh, 512. It took less than a second, I think, on uh, GTX uh, 1080. Um, so yeah, it's quite fast, but it really depends on uh, how long the data is uh, and on the backbone. We use a very simple backbone, which worked quite well, but if you enter a very large backbone, i.e. the localization network, it might be slower. Okay, so this very high note, let's uh, end uh, the discussion here. Thank you very much, Ron. And we'll Thank move... you very much, Shai. Uh, and we're moving to the very last and uh, hopefully the best, the best talk of uh, the day. Uh, talk by Thomas uh, Dages, uh, Michael Lindenbaum and Freddy Buchstein from the Technion, seeing things in random dot videos. Thomas? Tom, are you? Yeah, yeah. Tom Deges. That's my name. Tom, sorry. So That's the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, hi. So I'm going to present my work I did during my master's, actually, um, that I presented actually in the conference a couple of years ago before COVID. Um, and the context is the following. Imagine you have some data that is given to you that is very, very noisy. Um, now, essentially two ways you can look at it. One is be a human being and look at it with your eyes and try to understand what the data is and what is going on in the data. And the other thing is obviously design some algorithm, process the data, solve the problem, uh, and that's great. Now, the thing is, if you do things wisely and you use an algorithm that is not too complicated, that you understand very well, you can try to make sure that the algorithm has a similar performance to the human. And that can give you a very simplistic model of how we work as humans, of how our brain works. So that's kind of the goal of my presentation to show how our brain works in a very, very specific uh, case. So this is the case. Imagine I have a scene um, and I have a sensor that takes a picture of that scene and that sensor is very noisy. So it, ideally, it would give me the edges of the objects in the scene. Uh, but it turns out that I have a lot of uh, noise, a uh, lot of uh, background uh, white dots that appear. And on my, on my edges, I only have a few of these uh, of random dots that appear. Now, in this case, um, it's still fine. I can look at the image and see roughly what is going on. But what if my sensor is, is extremely noisy like this? In this case, when I look at my data, I really don't see anything. And it seems to me that I'm looking at completely white noise. And there's, there's 
almost nothing I can do with it. So the question is, can we actually recover the information uh, in this? And the answer is, well, if you understand your sensor as some kind of uh, random sampling device, because it creates random noise all the time, why not sample it many times, take lots of pictures, stack them up together in some sense, and why not look at it from a video perspective? So, so let, let's see. So this is, uh, hey, you can't see anything. And as soon as I put it in a video, I hope that you can see uh, what is happening. Now, what you'll probably say is that, okay, well, here the scene is completely static. And what is probably going on in my brain is that I'm averaging through time and that the density on the foreground is probably a bit higher. So I can see, probably see, uh, see that like, like that. But the thing is, it's not just averaging that is going on. Uh, and I can show you another example uh, here. So here you can probably have no idea what you're looking at, just some random noise. And as soon as you, as I'm gonna press play, I hope all of you are going to understand what, what is going on, even though you've never seen this kind of data in your life before. Um, so even though my object is, uh, my object can move very fast, it can be totally uh, non-rigid deformations uh, between each frame. And I can still very easily as a human being see Immediately, I've never been trained, never seen this data before. I immediately know what I'm looking at and I can immediately understand what is the data. And the question is why? What is going on in my brain for me to do this? And we'll try and design a very simple algorithm to recover it. Okay, so the sensor doesn't really exist. Um, or in the sense, I'm more interested in the math, so I kind of simulated everything. Um, so you take a scene and how I generated the data is essentially put white noise everywhere. That's what I call uh, background noise. Uh, every pixel appears with some probability PB and on the foreground, what I call the foreground, the edges, there is a higher probability to appear, which is due to a marginal probability increase of uh, due to the foreground of PF basically. So uh, I have two parameters that I can play with to degrade my image and we'll see how these parameters uh, are important uh, later. The method I will use to design my algorithm is actually not neural networks. I couldn't care less about the neural network. Um, what I'm interested in is really understanding everything. So I'm going to use a statistical approach designed by some guys in Paris a long time ago that will give me a test of uh, unlikeliness. So I'm going to look for objects, for example, alignments, you know, straight lines. And I'm going to see how unlikely this alignment is. And what's nice with their method is that you can actually control um, how the algorithm decides by controlling the expected number of false alarms the algorithm will do. It's a proven control. And the algorithm is completely parameterless or almost completely parameterless. No training or nothing, uh, purely pure statistics. So an example, look below. Um, if you look at this image, you'll probably see that there are these five points aligned. So what you probably, what's probably happening in this algorithm is that they look at this candidate, say rectangle, and they count the number of points that appear. And if the number of points is high, they detect the line. If it's not, they don't. And the question is how to, how can I say it's high or it's not high? How do I decide what is this threshold? So a quick reminder on statistics. Um, when you do a statistical test, you make an assumption. So here the assumption will be the data is generated only from, uh, it's just white noise, random background. And I'm gonna test, if I'm looking for edges, I'm gonna test lots of rectangles at lots of different positions. And I'm going to count the number of points that appears. And I'm gonna reject the background hypothesis if I find that there are lots of white points that appear because that would be really unlikely, it's really weird. So this happens if my number of observations K is bigger than the threshold, which is actually the same thing to say as the tail of my distribution at my current observation is smaller than some other, other threshold. That's the perspective we look at. And, and the, secret of a contrario is in how to choose this threshold. Now, what they say is that if you want to fix the number of false alarms to be at most a given, epsilon usually one, what you have to do is just take a, a threshold level which is epsilon over the total number of tests. Now, a test is, so in one image, you'll look at lots of positions of rectangles, each position is a test. So the other day, you're looking at this quantity, which is the NFA quantity, which is number of tests times the tail of a distribution, and you're comparing it to the level set epsilon. And that's the secret. A quick word on why this controls false alarms. Um, just, just look at the following. 
if I assume, if my data really is only background, any decision I make, any detection is a false alarm. So when you do the maths, you look at the expectation of false alarms, essentially you're going to have a sum of expectations, a sum of probabilities. A probability to detect is just that my observation is above the threshold. I have NT of these tests. So I just get them in this quantity. If I want to up bound it by epsilon, I just need to play with the threshold level so that it works and you get exactly what is claimed by, uh, by these guys. Anyway, the contrario method is really something that was invented to work on images that look somewhat random. Um, the thing is, I showed you at the beginning that if you just have one image, it really, there really is nothing. You cannot really see anything in just one image. Uh, if you look at each frame of the video, it, it looks completely like completely white noise, so it's going to fail. So what am I going to do? Well, obviously humans, what they do when they look at things, they, they don't just do spatial search, they also integrate through time. So I'm going to do a very naive integration through time in order to kind of resolve this problem and then apply a contrario on static images. So I just do some Boolean averages on a certain uh, a moving window of frames. Uh, if one pixel appears white in say five frames, then uh, the pixel will be white on the merge of the frames. Something super simple. And uh, I can design an algorithm. I won't go through the details, how it's implemented, et cetera. It's not so important. Uh, at the end of the day, it, the crude results I get uh, would be something like this. I can recover, in most cases, the information uh, fairly well. So here it's really noisy and that's perfectly normal and understandable because I didn't do any post-processing, any filtering. I didn't share information between several decisions on uh, between uh, um, at uh, this time state and the next time state, etc. It's super nice. I can do much better if I do things a bit more intelligently, but that's not really Im Im important for me. I don't want to necessarily, I'm not only focused on generating the best algorithm. I have an algorithm that works somewhat. What I want is to understand what's going on in my brain. Can I use this algorithm to model what is going on in here? So that's the question. So let's see. Let's say that the brain is some visual sensor, my eye, and then my brain does some temporal integration through time. I merge information, merge the frames that come at me uh, over a certain time step, okay? So delta T converted to number of frames for fixed frame rate videos. And then I do a spatial search through this merge of frames to find the information uh, in, uh, if there is information in the, in the image. And this thing will be done if we're looking with for straight edges by looking at with the visual angle a bit everywhere through the, through the image. And this visual angle will correspond to a width of a candidate area. So if I'm looking for say line alignment, I'm basically to fit a rectangle and I can play with the width of this rectangle uh, to, to say, okay, these ports are all aligned or not. So we're going to try to find two parameters, this time integration and this width such that this super simple algorithm performs maybe as well as the, as the human and does, do these numbers correspond to anything reasonable or are they just random, random numbers? So, so I don't have time to go through everything. So I'll just directly go uh, and look at some results. So, so here, if we focus on the left, these are actually performances of humans. So we did psychophysical tests on humans. We invited them to come here and look at random data for hours and hours and um, this is what we do. So if you plot, if you generate data with various densities, various background densities and foreign densities, you live in this PBPF space, which is here, and each dot corresponds to one of these configurations and several data instances. Um, the color of the dot is the performance of the average human um, on it. So white is, I'm only focusing on the hit rate. I, I remove the false alarm rate. Uh, uh, I won't talk about it, it's, it's the same. But for the hit rate, uh, yellow is, I always managed to recover the, 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 the edge that was in the image and blue, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to, it looked completely random. And you can see that the separation for humans is basically this orange curve that lies somewhere around here. This is for humans. Now, if you look at a contrario algorithms, they will also have some kind of, uh, some performance and you can actually theorize the performance and do, analyze it analytically. And that's why I don't have time to do it. But if you do it analytically, you get these kinds of curves here. These curves correspond to the level set of the quantity of interest, which is NT times the tail of the distribution, number of tests times tail of the distribution. And remember, you detect if it's lower than 
a certain level epsilon. So if you're above that curve, you will detect there is an edge at the right position. If you're below, you will not. You will never be able to detect it. And what you find is that if I take a, a width of eight pixels, um, which corresponds to roughly 20, 0.23 degrees, uh, I get that the line, the level set of detection on detection is roughly the same as the separation from the humans, which suggests that maybe taking this alpha parameter to be 0.25 degrees is the reasonable thing for my, my model. Now I can, um, so this was done on static images. I can test humans also on videos. So we ask them also to look for an hour or two at some videos of edges that moved, that didn't move, etc. We ran some Agontario algorithms on mergers of frames of these, of the same data of one frame, two frames, three frames, 10 frames, et cetera. So different, different time integration, but using the same width that we defined previously. And these are performance curves. Now you probably can't see anything. So if this is the error plot uh, between Akutrao and humans, uh, this axis corresponds to the number of frames I use for each Akutrao algorithm. You see that essentially I get pretty good approximation of what humans are doing by taking between six and eight frames for time integration uh, with the Akontrario algorithm. Okay, so 68 frames in the 30 frame per second video that corresponds roughly to 0.2 to 0.3 or 0.27 seconds. So just in the summary, if I take this super simplistic algorithm and I take, the I take a temporal integration of 0.2 to 0.3 seconds, and then a spatial search with a visual angle of 0.23 degrees, this performs, corresponds quite well to what humans actually do. Uh, in practice, at least on this random data that you've never been trained on, you, you've never seen before, yet you understand it really well. Um, the nice thing about this algorithm is that first, I fully understand it. It's mathematical. It's not a black box neural network. I really understand everything. It's based on this test of unlikeliness under a random assumption. And the, the really nice thing is that these numbers, they're not completely random. The numbers I found by you know, minimizing errors and things like this, they actually correspond to what people in psychophysics roughly know. So the visual angle corresponds to really what you used to, to do contour integration. And, and the time integration is somewhat relevant as well. So I, I kind of redivived by this simple experiment, the model redivived numbers that are really known in the, in the psychophysics world, which was really surprising for me. And that's about it. Okay, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, nice to finish a uh, vision day with the talk with no deep neural net. Let's see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, there is one. Uh, do you need to assume a specific noise model? Um, so uh, usually you assume that everything is white noise. Um, you can, uh, you don't necessarily need to know what is the, the density, the, the PB, uh, because you can actually estimate it yourself by using some kind of averaging. Um, but, but because you're doing a statistical test, you have a background assumption. You need to define what is this assumption. You need to really know it. So, uh, you have to lay it out so that you can do the mathematics. Uh, if you don't know anything, you cannot do the mathematics. Okay. So you can estimate or you can generate uh, simulated data and then know everything for sure. Um, in both cases, it works well. And, and there is this implicit assumption that you approximate edges with these rectangles. Have you yeah. tried looking at the recovered shape? Did you really get the contour of the horse or the person? So, or so in this case, um, I only looked at the straight uh, lines, okay? In Acontrario in general, you really can adapt it to any kind of shape. It can be you know, weird curves, it can be anything you want. The more you complexify the shape of the curve, the more it complexifies the number of tests you have to do. If I'm looking at lines, I just have to select two points in the picture and this defines me a line. If I'm looking at a weird curve like this, okay, uh, it probably has, I don't know, 10, 20 degrees of freedom. I'm gonna have to do many more tests. Now with more tests, the quantity NT times the tail, this NT is bigger, which means I need much more points to detect that shape. And this is actually what corresponds, is actually what happens in reality. If you take more complex shapes, you need much more points in order to see it yourself as a human. 
uh, in order to detect it. So yes, you can work with more complex shapes. Uh, you can parameterize it, not parameterize it. But the more complex the shape is, the more points you'll need to actually see it. So in a contrary, you, you fix the false alarm rate to one, essentially. This somehow indirectly implies that your uh, correct detection rate is not, there is always a trade-off, right? So you might miss some regions along the edges. So, so the, in the Acontrario philosophy, um, they, they, they accept missing edges because, you know, if you look at it from as a human, you can miss edges as well. But it's, you don't say that this is an edge when it's completely random. This is really something you want to avoid. So you really focus on the false alarm rate and if you, if you miss some cases, that's okay. But in my study, I, I studied, okay, when I'm going to, I estimated when I'm going to miss and I analyzed the miss rate, um, which is not controlled, but you can estimate it. And you see that it actually really, really uh, performs similarly to what humans do. It's really remarkable. Okay. And the last question uh, from the audience, can the algorithm be extended to grayscale input images rather than binary? Um, it can, in the sense that uh, here you look at, you're counting things, okay? So here I had black and white, so I counted things. You can count uh, for something very naive. You can divide 0, 1, or 0 to 55 into several bins and count things in those bins. Um, also, but what Acontrario is most famous for is actually working in natural images and they actually look at alignments. They look at the gradients of the image and they look at alignments of the gradients. So you can really work in, in with anything you want. Um, it's, it's a framework that is adaptable to more or less anything. You just have to find a way to, to count something and you have to define what is that counting thing you want to, to do and define what are the mathematics, what is the background assumption and then reject or not reject. Okay, well, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. I want to thank all the speakers today. I want to mention all the sponsors that help us over the years. This year it was Google, Amazon, Applied Materials, Mobileye, RTC Vision, and GM. And with this, uh, let me conclude the Vision Day. Hope next year we'll have a physical meeting. Have a safe and uh, stay and. Uh,